Welcome to Alexandria, where history, mythology, and cultures come alive through audiobooks. Please subscribe, like, and comment to support us. Also, subtitles are available in over 70 languages. Just click the settings icon and choose your preferred language to fully experience the wonders of our stories. Welcome to the epic saga of Cleopatra, where history and romance intertwine to tell the tale of one of the most captivating figures ever to grace the world stage. Born of Greek heritage and destined to rule Egypt, her story is one of passion, power, and a relentless drive for sovereignty. As we set the stage for a narrative filled with forbidden love, political maneuverings, and the legacy of a woman who would defy an empire, join us in unraveling the layers of Cleopatra's complex existence. Her journey promises not just a glimpse into the heart of a queen, but into the very essence of what it means to be immortalized in history. Cleopatra, Chapter 1 Egypt's Elixir of Eternity, The Nile, and the Ancestry of Its Mistress The story of Cleopatra is a story of crime. It is a story about a forbidden love and its consequences. In this unusual and romantic tale, we witness this passion depicted in its entirety, capturing its irresistible desires, exhilarating happiness, reckless and chaotic journey, and the terrible regret and ultimate destruction it always leads to. Cleopatra was born in Egypt, but had Greek heritage and ancestry. Therefore, while Alexandria and the Delta of the Nile were the locations where the most important events and incidents of her history took place, it was the heritage of Macedon that shaped her. Her character and actions reflect the traits of genius, courage, originality, and impulsiveness that are inherent in her lineage. Her history, adventures, sufferings, and sins were shaped by the circumstances and influences in the warm and luxurious place where her early life took place. Egypt has always been seen as one of the most amazing countries in the world. It is a long and narrow valley full of greenery and fertility, completely cut off from the rest of the inhabited world. In fact, it is even more cut off than a real island, because deserts are more difficult to cross than seas. The existence of Egypt is truly extraordinary. If we could fly like an eagle and look down, we would see how this long and amazing valley, full of life, is formed and renewed every year, surrounded by silence, desolation, and death. It would be a site of constant admiration and pleasure. The extensive and thorough observations made for the past 2,000 years provide us with results. These results allow us to have a comprehensive understanding of the entire situation, similar to how we would see it from a high vantage point like an eagle. It has been discovered that Egypt's existence and its unique isolation in the middle of vast areas of dry and barren sand are due to some extraordinary outcomes of the overall rain patterns. Water evaporates from the sea and land and then falls back as rain in different amounts and frequencies across the earth. Rains are more common and heavier near the equator compared to temperate areas. The amount of rain decreases as we move closer to the poles. This is because the hotter climate near the equator causes water to evaporate more quickly, and then it falls back down as rain. However, the amount of rain that falls from the atmosphere is not solely determined by the latitude of the region where evaporation occurs. The main factor that influences the return of water in the form of rain is the cooling of the atmospheric layer that holds it. This cooling effect can be caused by various factors, and many different causes can modify it. Sometimes the layer is cooled by moving over mountains, sometimes by mixing with cooler air currents, and sometimes by being blown by winds to a higher latitude where it is cooler. If, however, air moves from cold mountains to warm and sunny plains, or from higher latitudes to lower latitudes, or if it mixes with warmer air among the different currents it encounters, it can hold more water vapor. As a result, instead of releasing the water it already has, it becomes eager for more. 
it blows across a country as a warm and drying wind in these conditions. If the circumstances were different, it could have created foggy mists or even heavy rain showers. It is clear from these points that the frequency of showers and the amount of rainfall in different regions on Earth depend on various factors. These factors include the climate's warmth, the presence of mountains and seas, the direction of winds, and the soil's reflecting properties. These and similar factors actually create a significant difference in the amount of rainfall in different areas. In the northern part of South America, where the land is surrounded by tropical seas that saturate the hot and dry air with moisture, and where the Andes Mountains cool and condense the vapors, over 10 feet of rain falls in a year. In St. Petersburg, however, the yearly rainfall is just over one foot. The huge amount of rain that falls in South America would completely flood the country if it stayed where it fell. As it flows through the valleys and reaches the sea, the combined torrents create the largest river on Earth, the Amazon. The heat and continuous supply of moisture stimulate vegetation to grow abundantly. The result is a dense and tangled mass of trunks, stems, and vines that make it difficult for humans to enter. The vast forests become an almost impenetrable jungle, home to wild animals, dangerous reptiles, and large predatory birds. Certainly, the city of St. Petersburg, with its cold winter, weak sun, and 12 inches of rain each year, will inevitably show a noticeable difference in its plant and animal life compared to the abundant fertility of New Grenada. Nevertheless, it is not entirely the complete opposite. There are some parts of the Earth's surface that don't receive any rain. These areas are completely different from the lush vegetation and abundant life found in the Amazon. In these rainless regions, there is only silence, emptiness, and no signs of life. Plants cannot survive, and animals cannot exist. Man is always completely excluded. When there is an abundance of animal and plant life, it keeps him away from regions that are too productive due to excessive heat and moisture. On the other hand, the complete absence of them prevents him from having a home in those regions. They become large areas of dry and barren sands where no plants can grow, and rocky areas where not even a lichen can survive. The biggest and most notable region on Earth with no rain is a large area that stretches across the interior and northern part of Africa, as well as the southwestern part of Asia. The Red Sea enters this area from the south, which breaks the shape of the land but doesn't change its character. It divides the land into different parts, each with its own name. The Asian part is known as Arabia Deserta, the African area is called Sahara, and in the area near Egypt, the barren region is simply referred to as the desert. However, the entire region shares a common characteristic, the lack of plants and therefore animals, due to the absence of rainfall. The creation of tall mountains in the middle of it, causing moisture to fall from the air, could potentially turn the entire barren area into a green, fertile, and populated region, similar to any other place on Earth. As it is, there are no mountains here. The entire area is almost flat and not very high above the sea. In fact, even hundreds of miles inland, the land only rises a few hundred feet above the surface of the Mediterranean. However, in New Grenada, which is less than 100 miles from the sea, the Andes mountain range reaches elevations of 10 to 15,000 feet. The gradual increase in elevation over hundreds of miles is not easily noticeable. This is why the vast, rainless regions of Africa and Asia, when observed by travelers, seem like one enormous plain that stretches a thousand miles wide and five thousand miles long. The only place where life and productivity exist is the Nile Valley. But there are actually three breaks in the continuous barrenness of this plain although only one of them significantly interrupts it. These are all valleys that run from north to south, right next to each other. The most eastern valley is very deep, 
and water from the ocean flows into it from the south, creating a long and narrow inlet known as the Red Sea. As this inlet connects with the ocean, its water level remains consistent. However, due to insufficient evaporation, it does not generate rain or nourish its own shores. While it adds some variation to the otherwise barren landscape by providing moving waters instead of shifting sands, that is the extent of its impact. As a result, it does little to alleviate the monotonous feeling of solitude and desolation that dominates the surrounding area it has invaded. The westernmost of the three valleys we mentioned is a small depression in the land surface, marked by a line of oases. This dip is not deep enough to allow water from the Mediterranean to enter, and there's not enough rain in the valley to create a stream. Springs periodically emerge from the ground in various locations along the valley. These springs, which percolate through the sands, bring fertility to small, elongated dells. These valleys, unlike the surrounding barren areas, seem like oases of greenery and charm to travelers, reminding them of paradise. There is a line of these oases in this depression to the west, and some of them are large. The oasis of Siwa, where the famous temple of Jupiter Ammon was located, was very big and reportedly had a population of 8,000 people in ancient times. As a result, while the eastern valley was flooded and let the sea in, the western valley was just a bit lower and had less fertility because of the springs that leaked from the ground in its lowest areas. Now, let's describe the third valley, which is the central one. In Abyssinia, located to the south of the large rainless region, there are mountains known as the Mountains of the Moon. These mountains are close to the equator, and they have a special relationship with the surrounding seas and wind currents in that part of the world. Because of this, they bring down huge amounts of rain from the atmosphere, especially during certain times of the year. The falling water soaks the mountainsides and floods the valleys. But a large part of it can't flow towards the south or east, where the country is mostly elevated land. The flowing water moves towards the north and continues across the desert through the large central valley. Eventually, it reaches the Mediterranean Sea, which is 2,000 miles away from where it originally came from the sky. The river created is the Nile. This refers to the water that accumulates in a region due to excessive rainfall and then flows through a rainless desert in search of the sea. If the excess of water on the Abyssinian mountains had been steady and consistent, the river, as it flowed through the desert, would not have added much fertility to the dry sands it crossed. The riverbanks would have had some vegetation, but the irrigation would only have affected the area reached by the water seeping through the sand. But the water doesn't flow evenly and consistently. During a certain time of the year, it rains constantly and in such large amounts that it almost floods the areas where it falls. Huge streams flow down the sides of the mountains. The valleys are flooded, plains become muddy, and muddy areas become lakes. This water spreads across the entire valley, creating a vast lake for a period of time. The lake spans the entire width of the desert. This lake is about five to 10 miles wide and a thousand miles long. The water is shallow and murky with a slow flow towards the north. Eventually the rain stops, but it takes several months for the water to drain and the valley to dry up. Once the water is gone, Abundant and thriving plants grow all over the previously submerged ground. This vegetation, which is now completely managed and controlled by humans, must have been very unique in its original and natural state. The plant selection must have included species that can survive in soil that is submerged in water for a quarter of the year. This situation likely prevented the Nile Valley from being overgrown with forests, unlike other fertile areas. As a result, wild animals could never have lived there. There were no forests for them to hide in, and their only option for shelter during the yearly floods was the dry and barren desert. This incredible valley appears to have been designed and safeguarded by nature with humans specifically in mind. It feels as though nature has set it aside for us since the dawn of time, 
prohibiting any plants or animals that could disrupt our presence and control from entering. If one were to leave it for a thousand years and return, they would find it unchanged, ready for them to reclaim. There would be no wild animals that one needs to get rid of, and no dense forests that one needs to clear with the axe. Nature is like a gardener who takes care of the world. Nature uses different things like the sea, the sun, and mountains to do work. As a result, we get heavy rain during the summer. For these or other reasons, Egypt has been inhabited by humans since ancient times. The oldest records, dating back 3,000 years, describe Egypt as ancient, even when they were written. Tradition doesn't provide any information about the origin of the population here. These are the oldest and most long-lasting monuments ever built by humans. It is interesting to think about how the greatest human achievements are often the simplest. These achievements are most long-lasting and reliable when they involve natural processes. For instance, one such achievement happens when a thin layer of fertile soil remains on the sand after a summer rainstorm. The main part of the Nile flood is the northern part, where the valley widens and opens toward the sea, creating a triangle-shaped plain about 100 miles long on each side. The river water flows over this plain in many different streams and channels. The entire area is a large meadow with many slow-flowing streams of water. It is very fertile, abundant, and beautiful. This area is known as the Delta of the Nile. The sea near the coast is not deep, and the fertile land created by the river's deposits seems to have extended slightly beyond the coastline. However, since the land hasn't noticeably expanded in the past 1,800 years, it's uncertain whether the entire protrusion is a result of the natural shape of the coast or any changes caused by the river. The delta of the Nile is very flat and is only slightly higher than the Mediterranean. The land appears almost the same as the sea, but instead of blue water with waves, we have large areas of waving crops and small hills with towns and villages. When the ship gets near the coast, the navigator can't see all the greenery and beauty from far away. It's because the land is so low that it stays hidden below the horizon until the ship is almost at the shore. The first things the sailor sees are the tops of trees that seem to be growing out of the water, or the top of a tall stone pillar, or the top of a broken down city. The easternmost channel through which the river waters flow to the sea is called the Pelusiac Branch. This channel almost acts as the boundary for the fertile area of the delta on the east. There used to be an old city called Pelusium near its mouth. This was the first Egyptian city reached by those who arrived by land from the east, traveling along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Because it marked the eastern border of the country, it became very important and is frequently mentioned in ancient history. The westernmost mouth of the Nile was known as the Canopic Mouth. The distance from the Canopic Mouth to Pelusium along the coast was approximately 100 miles. The coastline had, and still has, a very irregular shape with shallow waters. There were long stretches of sandy banks that extended into the sea. In response, the sea formed countless creeks, inlets, and lagoons on the land. Along this uneven and unsure boundary, the waters of the Nile and the waves of the Mediterranean constantly fought with similar strengths. Even now, after 1,800 years since the beginning of the recorded conflict, neither side has shown any significant advantage over the other. The river carries the sands down, and the sea constantly pushes them back, making the entire shoreline very dangerous and hard for people to reach. From this description of the Nile Valley, it is clear that it was a country that was completely cut off and separated from the rest of the world in ancient times. The city was completely surrounded by deserts, making it inaccessible by land. The treacherous coastline, with its shoals, sandbars, and other hazards, made it difficult to approach by sea. For a long time, the city remained under the control of its own native kings. The people living there were peaceful and hard-working. 
the scholars of the city were well known globally for their knowledge, scientific advancements, and philosophical ideas. During ancient times, before other nations came to disturb its peaceful isolation, the pyramids were constructed and massive stone structures were carved. Enormous temples were also built, with their crumbling columns now captivating people around the world. Even during these distant eras, Egypt was known for its everlasting fertility and abundance, just as it is today. There would always be corn in Egypt, no matter where else famine might occur. The neighboring nations and tribes in Arabia, Palestine, and Syria would find their way to Egypt across the deserts on the eastern side when they were in need, thus creating a path of communication. Eventually, the Persian kings, after expanding their empire to the west up to the Mediterranean, discovered a way through Pelusium and then invaded and conquered the country. Finally, around 250 years before Cleopatra's time, Alexander the Great took over Egypt when he overthrew the Persian Empire and added it to his own territories along with other Persian provinces. At the division of Alexander's empire, Egypt became controlled by one of his generals named Ptolemy. Ptolemy claimed the kingdom for himself and passed it on to his heirs when he died. Many rulers followed him, known as the Ptolemaic dynasty, which consisted of Greek princes ruling over Egypt. Cleopatra was the daughter of the 11th ruler of this dynasty. The capital of the Ptolemies was Alexandria. Before Alexander's conquest, Egypt didn't have a seaport. There were some landing places along the coast, but no proper harbor. In fact, Egypt had very little trade with the rest of the world at that time, so it didn't really need one. Alexander's engineers, though, discovered a spot near the canopic mouth of the Nile where the water was deep and there was a safe place to anchor, thanks to an island. Alexander decided to build a city at that spot and named it after himself. He improved the harbor by digging and building walls. A tall lighthouse was built, which served as a visible point during the day and a bright guiding light at night for the ships in the Mediterranean Sea. A canal was built to connect the port with the Nile, and warehouses were built to store merchandise. In short, Alexandria quickly became a major commercial center. It served as the capital of the powerful Ptolemaic government for many centuries. Its strategic location was so well chosen that even after 20 centuries of revolution and change, it remains one of the main hubs of trade in the East. Cleopatra Chapter 2. Noble Yet Terrifying Origins. The Greek Pharaohs. The founder of the Ptolemaic dynasty, who became the ruler of Egypt after Alexander the Great's death, was a Macedonian general in Alexander's army. His birth and how he ended up serving Alexander was unusual. His mother, whose name was Arsinoe, was a close friend and companion of Philip, king of Macedon, the father of Alexander. Philip eventually arranged for Arsinoe to marry a man named Lagos, who was a member of his court. Shortly after the wedding, Ptolemy was born. Philip treated the child with the same kindness and respect that he had shown to the mother. The boy was known as the son of Lagos, but his position in the royal court of Macedon was just as important and prestigious. He received the same level of attention and care as if he were truly the king's son. As he grew older, he took on important roles with a lot of responsibility and influence. Over time, a specific event happened that caused Ptolemy to get into serious trouble with Philip. But at the same time, it made Alexander become a very close friend to him. There was a province in the Persian Empire called Caria, located in the southwest part of Asia Minor. The governor of this province had offered his daughter to Philip as the wife of one of his sons named Aridaeus, who was the half-brother of Alexander. Alexander's mother, who was not Aridaeus's mother, was jealous of this proposed marriage. She believed it was a plan to bring Aridaeus into the public eye and eventually make him the heir to Philip's throne. However, she strongly desired that this magnificent inheritance should be saved for her own son. Accordingly, 
she suggested to Alexander that they should send a secret message to the Persian governor. In the message, they would explain that it would be better for both the governor and his daughter if she married Alexander instead of Aridaeus. They would try to convince the governor to ask Philip to make this change. Alexander joined the scheme willingly, and several courtiers, including Ptolemy, agreed to help him. They sent an embassy to convince the governor of Caria to support the plan. The governor was happy with the proposed change. Everything seemed to be going well until Philip somehow discovered the plot. He entered Alexander's room right away, filled with anger and resentment. He never planned to make Aridaeus, who had a questionable and lowly lineage on his mother's side, the successor to his throne. He strongly criticized Alexander for having such a degraded and weak mindset to want to marry the daughter of a Persian governor. He referred to the governor as a mere slave of a barbarian king. Alexander's plan was completely unsuccessful. His father was very angry with the officers who tried to help him, and he sent them all away from the kingdom. Ptolemy had to leave his country and lived as an exile for several years. Finally, when Philip died, Alexander allowed Ptolemy to return. Alexander became king of Macedon after his father and quickly appointed Ptolemy as one of his top generals. Ptolemy achieved a high rank in the Macedonian army and greatly excelled in all of the famous conqueror's future campaigns. During the Persian invasion, Ptolemy was in charge of one of the three main sections of the army. He consistently provided significant help to his master's cause. He was given tasks that were far away and risky, and he was often entrusted with handling very important matters. He was very successful in everything he did. He won battles, captured forts, made agreements, and showed the highest level of military strength and ability. He once saved Alexander's life by finding and exposing a dangerous plot against the king. Alexander had the chance to repay this favor, thanks to a divine intervention that was said to be granted to him specifically to show his gratitude. Ptolemy had been injured by a poisoned arrow, and despite the best efforts of the doctors and their treatments, it seemed like he was going to die. However, Alexander had a dream that revealed a successful cure, and as a result, Ptolemy was saved. During the celebratory events in Susa, after Alexander had finished his conquests, Ptolemy received a golden crown and got married to Artakama, the daughter of a highly respected Persian general. The wedding was filled with grandeur and extravagance. After a night of drinking and partying in Babylon, Alexander died unexpectedly. Since he didn't have a grown-up son to take over, his vast empire was split among his generals. Ptolemy got Egypt as his portion. He quickly went to Alexandria with a large army, many Greek attendants, and followers, and started a long and prosperous reign that lasted for 40 years. The Egyptian people were naturally brought under his control and made to be slaves. Greeks occupied all army offices and positions of trust and responsibility in civil life. Alexandria, a Greek city, quickly became a major commercial center in the surrounding seas. Greek and Roman travelers discovered a language spoken in Egypt that they could understand. This allowed philosophers and scholars to satisfy their long-standing curiosity about the country's institutions, monuments, and remarkable physical features, while feeling safe and enjoying themselves. Simply put, the way the Greek government was structured and the strong trade connections of Alexandria helped Egypt come out of hiding and isolation. This allowed for more interaction with other people and increased attention from the rest of the world. Ptolemy actually made it a priority to achieve these goals. He invited many Greek scholars, philosophers, poets, and artists to come to Alexandria and live there. He gathered a huge library, which later became known as the Alexandrian Library. It was one of the most famous collections of books and manuscripts ever assembled. We will discuss this library in more detail in the next chapter. In addition to carrying out grand plans to make Egypt more powerful, 
King Ptolemy spent most of his reign constantly fighting wars with neighboring nations. He fought these wars to expand his empire and protect himself from attacks and invasions by other powers. He finally managed to establish his kingdom on a stable and lasting foundation. When he was nearing the end of his life, at over 80 years old, he stepped down from his throne and handed it over to his youngest son, also named Ptolemy. The father, known as Ptolemy Soter, founded the dynasty. His son is called Ptolemy Philadelphus. This son, though the youngest, was chosen over his brothers to inherit the throne because he was the son of the monarch's most favored and beloved wife. Soter's decision to step down from the throne himself was motivated by his desire to ensure that his favorite son would securely hold the throne before his death, thus preventing any disputes from the older brothers over the succession. The crowning of Philadelphus was one of the grandest and most impressive ceremonies ever organized by royal extravagance and display. Two years later, Ptolemy, the father, passed away and was laid to rest by his son with a splendor nearly as great as that of his own crowning. His body was placed in a beautiful mausoleum built for Alexander's remains. People greatly admired his achievements and reign, and even worshipped him after his death. This is how the powerful Ptolemy dynasty began. Some of the early rulers of the family followed the good example of their respected founder to some extent. However, this good example was quickly forgotten and replaced by a period of great decline and degradation. The kings and queens that followed started living and ruling purely for their own pleasure and desires. Pleasure-seeking may begin with kindness, but it always ends in extreme and unbearable cruelty. The Ptolemies eventually became the worst and most terrifying tyrants that absolute and irresponsible power has ever seen. There was one particular vice that they seemed to have adopted from the Asian nations of the Persian Empire, and it resulted in terrible consequences. This vice was incest. The law of God, which is not only mentioned in the scriptures, but is also understood by our instincts, prohibits marriages between close relatives. The need for this law is based on reasons that cannot be fully explained here. However, these reasons come from factors that are inherent in human nature as social beings, and they have universal, ongoing, and unstoppable influence. To protect people from the harmful physical and moral effects of certain marriages, nature has instilled in everyone a strong instinct that recognizes the wrongdoing in these unions. This instinct is so powerful and widespread that it has led to clear disapproval of such marriages in nearly every set of written laws throughout human history. The Persian rulers were not bound by any laws, and they engaged in various types of incestuous marriages without feeling any shame. The Ptolemies also followed their lead. The story of Cleopatra's great-grandfather, who is the central figure in this narrative, offers a vivid illustration of the unethical and harmful nature of incestuous relationships in the ancient world. He was Ptolemy Fiscon, the seventh in the line. To understand how Cleopatra herself came into the picture, we need to know a bit about his family history. The name Fiscon, which later became his historical nickname, was originally given to him as an insult and mockery. He was short in height, but his excessive eating and indulgence had made him extremely overweight, making him appear more like a monster than a man. The word Fiscon, which was of Greek origin, was used to mockingly describe his ridiculous figure. The way Ptolemy Fiskin became king shows a lot about his character and gives us a clear but scary picture of how people behaved and what they believed in those times. He had been in a long and cruel war with his brother, who was king before him. In this war, he did many terrible things. Eventually, his brother died. His brother's wife, who was also his sister, and their young son were the only ones left. This son was likely to be the next king. Fiscon himself, being a brother, had no right compared to a son. The queen's name was Cleopatra, 
This was a common name among the princesses of the Ptolemaic line. Cleopatra, besides her son, had a daughter who was a young and beautiful girl at the time. Her name was also Cleopatra. She was, of course, the niece, as her mother was the sister of Fiscon. Cleopatra's plan, after her husband's death, was to make her son the king of Egypt and govern as regent until he reached adulthood. However, Fiscon's friends and supporters formed a powerful faction in his favor. They requested his presence in Alexandria to assert his claims to the throne. He arrived, and a new civil war was about to erupt between the siblings. However, the dispute was eventually resolved through a treaty. The treaty stated that Fiscon would marry Cleopatra and become king. Additionally, it was agreed that the son of Cleopatra from her previous marriage would be named as his successor. This agreement was put into action for the marriage with the mother and the placement of Fiscon on the throne. However, the treacherous monster, instead of keeping his promise regarding the boy, decided to kill him. His habits of violence and cruelty were so blatant and brutal that he attempted to carry out the act himself in broad daylight. The boy ran and screamed to his mother for help. Fiscon stabbed and killed him in front of his mother, showing the horrifying scene of a husband killing his wife's son right in her arms. It's easy to understand the kind of relationship that would exist between a husband and wife after such actions. In fact, there was no love between them from the start. The marriage was only a political agreement. Fiskin despised his wife and killed her son. To top it off, he shockingly fell in love with her daughter, showcasing his cruel and unpredictable nature. The young girl, who found the repulsive man both physically and mentally grotesque, was terrified. Unfortunately, she was completely under his control. He forced her, using violence, to do what he wanted. He rejected the mother and made the daughter marry him. Fiscon showed the same cruel and tyrannical behavior towards his subjects as he did in his own family. We can't provide specific details, but we can say that his terrible actions became completely unbearable, and a very serious rebellion erupted. As a result, he had to run away from the country. In fact, he barely managed to survive because a large, angry crowd had surrounded the palace and started to set it on fire. They wanted to burn the tyrant and everyone involved in his crimes. Fiskin managed to escape. He ran away to Cyprus, bringing along a beautiful boy, his son from his previous marriage with Cleopatra, whom he had divorced. They had been married for a while before the divorce, and they had a son together. His mother loved him very much, and Fiskin took him away for this reason, to keep him as a hostage so that his mother would behave well. He thought that when he was gone, she might try to take back the throne. His expectations in this respect were realized. The people of Alexandria supported Cleopatra and asked her to become the ruler. She accepted, maybe feeling a bit worried about the risks this decision could pose for her son who was away. She calmed herself by thinking that he was with his own father and wouldn't be harmed. After some time, Cleopatra became firmly in control of Alexandria, and preparations were made for a grand celebration of her birthday. On the day of the celebration, the entire city was dedicated to parties and happiness. The palace hosted extravagant events, while games, shows, and plays were held in different parts of the city. Cleopatra herself was enjoying a splendid party in one of the royal palaces, attended by the court's nobles, ladies, and army officers. Amidst all the celebration and enjoyment, the queen was told that a big box had arrived for her. The box was brought into the room. It looked like it held a wonderful gift, sent by a friend to celebrate the occasion. The queen was curious to know what was inside the mysterious coffer. She asked for it to be opened, and the guests gathered around, eager to see what was inside. The box, closely watched by everyone, was opened to reveal a shocking sight inside. It contained the remains of Cleopatra's only son from Fiscon, disassembled and placed within the box. Fiscon had sent the box to Alexandria, with orders that it should be retained until the evening of the birthday, 
and then presented publicly to Cleopatra in the midst of the festivities of the scene. The loud screams and cries she made when she saw the horrible scene and the long-lasting and unbearable sadness that came afterwards demonstrated how effective the cruel plan of the dictator was in achieving its goal. We don't enjoy writing these shocking stories of cruelty, and we're sure our readers won't enjoy reading them either. However, it's important to understand the family dynamics that influenced the great subject of this history in order to fully appreciate her character. In fact, it is important for us to know the influences and examples that shaped her early life, the privileges and advantages, as well as the negative influences that young people experience during their early years, greatly impact their future actions and choices. This understanding is crucial when judging the mistakes and wrongdoings they may later engage in. The monster Fiscon lived a few generations before Cleopatra, but the character of the generations in between remained largely unchanged until her birth. In fact, the cruelty, corruption, and vice that ruled every part of the royal family actually increased instead of decreased. Fiskin's niece, who initially disliked him and was forced to marry him, eventually became just as ambitious, selfish, and cruel as him after his death. She had two sons, Lathyrus and Alexander. When Fiskin died, he left the kingdom of Egypt to her in his will, giving her the authority to choose one of these two sons to govern with her. The oldest person had the right to this privilege because they were born first. However, she preferred the youngest person because she believed that her power would be stronger if they ruled together, as she would have more control over him. The people in power in Alexandria, however, opposed this idea and demanded that Cleopatra share the government of the kingdom with her oldest son, Lathyrus. They made her bring Lathyrus back from exile and make him the nominal ruler. Cleopatra had no choice but to comply, but she made her son divorce his wife and marry another woman, whom she believed she could control more easily. The mother and the son went on together for a while. Lathyrus was the king in name, but their household was a constant battleground due to his mother's desire to control everything and his efforts to resist her oppressive rule. Finally, Cleopatra captured several of Lathyrus's servants, the eunuchs who worked in different positions within the palace. She cruelly injured and mutilated them and then showed them to the public. Cleopatra falsely claimed that Lathyrus was responsible for these brutal acts and urged the people to rise up and punish him for his crimes. In this and other similar ways, she caused the people in the court and the city to truly despise Lathyrus, resulting in his expulsion from the country. Subsequently, there were numerous brutal and violent wars between the mother and the son, during which both sides committed horrendous acts against each other. Alexander, the youngest son, was very scared of his awful mother, so he chose to leave Alexandria on his own. However, he eventually came back to Egypt. His mother immediately thought that he was planning to challenge her authority and decided to kill him. After learning about her plans and feeling overwhelmed by her unbearable control, he made the decision to end the fear and anxiety he had been living with by murdering her. He followed through with this act and subsequently fled the country. Lathyrus, his brother, then came back and ruled peacefully for the rest of his life. Eventually, Lathyrus passed away, and his son, Ptolemy Aletes, inherited the kingdom. Ptolemy Aletes was the father of the famous Cleopatra. We can't make the image presented in the history of this famous family seem less harsh by viewing Alette's mother as an outlier. Her masculine and merciless characteristics, which she demonstrated vigorously throughout her formidable career, were not unique. She was similar to other princesses in the lineage in terms of ambition, selfishness, extreme and thoughtless cruelty, and complete disregard for moral principles and family bonds. She was, in essence, a typical example of the rest. For example, she had two daughters who were consistent and worthy followers of such a mother. 
A passage in the lives of these sisters illustrates very forcibly the kind of sisterly affection that prevailed in the family of the Ptolemies. Here's what happened. There were two princes from Syria, a country located northeast of the Mediterranean Sea, not too far from Egypt. Despite being brothers, they were in a state of intense hatred towards each other. One of them tried to poison the other, which led to a war between them. As a result, Syria was greatly affected by the destruction caused by their armies. One of the sisters, whom we have mentioned, married one of the princes. Her name was Tryphena. During the ongoing war between the two brothers, Cleopatra, the other sister, who had previously been divorced from Lathyrus by his mother, married the other brother. Tryphena was very angry at Cleopatra for marrying her husband's enemy, and the sister's intense hostility and hatred were now added to the brother's previous display of unnatural and murderous passion, completing the show of this shameful contest to the world. Actually, during this time, Tryphena seemed to become more interested and excited about the contest because she wanted to get back at her sister. She closely followed the progress of the contest and actively supported the prosecution of the war. The husband's party, for various reasons, appeared to be winning. Cleopatra's husband was forced to move around the country, and eventually, to ensure her safety, he left her in Antioch, a big and well-protected city. He believed she would be safe there while he fought in other areas that needed his attention. Upon finding out that her sister was in Antioch, Tryphena convinced her husband to launch an attack on the city. He led a large detachment of the army and successfully besieged and captured the city. Cleopatra, in order to avoid becoming a captive, sought refuge in a nearby temple. In the past, a temple was seen as a safe place that couldn't be violated. So the soldiers left her there. But Tryphena asked her husband to give her sister, Cleopatra. She was determined to kill her, she said. Her husband tried to convince her not to do this terrible thing, and he said that, It would be cruel and pointless to kill her. She cannot harm us in the future war. Killing her now will only make her husband and friends stronger. Besides, she has taken refuge in a temple, and if we violate that sanctuary, we will incur the wrath of heaven. Also, remember that she is your sister, and killing her would be an unnatural and unforgivable crime. With that, he told Trefina to stop talking about it because he absolutely refused to let anything bad happen to Cleopatra. This refusal by her husband to do what she asked made Trefina even more angry and resentful. In fact, she became jealous when she saw how much he cared about her sister and how interested he was in her fate. She thought, or pretended to think, that her husband defended her so passionately because he loved her. The person she hated, who was once just an enemy, now became a rival in her eyes. She made up her mind that she would destroy this rival no matter what. To carry out her plan, she commanded a group of fearless soldiers to forcefully enter the temple and capture her. Cleopatra, in fear, rushed to the altar for safety and held onto it tightly. The soldiers struggled to pull her away from the sanctuary. In the chaos, Cleopatra was tragically injured, and despite her efforts to seek refuge, she succumbed to her injuries on the temple floor. The terrible screams that the poor victim let out when she first started running away and being terrified gradually turned into the most dreadful curses towards her sister, who had destroyed her out of relentless hatred as her life slipped away. Despite the examples we have shown of this remarkable family's character and actions, the rule of this dynasty has always been regarded as one of the most progressive, enlightened, and successful governments in ancient times. In the next chapter, we will discuss the situation within the country during the reign of these aggressive rulers. In today's world, when we see ambition, selfishness, political bias, dishonest plans, and moral mistakes in the actions of current leaders and politicians, it's simple to think that the character of nations has gotten worse as time has passed. However, a thorough and attentive study of the history of this famous dynasty can significantly challenge this belief. 
by examining the actions and character of the rulers of ancient times, we can see that the narrative provides an accurate and truthful portrayal of the general nature of those who governed the world in the past. This reflection might reveal that the issues in governance and leadership are not unique to our era, but have been persistent challenges throughout history. Cleopatra Chapter 3 The Silicon Valley of the Ancient World it should not be assumed that the scenes of extreme indulgence, cruelty, and crime, which were frequently displayed and taken to extreme levels in the palaces of the Egyptian kings, were equally prevalent throughout the entire community during their reign. The government's internal administration and institutions that regulated the people's industrial activities, maintained peace and order, and enforced justice was managed by qualified individuals who, overall, faithfully performed their duties. As a result, despite the king's indulgent behavior, the government's regular affairs and the daily lives of people continued relatively peacefully, prosperously, and happily. Throughout the 300 years of Ptolemy's history, Egypt was consistently a bustling land of industry with occasional interruptions. The floods came at their expected time and then receded as usual. The vast fields that had been nourished by the water were cultivated everywhere. The lands were plowed, the seeds were planted, and the canals and waterways that spread out from the river in all directions were opened or closed as needed to control the watering. The people were busy, and therefore virtuous. And since the sky in Egypt is hardly ever covered by clouds and storms, the view remained consistently beautiful with greenery and charm, day after day and month after month, until the harvested grain was stored and the land was prepared for the next flood. People are often seen as virtuous when they are actively working. This is based on the idea that bad behavior in society often comes from not having enough to do. In big communities, this issue is most common among two groups— those who are so rich they don't need to work, and those who are so poor and disadvantaged that they can't get good jobs. Wealth that is freely owned and controllable by its possessor allows them to manage it as they wish. While wealth can sometimes lead individuals to behave badly, it generally does not corrupt entire groups of people, as it does not make them lazy. But if a country's institutions create a privileged class who rely on inherited wealth or fixed annuities for their income, and they have no need to work for a living, they will inevitably end up being inactive and idle. Vicious pleasures and indulgences are the inevitable result for such a class as a whole. The simple pleasures of humans are meant for moments of rest and relaxation in a busy life, as intended by the author of nature. These enjoyments are always found insufficient to satisfy someone who makes pleasure their sole purpose in life. Similarly, if there is a group of people who are extremely disadvantaged and unable to be motivated by regular work due to social factors or uncontrollable circumstances, they are likely to become corrupt and immoral. This is why the term degradation is often associated with vice in all languages. There are many exceptions, it is true, to these general laws. Many active people are very wicked, and there have been frequent instances of the most exalted virtue among nobles and kings. Still, as a general law, it is unquestionably true that vice is the result of idleness, and the areas where vice is found are at the top and at the bottom of society, those being the regions where idleness prevails. The best way to combat vice is by providing employment. In order to create a virtuous society, it is important that everyone, regardless of their position, has something to occupy their time. Following these principles, it becomes apparent that despite the apparent dominance of extreme and dreadful wrongdoings in the palaces of the Ptolemies and among their court nobles, the situation was different in governance. The state ministers, responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the government, executed their duties with wisdom and dedication. In all the normal levels of society, there was generally a high level of hard work, prosperity, and happiness. 
This prosperity was widespread, not just in rural areas like the Delta and along the Nile, but also among the merchants, navigators, and artisans in Alexandria. Alexandria quickly became a bustling and important city after its founding. Several factors contributed to its rise as a major trading hub. Firstly, it served as the primary location for exporting the surplus grain and agricultural products that were abundantly produced along the Egyptian valley. This product was transported by boats to the highest point of the delta, where the river branches divided. It was then taken down the canopic branch to the city. The city itself was not located directly on this branch, but on a narrow strip of land near the sea, a short distance away. It was difficult to enter the channel directly because of the bars and sandbanks at its mouth, caused by the constant battle between the river and the sea. However, Alexander's engineers found a deep spot where the city was built. They established the port there and then dug a canal to connect it to the Nile. This allowed for easy access between the river and the sea. The crops from the valley were transported down the river and through the canal to the city. In the city, large warehouses and granaries were built to store the crops until the ships arrived at the port to transport them. The ships came from various places such as Syria, the coasts of Asia Minor, Greece, and Rome. They brought the agricultural products and manufactured items from their own countries. They sold these to the merchants of Alexandria and bought the products of Egypt in return. The port of Alexandria was always busy and lively. Merchant ships were always arriving and departing, or staying still in the water near the shore. Sailors were putting up sails or lifting anchors, or rowing their large boats through the water, singing as they pulled the oars. In the city, there was constant activity. Men were unloading the canal boats that had come from the river. Porters were moving bundles of goods or bags of grain from a warehouse to a dock, or from one landing to another. The king's guards occasionally paraded, and ships of war would arrive or depart to bring or take away armed men. These events sometimes interrupted, or as people might have said, decorated, the scene of productive work. Occasionally, peaceful activities were completely suspended for a short time due to a rebellion or civil war between rival brothers, or caused by conflicting claims between a mother and son. These interruptions, though few, were not long-lasting. It was in the best interest of the royal family to minimize damage to the economy. The prosperity of commercial and agricultural activities determined the revenues. The rulers knew this well. Even though two rival princes might hate each other and fight to destroy their enemies, they had a strong reason to spare the property and lives of the peaceful people. These people were engaged in profitable work, and their efforts supported the estate the combatants were fighting for. Seeing the subject in this way, the Egyptian rulers, especially Alexander and the earlier Ptolemies, tried their best to make Alexandria a great commercial city. They built palaces and warehouses. One of the most expensive and famous buildings they constructed was the lighthouse mentioned earlier. This lighthouse was a tall tower made of white marble. It was located on the island of Pharos, across from the city, and at a distance from it. There was a narrow strip of shallow water and sandbars connecting the island to the shore. A pier or causeway was constructed over the shallows, which eventually turned into a wide and populated strip of land. The main part of the ancient city, however, was on the mainland. The shape of the earth means that a lighthouse on a coast needs to be high up so that its top can be seen from far away. Architects usually choose a hill, cliff, or rocky area near the shore to build the lighthouse higher up. There was no chance to do this at Pharos because the island, like the mainland, was flat and low. So the only way to achieve the necessary height was by building a tall structure using marble blocks that had to be transported from far away. The Alexandrian lighthouse was constructed during the reign of Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second ruler of the dynasty. No effort or expense was spared in its construction. Its fame was partly due to its prominent location at the entrance of the largest trading hub of its time. 
It stood there like a guiding beacon, attracting the attention of every sailor whose ship came into view and offering reassurance and guidance. The light at the top of the tower was created by a fire made of materials that would produce a very bright flame. This fire burned slowly during the day and was lit again when the sun went down. It was continuously refueled throughout the night. Of course, building and maintaining the Pharos of Alexandria was an impressive achievement. One may wonder whether the credit for this accomplishment should go to the architect who designed and built it, or to the monarch who provided the necessary resources and support. The architect's name was Sostratus, a Greek. The ruler was the second Ptolemy, also known as Ptolemy Philadelphus. Ptolemy commanded that a marble tablet be placed on the wall near the top of the tower with an inscription that prominently displayed his name as the builder. However, Sostratus chose to include his own name instead. He made the tablet and placed it where it belonged. He wrote his name on it in Greek letters to show that he made it. He did this secretly and covered the tablet with a fake material that looked like stone. On the outside, he carved a new inscription with the king's name. Over time, the lime decayed and the king's inscription vanished. However, his own inscription, which lasted as long as the building stood, became visible. The pharaohs was said to have been 400 feet high. It was famous worldwide for many centuries. Unfortunately, today it is only a pile of ruins that have no purpose or meaning. In addition to this towering lighthouse, there was another important place in ancient Alexandria that was known for its light and knowledge. It was a huge library and museum that was created and kept up by the Ptolemies. The museum, which was initially created, did not refer to a collection of interesting objects, as its name might suggest. Instead, it was a place of education, consisting of a group of knowledgeable individuals who dedicated their time to philosophy and science. The institution was well-funded, and impressive buildings were constructed for its activities. The king who started it began to gather books for the members of the institution. This cost a lot of money, because each book that was added to the collection had to be copied by hand on special paper with a lot of effort and attention. Many scribes were always working on this at the museum. The kings who were most interested in creating this library would take the books owned by individual scholars or stored in different cities of their kingdoms. They would then have the scribes of the museum make beautiful copies of these books, keeping the originals for the Grand Alexandrian Library and giving the copies to the people or cities that had been deprived of them. Just like they did with travelers in Egypt, they would borrow any valuable books they had and make copies to give back, while keeping the originals. Over time, the library grew to 400,000 volumes. The museum buildings couldn't accommodate any more books, but there was a grand temple called the Serapion in another part of the city. This temple, dedicated to the god Serapis, was a splendid complex of buildings. The temple's origins and history were fascinating. The story goes like this. One of the gods worshipped by the ancient Egyptians was called Serapis. This deity had been revered by the Egyptians long before the city of Alexandria was established, or the Ptolemies ruled. Coincidentally, there was a statue with the same name in a bustling town called Sinope. This town was located at the tip of a peninsula that jutted out from Asia Minor into the Black Sea. Sinope was like the Alexandria of the North. It was the main center of commerce in that region. The Serapis of Sinope was worshipped by sailors as their protector. Sailors who visited the city offered sacrifices and prayers to Serapis, believing that he had the power to keep them safe during storms. They spread the word about his name and stories of his imagined interventions to every place they traveled. As a result, the god's reputation grew and reached all the coasts of the Black Sea and later extended to faraway regions and kingdoms. The Serapis of Sinope came to be seen as the protective deity of sailors everywhere. Accordingly, when the first ruler of the Ptolemaic dynasty was making plans to beautify and expand Alexandria, 
he received a divine message in a dream. The message instructed him to bring the statue of Serapis from Sinope and place it in a temple that he would build in honor of the god. It was clear that this project would bring significant benefits to the city. Firstly, building a temple dedicated to the god Serapis would make it stand out to the rural population, who would likely assume that the deity being honored is their own ancient god. Additionally, Alexandria would become the main religious hub for the maritime and nautical communities, who have traditionally worshipped the god of Sinop. This would happen if their revered idol could be transported and placed in a new, grand temple specifically constructed for him in Alexandria. Alexandria could never become the main port and station for ships in the world unless it had the sanctuary and shrine of the god of sailors. Ptolemy therefore sent a message to the king of Sinope and offered to buy the idol. However, the embassy was not successful. The king refused to give up the god. The negotiations went on for two years, but without success. Eventually, due to a famine caused by abnormal weather conditions on the coast, the city's inhabitants agreed to give up their deity to the Egyptians in return for corn. Ptolemy provided the corn and took possession of the idol. He then constructed a temple that, when completed, exceeded in grandeur and magnificence nearly all other religious buildings in the world. This temple stored the additional books for the Alexandrian Library when the museum's rooms were full. In total, there were 400,000 rolls or volumes in the museum and 300,000 in the Serapian. The museum was known as the main library, while the Serapian was considered its subsidiary. Ptolemy Philadelphus was very interested in collecting books for his library. He wanted to gather all the books in the world. He hired scholars and travelers to find out what books existed in other countries. When he found out about these books, he did everything he could to get the original books or the best copies of them. He sent to Athens and got copies of the famous Greek historian's works. Then, like in other cases, he had really nice copies made. He sent the copies back to Athens along with a lot of money to make up for the difference in value between the original works and the copies in this exchange. During his research for new books to add to his library, Ptolemy learned that the Jews possessed sacred writings in their temple in Jerusalem. These writings contained a detailed and fascinating history of their nation from ancient times, as well as other books of prophecy and poetry. These books, which were actually the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament, were completely unknown to all nations except the Jews. Among the Jews, they were only known to priests and scholars. These books were considered sacred and were kept in Jerusalem. The Jews would have thought it was wrong to show them to non-Jewish nations. Actually, the educated people from other countries wouldn't have been able to read them because the Jews kept themselves separate from everyone else. So, their language was hardly ever heard outside of Judea and Galilee back then. Ptolemy thought it would be great to have copies of these sacred books in his library. These books were the entire literature of a nation that was, in some ways, the most extraordinary nation that ever existed. Ptolemy had the idea to not only add a copy of these writings in Hebrew to his library, but also to have them translated into Greek. This way, Greek and Roman scholars who came to his capital could easily read them. However, the first step to accomplish either of these plans was to get permission from the Jewish authorities. They might not want to give up any copies of their sacred writings. There was one situation that made Ptolemy think that the Jews would not want to fulfill a request from an Egyptian king at that time. This was because, in previous reigns, the Egyptians had captured many prisoners during wars. These prisoners were brought to Egypt and sold as slaves to the people who now live there. They were employed as laborers in the fields or operating large water pumps. The masters of these unfortunate slaves believed, like other slave owners, that they owned their slaves as property. In a way, this was partially true because they had purchased them from the government after the war. Although this did not give them a legitimate right to own the slaves as individuals, 
it could be argued that it created a valid claim against the government in case of future emancipation. Ptolemy, or his minister, as it is unknown who was actually responsible, decided to free these slaves and send them back to their home country. This was done in an attempt to appease the Jews and make them more open to the request that he was about to make for a copy of their holy texts. However, he generously paid a large amount of ransom to those who held the captives. According to ancient historians, who always embellish their stories with exaggeration, the number of slaves freed on this occasion was 120,000, and the compensation paid to the owners was 600 talents, equivalent to $600,000. And yet, this was just an initial expense to prepare for acquiring a new series of books and expand the vast collection. Once the captives were freed and returned, Ptolemy sent a grand embassy to Jerusalem, accompanied by respectful letters to the high priest and extravagant gifts. The ambassadors were greeted with the utmost respect. Ptolemy asked to have copies of the sacred books for his library, and the priests happily agreed. They made copies of all the sacred writings, which were beautifully made and decorated with gold letters. The Jewish government also, at Ptolemy's request, chose a group of Hebrew scholars, six from each tribe, who were knowledgeable in both Greek and Hebrew. Their task was to go to Alexandria, specifically to the museum, and create a precise translation of the Hebrew books into Greek. Since there were 12 tribes and six translators chosen from each, a total of 72 translators were involved. This translation came to be known as the Septuagint, derived from the Latin term Septuagint Duo, which means 72. Although people outside of Judea did not consider these Hebrew scriptures as books of divine authority, they were still highly interested in them as fascinating works of history. Greek and Roman scholars who visited Alexandria to study at the museum were particularly intrigued. Copies of the Septuagint translation were made and spread to other countries. Over time, more copies were made, resulting in the widespread circulation of the work among scholars worldwide. When Christianity spread throughout the Roman Empire, the priests and monks were very interested in this early translation of such an important part of the sacred scriptures, even more so than the ancient scholars. They made new copies for abbeys, monasteries, and colleges. When printing was invented, this work was one of the first to be printed, showcasing the amazing power of typography. The original manuscript created by the scribes of the 72, and all the early copies that were made from it, have been lost or destroyed a long time ago. But instead, we now have hundreds of thousands of printed books that contain copies of it. These books are found in various libraries, both public and private, across the Christian world. In fact, even now, after more than 2,000 years, you can find a copy of Ptolemy's Septuagint at any major bookstore in any civilized country. It was initially obtained through a national embassy and an expense of over a million dollars, according to accounts. However, nowadays, you can easily get it for the equivalent of two days' wages for an average worker. In addition to constructing the pharaohs, the museum, and the temple of Serapis, the early Ptolemies carried out many other projects with the same goal. These projects aimed to bring together various sources of attraction, such as commerce, literature, and religion in Alexandria. The purpose was to make the city a prominent center of interest and a popular destination for people from all over the world. They collected a lot of money by heavily taxing all the crops grown in the Nile Valley. The annual floods, which brought great fertility, provided funds for the royal treasuries. Therefore, the rains in Abyssinia, which is the source of the Nile, funded the construction of the Pharos lighthouse at its mouth and supported the establishment of the library in Alexandria. The taxes imposed on the people of Egypt to provide funds for the Ptolemies were so high that the majority of the farming population barely had enough to survive. While we admire the grandeur and magnificence of the city, we must also acknowledge the widespread poverty and destitution that the majority of the people faced. 
They lived in small villages with poor houses along the riverbanks so that the capital could have beautiful temples and palaces. They spent their lives in darkness and lack of knowledge so that 700,000 valuable manuscripts could be collected at the museum for foreign philosophers and scholars to use. The policy of the Ptolemies was probably the best, overall, for the progress and well-being of humanity during their time. However, we shouldn't overlook the sacrifices they made to achieve these results. Nowadays, we can achieve even greater results without the same level of sacrifice. If the people of the United States choose to give up the comforts and conveniences they enjoy as individuals, the scenario changes. Imagine if farmers living in their cozy homes across the country decide to abandon their houses, furniture, carpets, books, and their children's privileges. Suppose they keep only enough from their yearly labor to barely sustain themselves and their families, living a basic life in a simple, bare shelter. If they then sent all their remaining earnings to a ruling sovereign on the Atlantic coast, this ruler could use the funds to build a magnificent capital. Such a city could surpass the ancient Alexandria of the Ptolemies in grandeur and fame. The country would pay the same price for its capital city as the ancient Egyptians paid for theirs. The Ptolemies used the tax revenues they collected in a generous and enlightened way to achieve their goals. They had great ideas like building the pharaohs, moving the statue of Serapis, and funding the museum and library. These ideas were executed with utmost care and perfection. All the other actions they planned and carried out to expand and enhance the city were done with the same scientific and enlightened mindset. They created new streets, built magnificent palaces, constructed docks, piers, and breakwaters, and armed and manned fortresses and towers. They also made every effort to attract a large number of people from the most advanced civilizations of that time. The city offered great incentives for merchants, mechanics, and artisans to live there. People from all over the world, including poets, painters, sculptors, and scholars, were welcomed and provided with everything they needed for their work. These plans were very successful. Alexandria quickly became highly regarded and important. When Cleopatra, who was destined to rule over this magnificent city, came onto the scene, there was only one city that could rival Alexandria's greatness, Rome. Cleopatra Chapter 4 Cleopatra's Early Life When Cleopatra came into the picture, Rome was the only city that could be compared to Alexandria in terms of importance and appeal as a capital. Rome had one advantage over the Egyptian city. Its military power was much greater and had influence over many nations. Alexandria governed Egypt and some nearby coasts and islands. However, during the three centuries when Alexandria was growing in power and reputation, the Roman Empire had expanded to encompass nearly the entire civilized world. Egypt had been, up until now, too far away to be directly accessed. However, the events in Egypt itself eventually became intertwined with the actions of the Roman Empire, particularly around the time Cleopatra was born. This had a significant and unique impact on her life, and understanding these events is crucial to fully grasp the circumstances in which she started her journey. The expansion of the Roman Empire into Egypt and the resulting interactions between Roman generals and the Egyptian ruler contributed significantly to the fame of this particular queen. Her story stands out and captivates more than those of the other nine Cleopatra who ruled in the same royal lineage. Ptolemy Oletus, Cleopatra's father, was known for his dissolute and corrupt lifestyle. He indulged in vice and debauchery. The only talent he seemed to have was playing the flute, of which he was proud. He organized musical competitions in Alexandria, where musicians played for prizes and recognition. He would also participate as a competitor in these contests. The people of Alexandria, and the world in general, believed that activities like these were not worth the attention of someone who came from such a famous family of rulers. 
They strongly disliked the king for his bad behavior and crimes, but they also looked down on his low ambition. There was a question about whether he had the right to be king because his birth, from his mother's side, was not legitimate and was of low status. Instead of trying to confirm and secure his power with a strong and successful government, he completely ignored public affairs. To protect himself from being overthrown, he came up with a plan to be recognized in Rome as one of the allies of the Roman people. Once this happened, he believed that the Roman government would feel obligated to support him and keep him on the throne if there was any danger. The Roman government was a type of republic, and at that time, the two most powerful men in the state were Pompey and Caesar. Caesar was gaining power in Rome when Ptolemy requested an alliance. Meanwhile, Pompey was not in Rome as he was fighting a war with Mithridates, a strong ruler who was resisting Roman power in Asia Minor. Caesar was heavily in debt and in desperate need of money. He needed the money not only to deal with his current financial problems, but also to fund certain important political plans he had. After a lot of discussions and delays, it was agreed that Caesar would use his influence to form an alliance between the Roman people and Ptolemy. In return, Ptolemy would pay Caesar the amount of 6,000 talents, which is about $6 million. Part of the money, Caesar said, was for Pompey. Ptolemy was given the title of ally and agreed to raise the money he had promised by increasing taxes in his kingdom. However, these measures that he took to secure his throne ended up leading to his downfall. The anger and dissatisfaction of his people, which had been widespread and intense before, even though it had been hidden and controlled, now erupted into open violence. It was unbearable to have these new oppressive measures imposed on them, in addition to all the other difficulties they had already endured, especially considering the reasons behind it. It was already hard to bear for them to have their country sold to the Roman people, but to be forced to pay for the transfer was completely intolerable. Alexandria revolted. Ptolemy didn't have the courage to act decisively or remain calm in any situation. His first instinct was to flee Alexandria to save his life. His second was to go to Rome and ask the Roman people for help. Ptolemy had five children when he fled. The oldest was Princess Berenice, who was already grown up. The second child was Cleopatra, who is the main focus of this story. Cleopatra was about 11 years old at that time. There were also two young sons, one named Ptolemy. When the Alexandrians found out about Ptolemy's flight, they decided to make Berenice the new ruler in his absence. They believed that the sons were too young to take control during this critical situation, as it was highly likely that Olette, the father, would try to regain his kingdom. Berenice willingly accepted the honor and authority that were bestowed upon her. She settled in her father's palace and commenced her rule with grandeur and opulence. Over time, she believed that marrying a prince from a neighboring kingdom would make her position stronger. She initially sent ambassadors to propose to a prince named Antiochus from Syria. The ambassadors returned and informed her that Antiochus had passed away, but he had a brother named Seleucus, who became the successor. Berenice then sent them back to make the same offers to him. He accepted the proposals, came to Egypt, and he and Berenice got married. After spending some time with him, Berenice realized that she didn't like him as a husband, so she had him strangled. Finally, after many other plots and secret planning, Berenice managed to negotiate a second marriage and wed a prince, or someone claiming to be a prince, from a country in Asia Minor named Archelaus. She was happier with this second husband compared to the first, and she finally started to feel more stable and secure on her throne. She believed she was now ready to successfully oppose her father if he ever tried to come back. It was during tumultuous times, surrounded by the influences that were common in the households of her father and sister, that Cleopatra spent her formative years. Despite being exposed to various immoral and cruel acts, she grew up as a spirited and beautiful child in the royal palaces, 
albeit somewhat neglected and spoiled. Meanwhile, Olette, the father, continued his journey to Rome. His reputation and story were widely known among the neighboring nations, and he was universally disliked. This was due to his past life of shameful immorality and his current act of fleeing from the troubles caused by his own vices and crimes. He made a stop at Rhodes during his journey. At that time, Cato, a famous Roman philosopher and general, was also there. Cato was a person known for his strong and unwavering virtue, and he had a lot of influence in public affairs during that time. Ptolemy sent a messenger to inform Cato about his arrival, thinking that the Roman general would quickly come to pay his respects to him, a king of Egypt, even though he was currently facing some difficulties. Cato told the messenger to say that he didn't think he had any specific business with Ptolemy. But if Ptolemy had any business with him, he could come and see Cato if he wanted to. Ptolemy had to control his anger and agree to this. He really wanted to see Cato because it was important for his plans. He wanted to get Cato's support and help. So, Ptolemy got ready to visit Cato instead of having Cato visit him. He planned to go in the most royal and impressive way he could. He showed up at Cato's place the next day, dressed fancy and with a lot of people with him. Cato, on the other hand, was dressed very plainly, and his room was simple too. When the king came in, Cato didn't even stand up. He just pointed to a chair and told the visitor to sit down. Ptolemy began to present his case to Cato, hoping to gain Cato's support in persuading the Roman people to help him. However, Cato did not show any inclination to support Ptolemy. Instead, he criticized Ptolemy for leaving his own kingdom and becoming a victim of the greedy Roman leaders. Cato pointed out that in Rome, nothing could be accomplished without bribes, and even all the resources of Egypt would not be sufficient to satisfy the Romans' insatiable desire for money. He ended by suggesting that he should go back to Alexandria and depend on his own determination and initiative to overcome the challenges he faced. Ptolemy was embarrassed by this rejection, but after discussing it with his companions and followers, they concluded that it was now too late to turn back. So the entire group returned to their ships and continued their journey to Rome. Ptolemy discovered that when he arrived in the city, Caesar was not there because he was in Gaul. On the other hand, Pompey, who had returned triumphant from his campaigns against Mithridates, was now a powerful and influential leader at the capital. This change in situation was not necessarily bad because Ptolemy had a good relationship with Pompey, just as he had with Caesar. He helped him in his wars with Mithridates by sending him a group of horse soldiers as part of his strategy of building good relations with the Roman people in any way he could. Additionally, Pompey received a portion of the money that Ptolemy had paid to Caesar for the Roman alliance. He would receive more if Ptolemy was ever reinstated. Pompey wanted to help the king who had escaped. He welcomed him to his palace, treated him well, and took steps to bring his case before the Roman Senate. He asked the Senate to take quick and strong action to restore the king, because they were obligated to protect him from his rebellious subjects. There was initially some opposition in the Roman Senate to supporting such a man, but it was quickly suppressed. This was due to Pompey's influence and Ptolemy's promises and bribes. The Senate decided to reinstate the king to his throne and started making preparations to implement the plan. The Roman provinces closest to Egypt were Cilicia and Syria, which are located on the eastern and northeastern coast of the Mediterranean Sea, north of Judea. The forces stationed in these provinces would be the most convenient for providing the necessary troops for the expedition. The province of Cilicia was under the command of the consul Lentulus. Lentulus was in Rome at that time for a temporary reason, leaving his province and the troops stationed there under the command of a lieutenant general named Gabinius. It was decided that Lentulus, along with his Syrian forces, would be responsible for restoring Ptolemy to his throne. However, before these plans could be finalized, an incident occurred that posed a serious threat to their success. 
It appears that when Cleopatra's father initially left Egypt, he spread a rumor that he had been killed during the revolt. The purpose of this plan was to hide and disguise his escape. The Berenice government quickly found out what really happened and found out that the runaway had headed towards Rome. They quickly concluded that he was going to ask the Roman people for help, and they decided that if that was true, the Roman people should first hear their side of the story before deciding in his favor. They immediately prepared to send a large embassy to Rome. The delegation consisted of over a hundred people. Berenice's purpose in sending such a large number was not only to show respect for the Roman people and the importance of the matter, but also to prevent Ptolemy from trying to stop the embassy or bribe its members. The number, although it was large, was not enough to achieve this goal. The entire Roman world was in a state of disorder and violence at that time, under the control of desperate and reckless military leaders who allowed ample opportunities for the commission of any imaginable crime. Ptolemy planned, with the help of his strong supporters who were deeply invested in his success, to ambush and eliminate many members of this group before they arrived in Rome. Some were killed, some were poisoned, some were manipulated and influenced by bribes. A few survivors made it to Rome, but they were too frightened by the dangers that surrounded them to take any public action regarding the task they had been entrusted with. Ptolemy started to feel satisfied with himself for successfully outsmarting his daughter in her attempts to defend herself against his plans. Instead, it became clear that this terrible betrayal had the opposite effect of what the perpetrators intended. As more people in Rome learned about the facts, they became increasingly outraged. The group that had initially opposed Ptolemy's cause used this as an opportunity to strengthen their opposition. They gained significant support from the widespread anger caused by Ptolemy's crimes, making it extremely difficult for Pompey to maintain his position. The opposing party eventually discovered, or claimed to discover, a passage in the Sibylline Oracles, which were sacred books kept by the priests. These books were believed to contain prophecies about how public affairs should be conducted, and the passage said, If a king of Egypt asks you for help, be friendly, but don't give him troops. If you do, you'll be in great danger. This created a problem for Ptolemy's friends. Initially, they tried to avoid this strict command by claiming that the passage didn't exist. They argued that it was all made up by their enemies. However, this argument was rejected, and then they tried to interpret the passage in a way different from its obvious meaning. Finally, they argued that while they were not allowed to provide troops directly to Ptolemy, nothing was stopping them from sending their own armed forces to Egypt. They believed that by doing so, they could help suppress the rebellion and overthrow Berenice's government. Afterward, they could invite Ptolemy to peacefully return to his kingdom and reclaim his crown. They insisted that this would not be considered providing him with troops, and therefore would not be disobeying the oracle. These attempts to avoid following the advice of the oracle by Ptolemy's friends only made the arguments and disagreements between them and his enemies even more intense than before. Pompey did everything he could to support Ptolemy, but Lentulus, after a long period of uncertainty and delay, concluded that it would not be wise for him to get involved in it. Eventually, Gabinius, the lieutenant in charge of Syria, decided to take on the task. He was convinced by certain promises from Ptolemy, which would be fulfilled if he succeeded, and with some informal encouragement from Pompey regarding the use of Roman troops under his command. Gabinius then decided to march to Egypt. His path would naturally follow the shores of the Mediterranean Sea and lead through the desert to Pelusium, which was previously mentioned as the border town on this side of Egypt. From Pelusium, he would march through the heart of the delta to Alexandria. If the invasion is successful, he plans to overthrow the government of Berenice and Archelaus. Then, he will invite Ptolemy to return and reinstate him on the throne. Gabinius heavily relies on the assistance of a remarkable man who is his second in command. This man will play a significant role in the future history of Cleopatra. His name was Mark Antony. 
Antony was born in Rome into a very distinguished family. However, his father passed away when he was very young. He spent the inheritance from his father on reckless and harmful behavior. Continuing down this destructive path, he quickly accumulated massive debts and found himself tangled in insurmountable problems. His creditors kept bothering him for money and took legal action to force him to pay, even though he couldn't afford it. He was also constantly pursued by many enemies he had made in the city because of his violent behavior and criminal activities. Eventually, he ran away and went to Greece. During his journey to Syria, Gabinius encountered Antony and offered him a position in his army. Antony, being proud and ambitious, declined the offer unless he was given a command. Recognizing Antony's daring and energetic nature, Gabinius agreed to his terms, seeing the qualities that were valued in a successful soldier during that time. He appointed him as the leader of his horse soldiers. Antony showed his excellence in the subsequent military campaigns in Syria, and now he was very eager to participate in this Egyptian venture. In reality, it was mainly his passion and excitement for undertaking this task that convinced Gabinius to agree to Ptolemy's suggestions. The challenge and obstacle that they viewed as the most concerning aspect of the entire expedition was crossing the desert to reach Pelusium. Indeed, Egypt had always relied on its seclusion as its primary defense. The sandy and empty desert, with no water, was very difficult and dangerous to cross, even for a peaceful group of travelers. It would be even more dangerous for an army, as they would be exposed to enemy attacks along the way and face strong opposition when they reached the inhabited country, tired and exhausted from the hardships of the journey. Many times in ancient history, large armies tried to march through the desert surrounding Egypt, but they were often completely destroyed by hunger, thirst, or sandstorms. These challenges and risks, however, did not scare Mark Antony at all. In fact, the prospect of overcoming them and achieving glory was one of the main reasons why he decided to undertake this endeavor. The dangers of the desert were one of the things that made the expedition appealing. He led his cavalry ahead of Gabinius to capture Pelusium in order to create a path for the rest of the army to enter Egypt. Ptolemy went with Antony. Gabinius was supposed to follow. Despite his flaws, to put it mildly, Mark Antony had some admirable qualities. He was passionate, yet he remained calm, composed, and wise. He consistently showed genuine and noble generosity in his actions and personality, which endeared him to his comrades. He was about 28 years old at this time. He was tall and had a manly appearance. His face looked intelligent and expressive, with a high forehead, an aquiline nose, and lively eyes. He dressed very simply and casually, and he acted very friendly and relaxed when interacting with his soldiers. He would join them in their sports, joke with them, and good-naturedly receive their jokes in return. He would also have his meals with them around their simple tables, in the open field, these habits of interaction with his men would have been detrimental to his authority if he were an ordinary commander. However, in the case of Mark Antony, these open and familiar manners only served to highlight and garner more admiration for his military genius and intellectual prowess. Antony led his group of horsemen quickly and safely across the desert and reached Pelusium. The city was unprepared to fight and surrendered immediately. The entire garrison became his prisoners. Ptolemy wanted them all to be killed right away, considering them rebels who deserved death. However, Antony, true to his character, firmly rejected any such cruelty. Ptolemy had to wait before taking revenge because he didn't have the power yet but he was confident that the day of his victory over his daughter and her supporters was coming soon. Actually, Berenice and her government were scared when they found out that Antony and Ptolemy had arrived at Pelusium, the city had fallen, and Gabinius was coming with a huge army of Roman soldiers. Archelaus, Berenice's husband, used to be friends with Antony in the past. 
Antony still considered them friends, even though they had to fight each other for the kingdom. The government of Berenice formed an army. Archelaus took charge of it and moved forward to confront the enemy. Meanwhile, Gabinius arrived with the main Roman troops and began their march, together with Antony, towards the capital. Since they had to take a detour to the south to avoid the inlets and lagoons that extend into the land on the northern coast of Egypt, their path led them through the central part of the delta. Numerous battles took place, with the Romans consistently emerging victorious. The Egyptian soldiers were unhappy and rebellious. They may have felt this way because they saw the government they were forced to fight for as illegitimate. Eventually, a decisive battle was fought. Archelaus was killed, Berenice was captured, and their government was completely destroyed. This allowed the Roman armies to march to Alexandria. Mark Antony and Ptolemy were both considered depraved and vicious men, but in different ways compared to Cleopatra's father. The difference between the men became evident in how they focused their interest and attention after the battle. During the conflict, the Egyptian king and queen, Archelaus and Berenice, were key figures for both Antony and Ptolemy, each standing out in the opposing army. Antony was particularly focused on the well-being of his friend, the king, while Ptolemy was deeply concerned about the fate of his daughter, Berenice. After the battle ended, Ptolemy was likely focused on the fact that his daughter was taken captive, while Antony would be consumed by the news of his friend's death. One person was happy, and the other person was sad. Antony looked for his friend's body on the battlefield, and when it was found, he focused on giving it a very grand burial. At the funeral, it seemed like he genuinely and honestly felt sad about his old friend's death. Ptolemy, however, was very happy to find his daughter as his prisoner. The moment he had been waiting for to get his revenge had finally arrived and the first thing he did when he gained control in Alexandria was to command the execution of his daughter. Cleopatra, Chapter 5, The Exiled Princess, Nightmares, Before Caesar's Love During the time when Cleopatra's father and her sister were having a terrible argument, as described in the previous chapter, Cleopatra was living in the royal palace in Alexandria. She was a young and attractive girl, around 15 years old. Luckily, she was too young to get involved in the dispute. Her two brothers were even younger than her. They all three stayed in the royal palaces, watching the revolution without being affected by it. It is interesting that both boys were named Ptolemy. The city of Alexandria was very excited when the Roman army entered to put Cleopatra's father back on the throne. Many people in the city were happy to have the former king back. Historical observations of monarchies show that when a legitimate king or dynasty is overthrown by a rebellious populace, the situation often changes over time. Even if the dethroned rule was tyrannical and marked by heinous crimes, people tend to become open to the idea of restoration within a few years. In this specific case, there was no significant difference in the government of Berenice, who replaced her father, to make it an exception to this general rule. The majority of the people, especially those who did not participate in Berenice's government, were eager to welcome Ptolemy back to his capital. However, those who did participate in the government were all executed by Ptolemy's orders. There was a lot of excitement in the city when the Roman army arrived. Until then, Egypt had been mostly influenced and controlled by Greeks, both in civil and military positions. The arrival of the Romans brought a new level of interest and added to the already diverse range of excitement in the capital. The return of Ptolemy was celebrated with games, shows, and various celebrations. Naturally, besides the king himself, the foreign generals who played a key role in achieving this goal were the main focus of attention and attraction during these public celebrations. Mark Antony was especially esteemed and admired by the public at that time. His distinct behavior and honest, straightforward attitude set him apart. His choice of simple clothing and demeanor further highlighted his uniqueness. His efforts to safeguard the lives of captured Pelusium soldiers 
and to ensure honorable funerals for enemy combatants killed by his army, led people to see a noble and generous side to his character. Despite his flaws, these actions earned him widespread admiration and praise. The flaws of such a person often appear as virtues to the world. For instance, there is a story about Antony. Once, he wanted to give a gift to someone who had done him a favor. He told his treasurer to send a larger amount of money than necessary as a gesture of gratitude, showing his impulsive and generous nature. The treasurer, being more cautious than his master, wanted to lower the amount of money but hesitated to suggest it outright. Instead, he counted the money and arranged it in a pile where Antony would see it. By seeing the large sum, he thought Antony would realize it was excessive. The treasurer said he sent a gift to a specific person, as instructed. Antony understood the treasurer's intention and suggested sending double the amount because he expected it to make a better impression. To decide, in such circumstances, to double an extravagance just to frustrate the sincere effort of a loyal servant to reduce it is definitely a mistake. However, it is one of those mistakes that the world, throughout history, will always admire and praise the person responsible. In short, Antony became the center of attention and received favor during his time in Alexandria. Whether he caught Cleopatra's attention specifically at this time or not is unclear. However, she definitely caught his attention. He admired her youthful beauty, her liveliness and intelligence, and her various talents. However, she was still very young, only 15 years old, while Antony was nearly 30, so she probably didn't make a very strong impression on him. A little while later, Antony returned to Rome and didn't see Cleopatra again for many years. When the two Roman generals left Alexandria, they left a significant part of the army under Ptolemy's command to help him hold on to his throne. Antony came back to Rome. He became famous for his march through the desert and for successfully invading Egypt and restoring Ptolemy. He also received a lot of money from Ptolemy, which helped replenish his funds. Ptolemy agreed to pay a huge amount of 2,000 talents, which is equal to $10 million, as the price for his restoration. This shows how big and important this famous campaign was. Ptolemy obtained a significant amount of money for his payments by taking away the properties of the friends of Berenice's government who were killed on his orders. It was rumored that the number of those sentenced to death increased greatly because Ptolemy needed their assets to fulfill his obligations. Antony, as a result of this campaign, went from being a disgraced and homeless fugitive to becoming one of the richest and most famous people in Rome. This also made him one of the most powerful individuals in the city. A major civil war broke out at that time between Caesar and Pompey, and Antony supported Caesar's cause. Meanwhile, during the civil war between Caesar and Pompey, Ptolemy was able to maintain his position on the throne for approximately three years. This was made possible with the assistance of the Roman soldiers who had been left behind by Antony and Gabinius. As he got older and his life was coming to an end, he started thinking about who he should give his kingdom to. Cleopatra was the oldest child and showed great potential in terms of intelligence and appearance. Her brothers were much younger than her. Although traditionally, a son would have a stronger claim, Cleopatra's exceptional talents and growing influence made it uncertain whether it would be wise to overlook her. The father resolved the issue in the typical manner used by the Ptolemy family to overcome such difficulties. He decided that Cleopatra should marry her eldest brother, and they would rule together. Continuing to prioritize the alliance between Egypt and Rome, which had been the main focus of his reign, he officially entrusted the implementation of his will and the care of his children to the Roman Senate. The Senate agreed with the appointment and chose Pompey to act as their representative to fulfill the responsibilities of the position. However, Pompey was preoccupied with the civil war against Caesar and did not take any immediate action regarding his appointment. Fortunately, 
it appeared that no action was required as everyone in Alexandria seemed willing to accept and support the arrangements made by the king before his death. Cleopatra was married to her younger brother, who was only about ten years old. At the time, Cleopatra herself was around eighteen years old. Since they were both too young to rule, the kingdom was governed by two ministers chosen by their father. Pothinus, a eunuch, served as the secretary of state, while Achilles was the commander-in-chief of the armies. Thus, even though Cleopatra was technically called a queen due to these events, she had not yet truly ascended to the throne. There were still many challenges and risks to overcome before she could actually become a ruler. Instead of actively trying to expedite this process, she appeared to quietly accept the arrangements her father had made for a while. Pothinus was a eunuch who served as a government officer under Ptolemy. He was proud, ambitious, and domineering, with a strong desire to rule. He was willing to use any means necessary to achieve his goals. Previously, he had seen Cleopatra as a young child. Now that she was queen, he was reluctant to give her real power. He watched her personal growth and growing influence over others in the first few years after her father's death. This observation made his envy and dislike for her grow quickly. Her looks, her skills, and a certain unexplainable charm that was present in everything she did all contributed to her having a lot of personal influence. But while these things made other people interested in Cleopatra and attached to her, they only made Pothinus more jealous and envious. Cleopatra was becoming his competitor. He tried to hinder and outsmart her. He behaved disrespectfully and dominantly towards her, aiming to keep her in a subordinate position, as he believed it was his duty. This was because he remained the guardian of both Cleopatra and her husband, as well as the ruler of the kingdom. Cleopatra had a strong spirit, and she became angry because of this treatment. Pothinus made an effort to get her young husband, Ptolemy, on his side as the fight continued. Ptolemy was younger and not as strong-willed as Cleopatra. Pothinus realized that he could easily control him for a longer time compared to Cleopatra. He managed to make the young Ptolemy feel jealous of his wife's growing influence and convinced him to join in efforts to oppose and undermine it. These attempts to make her husband dislike her only made Cleopatra angrier. She was not someone who could be forced. The palace was full of arguments between the rivals. Pothinus and Ptolemy started taking steps to get the army on their side. Eventually, they had a big fight and Cleopatra was kicked out of the kingdom. She went to Syria. Syria was the closest place of safety. It was also the country that had helped her father regain the throne after he had been expelled many years earlier. While her father had initially gone to Rome, the support he received had come from Syria. Cleopatra believed she could receive similar aid by going there directly. She was not disappointed. She got an army and started marching towards Egypt, taking the same route that Antony and Gabinius had taken when they came to restore her father. Pothinus raised an army and went out to confront her. He appointed Achilles as the commander of the troops and the young Ptolemy as the nominal ruler, while he, as the guardian and main minister of the young king, held the actual power. The troops of Pothinus moved towards Pelusium. They encountered Cleopatra's forces coming from the east. The armies set up camps close to each other and started getting ready for battle. However, the battle did not happen. It was stopped because of some major and unexpected events that suddenly happened in Egyptian history. These events completely changed the course of affairs in ways that were not anticipated. The civil war between Roman generals Caesar and Pompey and their supporters started soon after Cleopatra's father died. This war has been going on since then with great violence. People in Egypt could hear the sounds of the war from far away, but it didn't cause much concern there. The huge armies of these two powerful conquerors had moved slowly, like two fierce birds of prey, flying and fighting in the air. They traveled across Italy into Greece, and from Greece through Macedon into Thessaly. 
As they advanced, they fought terrible battles with each other, leaving destruction in their wake. Finally, a decisive battle took place at Pharsalia. Pompey had suffered a complete defeat. He had escaped to the seashore with a few ships and a small group of followers, feeling lost and desperate. Caesar pursued him relentlessly, with a small fleet of galleys carrying around two or three thousand men. Although this force was adequate for chasing a fugitive, it was entirely inadequate for any other purpose. Pompey remembered his previous support for Ptolemy Alet in Rome, which successfully led to the monarch's restoration and enabled the young Ptolemy to become the king. Pompey then arrived at Pelusium and requested Ptolemy to receive and provide him protection. He anchored his fleet near the shore before sending the request. Pothinus, the actual commander of Ptolemy's army, agreed to the request regarding Pompey. He stated that Pompey should be welcomed and protected, and he would arrange a boat to transport him to the shore. Pompey had some doubts about this offer of hospitality, but he eventually decided to go to the shore in the boat that Pothinus sent for him. Once he arrived, the Egyptians, following Pothinus's orders, stabbed and beheaded him on the sand. Pothinus and his council decided that this was the safest option. If they welcomed Pompey, they thought that Caesar would become their enemy. If they refused to welcome him, Pompey himself would be upset, and they didn't know which one it would be safer to upset. They didn't know how the war would end if both generals were allowed to live. They said that. But by killing Pompey, we will definitely please Caesar, and Pompey himself will be out of the game. Meanwhile, Caesar, unaware of Pompey's whereabouts in Egypt, headed directly to Alexandria. He put himself in great danger by doing so, because the forces under his command were not enough to protect him if he got into trouble with the authorities there. Also, once he arrived on the Egyptian coast, it would be difficult for him to leave again. During this time of year, there was a regular wind blowing towards that part of the coast. This wind made it easy for a fleet of ships to go to Alexandria, but almost impossible for them to come back. Caesar was not afraid of danger in his endeavors and plans, although he was usually careful. However, his strong desire to pursue Pompey outweighed any concerns for his own safety. He reached Alexandria, but Pompey was not there. He docked his ships at the port, landed his troops, and established a base in the city. By a twist of fate, at the same time, two significant events occurred the assassination of a well-known Roman general on the eastern coast and General Caesar's arrival in Alexandria on the western coast. These events happened quickly and at the same time, much like sudden thunderclaps. The news surprised the entire country and captured everyone's attention. At the camps of Cleopatra and Ptolemy in Pelusium, there was excitement and wonder. Instead of preparing for battle, both sides were busy speculating on the possible outcomes of the unexpected turn of events in public affairs. Naturally, everyone was focused on Alexandria. Pothinus quickly went to the city with the young king, while Achilles either went with them or joined them shortly after. They took along the head of Pompey, which they had severed from his body on the shore where they had killed him. They also had a seal that they removed from his finger. When they reached Alexandria, they sent the head, wrapped in a cloth along with the seal, as gifts to Caesar. Considering the ruthless actions and cruel nature of the Ptolemies, they believed that Caesar would take pleasure in seeing the severed and horrifying head of his formidable opponent and enemy. Instead of this, he was shocked and displeased, and ordered the head to be buried with the most solemn and imposing funeral ceremonies. However, he accepted and kept the seal. The image engraved on it was of a lion holding a sword in its paw, a fitting symbol of the men's characters. While they were noble and fair in many ways, their arguments instilled fear and terror throughout the world. Ptolemy's army stayed at Pelusium while he and his advisors went to Alexandria. The army was supposed to keep an eye on Cleopatra. Cleopatra wanted to go to Alexandria and ask for Caesar's help, 
but she couldn't because she was outside the country, and her enemies had a strong army to stop her. So she stayed at Pelusium, not knowing what to do. Meanwhile, Caesar soon found himself in an awkward situation in Alexandria. He had been used to having complete and absolute power for many years, no matter where he was. Now that his rival Pompey was dead, he believed he was the ruler of the world. However, in Alexandria, he didn't have enough resources to support and enforce his claims. But he was not the type to back down from advancing his claims, even in the slightest, because of that. He made himself at home in the palaces of Alexandria as if he were the king. He paraded through the city streets, surrounded by his guards, and showed off the symbols of power used in Rome. He demanded the 6,000 talents that Ptolemy Alet had promised him for securing a treaty with Rome, and he asked Pothinus to pay the remaining amount owed. He also stated that the Roman people were chosen by Alet to carry out his will. As the Roman consul and representative of the Roman people, it was his responsibility to take on this task. He needed to resolve the conflict between Ptolemy and Cleopatra. He requested Ptolemy to provide a written statement explaining his claims and the reasons why he believed he should be the ruler instead of Cleopatra. On the other hand, Pothinus, unaccustomed to recognizing anyone as superior to himself, struggled with Caesar's authority. Despite Caesar's power being more limited in scope, Pothinus was stubborn and consistently resisted all of Caesar's demands. However, the methods he used were in line with his weak and dishonorable mind. He instigated fights between the people of Alexandria and Caesar's soldiers in the streets. He thought that because Caesar had only a small number of troops in the city and few ships in the port, he could harass the Romans without any repercussions. However, he lacked the bravery to launch an open attack against them. He pretended to be a friend, or at least not an enemy, but he treated them in a rude and disrespectful way. He agreed to provide them with food, but he gave them poor quality and damaged provisions. When the soldiers complained, he told them that since they were living off others, they shouldn't complain about the food. He replaced the palace's gold and silver plates with wooden and earthenware ones, claiming that he had to sell them to meet Caesar's demands. He also tried to create hostility in the city against Caesar's proposal to hear and decide the dispute between Cleopatra and Ptolemy. Ptolemy claimed to be a ruler and refused to submit to any foreign authority. Instead of taking direct and effective action, he chose to create obstacles by constantly causing small, irritating, and pointless annoyances. Caesar's requests may have been unfair, but they were straightforward, courageous, and honest. The eunuch's opposition might have been justified, but his approach was seen as dishonorable and contemptible. As a result, spectators of the conflict generally supported Caesar in their opinions. Caesar, with only a small force at his command, found himself in a large and powerful city. The city's garrison and population grew more hostile towards him each day, leading him to quickly recognize the escalating danger of his situation. He couldn't retire from the scene. He probably wouldn't have retired if he could have. So he stayed in the city, behaving with caution and care but he still had the same confident and superior demeanor as always. He immediately sent a messenger to Syria, which was the closest Roman-controlled country, with orders to quickly send several legions to Alexandria. Cleopatra Chapter 6 Gorgeous Princess in the Presence of Caesar, the Son of Egypt Meanwhile, while the events mentioned in the previous chapter were happening in Alexandria, Cleopatra felt worried and unsure in her camp. She was uncertain about the best course of action. She wanted to be in Alexandria because she was aware that Caesar had complete control over the situation in Egypt. She really wanted to present her case to him. But Ptolemy and Pothinus were talking to the judge, and she didn't even know if they were trying to get on his good side. Meanwhile, she was far away and no one knew about her situation, or even if she still existed. 
Of course, in this situation, she really wanted to go to Alexandria. But she was very confused about how to do that. She couldn't lead an army there because the king's army was at Pelusium and blocking the way. She couldn't go alone or with a few people because Pythinus had garrisons and officers in every town and village, and they would definitely stop her. She didn't have any ships, so she couldn't travel by sea. If she managed to get to the gates of Alexandria, she would still face the challenge of safely making her way to Caesar's palace. The city, with the exception of Caesar's controlled area, was under the control of Pythinus's government. The challenges she faced in achieving her goal seemed almost impossible to overcome. Cleopatra was determined to try. She messaged Caesar, asking if she could appear before him and defend herself. Caesar agreed and encouraged her to come. She traveled by boat with only a few attendants along the coast to Alexandria. Her main supporter on this risky journey was a servant named Apollodorus. She also had some other attendants with her. When they arrived in Alexandria, they waited until night and then approached the base of the citadel walls. Here, Apollodorus wrapped the queen in a piece of carpet and covered it with a cloth to make it look like a regular bundle of goods. Then he carried the load on his shoulder and went into the city. Cleopatra was around 21 years old at that time, but she had a slim and graceful figure, so the burden was not too heavy for him. Apollodorus arrived at the palace gates where Caesar was staying. The guards asked him what he was carrying. He said it was a gift for Caesar. So they allowed him to pass, and the pretended porter carried his package safely in. When it was unrolled and Cleopatra came out to view, Caesar was perfectly charmed with the spectacle. In such situations, she experienced a range of conflicting emotions that she couldn't suppress. These emotions added a dual layer of intrigue to her already pretty and expressive face, as well as to her naturally captivating manners. She was excited by the adventure through which she had passed, and yet pleased with her narrow escape from its dangers. She felt a strong curiosity and interest in the important figure she had been unexpectedly brought before. However, this was tempered by a sense of timidity, common in new and unexpected situations like this, especially when aware of being keenly observed by men. This mix of emotions is a natural part of a woman's experience in such circumstances. The conversation between Caesar and Cleopatra made a strong impression on him. Cleopatra's intelligence, liveliness, unique ideas, and way of expressing them made her a very entertaining and pleasant companion, in addition to her personal charms. In fact, she completely captured the heart of the great conqueror. Because of his strong attachment to her, Caesar became unable to act impartially in the dispute between Cleopatra and her brother over their rights to the crown. We often refer to Ptolemy as Cleopatra's brother, despite him being her husband, because their marriage was probably more of a formality. This is especially plausible considering Ptolemy was only 10 or 12 years old at the time Cleopatra was expelled from Alexandria. Caesar, who was around 52 years old at the time, had a wife named Calpurnia. They had been married for about 10 years. Calpurnia was living quietly in Rome at that time. She was a kind and gentle woman who loved her husband deeply. She was patient and understanding of his flaws, but also worried and unhappy about the challenges and risks that his ambitious nature often brought. Caesar quickly developed a strong interest in supporting Cleopatra's cause. He showed her great affection, and she naturally began to return his kindness. For Cleopatra, having a sincere and dedicated friend who sought to protect and make her happy was a new and welcome experience. Her father had always neglected her, and her younger, less mature brother, whom she was forced to marry, had turned into her worst enemy. Although he was just a pawn used by others to strip her of her inheritance and exile her, this didn't make her view him any more favorably. Instead, it made him seem both detestable and pitiful in her eyes. Even the government officials in the Alexandrian court had turned against her. 
they believed they could exert greater control over her brother in her absence. Thus, she had always been surrounded by selfish, greedy, and relentless enemies. Now, for the first time, she seemed to have a friend. Suddenly, she found a protector willing to support and defend her. This man was not only attractive in appearance and behavior, but he also possessed a noble and generous nature, coupled with a high social standing. He loved her, and she could not refrain from loving him in return. She entrusted her case entirely to him, shared all her interests with him, and surrendered herself completely to his control. Her complete trust in him was not unwarranted, especially when it came to his attempts to bring her back to power. Caesar's legions from Syria had not yet arrived, so his position in Alexandria was weak and uncertain. Nevertheless, he maintained his confident and determined demeanor, wasting no time in working toward Cleopatra's reinstatement. Caesar's bold claim to decide the ruler in a country where he had arrived by chance, amidst a power struggle for the throne, highlighted the extent of Roman authority at that time. His assertion, made without any actual means to enforce it, reflected how much power and respect the Roman Empire commanded in the eyes of people around the world. It also reveals Caesar's unique qualities and personality. Shortly after Cleopatra arrived, Caesar summoned the young Ptolemy and advised him to bring Cleopatra back. Ptolemy, who was old enough to have his own thoughts, strongly disagreed with this idea. During their conversation, Ptolemy discovered that Cleopatra was in Alexandria, hiding in Caesar's palace. This knowledge made him very angry and upset. He left Caesar's presence in a rage. He took off the crown that he usually wore in public, threw it on the ground, and stomped on it. He told the people that he had been betrayed and showed signs of extreme frustration and disappointment. In his efforts to incite public anger against Caesar and the Romans, he centered his complaint on his sister's actions. He emphasized the impropriety of her surrendering herself to Caesar, using this as a key point to provoke outrage. It's quite possible that his jealousy and anger stemmed from something other than just his sister's actions. Considering he likely shared traits with other Ptolemies in his family, his real concern was probably Cleopatra gaining significant influence and power. This fear would be heightened by her alliance with such a distinguished protector. However, Ptolemy, along with Pothinus, Achilles, and all his other friends and supporters, managed to create a widespread and intense uproar in the city. The people were stirred up, gathering in large, angry crowds, filled with indignation. Some people understood the reasons for their anger and acted accordingly. Some individuals were aware that the motive behind the sudden outbreak was to target the Romans. They were ready to engage in any violent acts against these foreign intruders. Their willingness to act was present, regardless of having a specific reason or not. Many others, most of whom lacked any real understanding of the situation, knew only that chaos and commotion would ensue in and around the palaces. They were drawn to the scene, wanting to be part of the action. Ptolemy and his officers did not have a big group of soldiers in Alexandria. The events that had happened since Caesar arrived had happened very quickly, so not much time had passed yet. The main army was still in Pelusium. The main group that attacked Caesar was the city's population, led by the king's guards. Caesar had only a small portion of his forces at the palace during the attack. The rest of his forces were spread throughout the city, Despite this, Caesar did not feel worried and did not limit himself to defensive actions. He sent a group of his soldiers to capture Ptolemy and bring him back as a prisoner. The soldiers, trained and disciplined like skilled Roman fighters, were full of excitement and energy. This kind of spirit often happens in troops led by Caesar himself. With these advantages, they could achieve almost any mission even against a large and enraged civilian population. The soldiers went out, captured Ptolemy, and brought him back. The people were initially shocked by the boldness of this action and then angered by the disrespect of it, seen as an attack on their ruler. The uproar would have grown even louder. 
But Caesar, who had achieved his goals of capturing both Cleopatra and Ptolemy, decided it was best to calm things down. He went up to a high window in his palace where the angry crowd couldn't reach him and started signaling that he wanted to talk to them. When there was quiet, he gave them a speech that was meant to calm them down. He explained that he wasn't asserting his authority to choose between Cleopatra and Ptolemy as their superior. Instead, his role was to fulfill the responsibility entrusted to him by Ptolemy Olet, their father. This duty involved representing the interests of the Roman people. Besides this, he stated that he had no authority in the matter. His only goal in fulfilling his duty to review the case was to resolve the issue fairly and reasonably for all involved parties. This was to prevent the civil war from escalating and causing severe damage to the country. He advised them to leave and stop causing trouble in the city. He promised to resolve the issue between Cleopatra and Ptolemy and believed that everyone would be happy with his decision. This speech, given with eloquence and persuasion in a dignified and imposing manner that Caesar's speeches to unruly crowds were known for, had a significant impact. Some people were convinced, while others were silenced. Those who remained resentful and angry found themselves powerless due to the pacification of the majority. The angry crowd was broken up, and Ptolemy stayed with Cleopatra under Caesar's guard. The next day, Caesar fulfilled his promise and convened a meeting with influential individuals from Alexandria and government officials. He introduced Ptolemy and Cleopatra in an effort to resolve their conflict. The original testament created by Ptolemy Alet had been stored in the public records of Alexandria and was well preserved. A verified copy of the testament had also been sent to Rome. Caesar had the original testament brought out and read to the assembly. The provisions were very clear. It stated that Cleopatra and Ptolemy should get married and have joint power as king and queen. The document recognized the Roman Commonwealth as an ally of Egypt. It designated the Roman government to be the executor of the testament and the guardian of both the king and queen. This document was very clear and explicit. Just by reading it, it seemed to answer the question. Caesar proclaimed that Cleopatra should hold equal power to Ptolemy. As the Roman representative and executor of the testament, he stated it was his duty to safeguard the rights of both the king and the queen. It was difficult to argue against his decision. In addition to Cleopatra and Ptolemy, there were two more children of Ptolemy Aulet's in the royal family during this time. One was a girl named Arsinoe. The other was a boy who interestingly had the same name as his brother, Ptolemy. The children in question were quite young. However, Caesar believed that granting them a royal territory might win favor with the Alexandrians and increase the likelihood of them accepting his decision. He suggested assigning the island of Cyprus to them. This was actually a gift because Cyprus was under Roman control at that time. Everyone seemed happy with this decision except Pothinus. He had always been a strong and long-standing enemy of Cleopatra, and he knew that her reinstatement would lead to his downfall and ruin. He left the meeting feeling upset and decided that he wouldn't agree with the decision. Instead, he would take action right away to stop it from happening. Caesar organized a series of events and parties to celebrate and confirm the restoration of a good relationship between the king and queen and the resulting end of the war. He thought that having big celebrations would help remove any bad feelings that people still had. He hoped these events would make everyone in the city feel kinder and more friendly towards each other. The people agreed with these measures and actively worked to make them happen. However, Pothinus and Achilles secretly tried to organize a group and make plans to remove Caesar's influence and make Ptolemy the sole ruler again. Pothinus told everyone who would listen to him that Caesar's true intention was to make Cleopatra the sole queen and remove Ptolemy from power. He urged them to join forces with him to oppose this plan as it would result in Egypt being ruled by a woman. He also devised a scheme with Achilles to recall the army from Pelusium. 
the army had 30,000 men. The conspirators thought that if they could get this army to Alexandria and keep it under Pothinus's command, they would gain a significant advantage. With this army, they believed they could overpower Caesar and his 3,000 Roman soldiers. However, there was a risk in ordering the army to march towards the capital. Ptolemy, under Caesar's influence, might communicate with the officers and take command of the army, thus sabotaging the conspirators' plans. To avoid this, it was agreed that Achilles would leave Alexandria, go to the camp at Pelusium, take command of the troops there, and lead them to the capital. He would only follow orders from Pothinus during these actions and after his arrival. Even though there were probably guards at the gates and roads out of the city, Achilles managed to escape and join the army. He led the troops and started marching towards the capital. Pothinus stayed in the city as a spy, pretending to agree with Caesar's decision and be friendly with him. But secretly, he was planning to overthrow Caesar and gathering information to help the army and Achilles when they arrived. All these things were done in secret, and the conspirators were very clever in planning and carrying out their plots. Caesar seemed to not know about what his enemies were doing until he heard that Ptolemy's army, with at least 20,000 soldiers, was approaching the city. Meanwhile, the forces he had requested from Syria had not yet arrived. With limited resources, he had no choice but to protect the capital and himself as best as possible. He decided to test the impact of orders sent in Ptolemy's name to prevent the army from approaching the city. Two officers were given these orders and sent to deliver them to Achilles. The officers' names were Dioscorides and Serapion. It is evident from the situation that in ancient times, the authority and importance of a king were highly regarded. This is exemplified by Achilles, who, upon the arrival of these men with a clear command from Ptolemy, chose to immediately kill them instead of hearing their message. This decision was likely made to avoid the responsibility of disobeying the orders. He knew that if he could successfully capture Alexandria, oust Caesar and Cleopatra, and restore Ptolemy as the sole ruler, the king would likely be satisfied with the result. In such a scenario, any past misconduct on his part might be overlooked, provided he didn't openly defy a direct order. Regardless of the nature of the commands brought by these messengers, he believed that they were likely given under the authority of Caesar and not by Ptolemy's own choice. In cases where commands came in Ptolemy's name, there was a common practice among officers serving under ancient military rulers. They often chose to eliminate the messengers rather than receive the command, as this avoided the direct risk of disobeying a royal order. Achilles then ordered the officers to be captured and killed. The soldiers followed orders and stabbed them, and then the bodies were taken away. However, it was discovered that the soldiers had not completed their tasks properly. They weren't interested in the cold-blooded assassination, and maybe they felt a sense of compassion that stopped them from doing it. In the end, even though both men were badly hurt, only one of them died. The other lived and recovered. Achilles kept moving towards the city. Caesar, realizing that the situation was becoming very serious, took command of the capital and started making necessary arrangements to defend himself there. His numbers were too small to defend the entire city against the large force that was coming to attack it. So he put his troops in the palaces, citadel, and other parts of the city that could be defended. He blocked off all the streets and roads to these places and strengthened the gates. And while he did his best to use the limited means of defense he had, he also made efforts to get help from outside. He dispatched ships to various locations accessible from Alexandria, such as Syria, Cyprus, and Rhodes, where Roman soldiers might be stationed. His goal was to request the authorities in these places to swiftly send additional troops to his aid. During this time, Cleopatra and Ptolemy stayed in the palace with Caesar, supposedly working together with him to defend the city from Achilles. Cleopatra genuinely cooperated, but Ptolemy's support was not very reliable. Although he had to pretend to be on Caesar's side due to his position, 
he probably secretly wanted Achilles to succeed and overthrow Caesar's plans. Pothinus was more actively hostile towards them, although he was still cautious. He secretly communicated with Achilles, occasionally sharing information about events and defense preparations within the city, as well as giving him instructions on what to do. He was very cautious and wise in all these actions, pretending all the time to be on Caesar's side. He acted as if he was very actively helping Caesar to better secure the different areas where attacks were anticipated, and in finalizing and completing the plans for defense. However, despite his cunning, he was caught in his deceitful actions, and his career abruptly ended before the major conflict occurred. There was a barber in Caesar's household who, for some reason, started to suspect Pothinus. With not much else to do, the barber spent his time observing the eunuch's actions and informing Caesar about them. Caesar told the barber to keep watching. He did, and soon his suspicions were confirmed when they intercepted a letter that Pothinus had written to Achilles, which was then brought to Caesar. This provided the required evidence of what they referred to as his guilt, and Caesar commanded for him to be executed by beheading. This event naturally caused a significant commotion within the palace, as Pothinus had been the dominant minister of state for many years, essentially acting as the king. His execution also caused fear among many others, who, although under Caesar's control, secretly hoped that Achilles would succeed. One person who was very worried about these fears was Ganymede. He was the officer in charge of Arsinoe, Cleopatra's sister. Caesar's plan to establish Cleopatra as co-ruler with her brother Ptolemy over Cyprus did not happen. After Caesar made his decision, everyone's focus shifted to the news of the approaching army and the preparations needed for the upcoming battle. Arsinoe stayed in the palace with her governor Ganymede. Ganymede had joined Pothinus in his plots. When Pothinus was beheaded, Ganymede decided it would be safest for him to flee. He decided to escape from the city with Arsinoe. It was a dangerous attempt, but he managed to do it. Arsinoe was eager to go, as she was old enough to feel the strong desire for power that seemed to be a common trait in every member of the Ptolemaic family. She was insignificant and powerless in her previous position, but at the forefront of the army, she could immediately transform into a queen. This unfolded exactly as she had anticipated. Achilles and his troops greeted her with cheers. Under Ganymede's guidance, a decision was made regarding the royal succession. They noted that the rest of the royal family was held captive by a foreign general who had taken control of the capital unexpectedly. This situation left the royals unable to wield their power. As a result, they resolved that Arsinoe should assume the crown. Consequently, they declared her as the queen. Everything was now ready for a fierce battle for the crown between Cleopatra, supported by Caesar, and Arsinoe, supported by Ganymede and Achilles. The young Ptolemy, meanwhile, stayed as a prisoner of Caesar. He was confused by the complicated situation and didn't know what outcome to hope for. It was hard to predict whether it would be better for him if Cleopatra or Arsinoe became the successor. Cleopatra, Chapter 7 The War That Burned the World's Largest Ancient Library for Love, Alexandrian War The war which ensued as the result of the intrigues and maneuvers described in the last chapter is known in the history of Rome and Julius Caesar as the Alexandrian War. The events that happened during its progress and its end with Caesar and Cleopatra's victory will be discussed in this chapter. Initially, Achilles had a significant advantage over Caesar in terms of the strength of his forces. Caesar, in fact, only had a group of three or four thousand soldiers with him. He had quickly gathered them and put them on a small fleet of Rhodian galleys to chase after Pompey across the Mediterranean. When he sailed from Europe with a small fleet, it's likely he didn't expect to reach Egypt or get involved in any major military operations there. In contrast, Achilles commanded an army of 30,000 soldiers. His soldiers were a diverse group, but they were all experienced and used to the Egyptian climate. 
they were skilled in the types of warfare that worked well in Egypt. Some of them were Roman soldiers. These men had come with the army of Mark Antony from Syria when Ptolemy Aulet, Cleopatra's father, was put back on the throne. They were left in Egypt, serving under Ptolemy, when Antony went back to Rome. Some were Egyptians. In Achilles's army, there were many runaway slaves who had escaped from different places along the Mediterranean coast and had been added to the Egyptian army over time. These fugitives were all very determined and desperate men. Achilles also commanded a force of 2,000 horses. With such a large cavalry, he became the undisputed ruler of all the open land outside the city walls. Achilles slowly moved forward with his troops until he reached the gates of Alexandria. He surrounded the city from all sides and trapped Caesar inside. Caesar was in a highly dangerous situation. However, he was used to getting himself out of dangerous situations, so neither he nor his army seemed worried about the outcome. Caesar personally felt proud and happy to face the challenges and risks that came his way because Cleopatra was with him. She saw how he handled the situation, admired his strength and bravery, and showed her love to him for his efforts and sacrifices in supporting her. She disclosed all the information to him while observing all the events with keen interest. She was hopeful and proud of the person who had offered to defend her. In short, she was grateful, admiring, and in love. These strong emotions also made her even more charming. The natural strength and liveliness of her personality became gentler and more subdued. Her voice, which always had a certain indescribable charm, gained added sweetness from the power of love. Her face radiated with renewed energy and beauty. The vivacity and spirit of her personality, which would later evolve into boldness and eccentricity, were at this time tempered by her respectful admiration for Caesar. This admiration lent a suitable restraint to her character, making her an exceptionally captivating companion. Caesar was completely captivated by the charms that she unknowingly showed. Under different circumstances, a military commander's personal attachment might have affected his duties. However, in this case, Caesar's love for Cleopatra motivated him to carry out the operations he had undertaken on her behalf with even more determination and energy. The first thing Caesar did was to focus and strengthen his position in the city. This way, he could defend himself there against Achilles until he got additional support from outside. For this purpose, he chose a specific group of palaces and citadels located near the head of the long pier or causeway that led to the pharaohs. He then moved his troops from other areas of the city and stationed them there. The area that he took control of had important city arsenals and public granaries. Caesar gathered all the weapons and war supplies he could find from other parts of the city, as well as all the food and provisions from public storage areas and private warehouses, and stored everything within his lines. He then surrounded the entire area with strong defenses. The roads leading to it were blocked with stone walls. Houses nearby that could have given shelter to an enemy were destroyed, and the materials were used to build walls where they were needed or to reinforce the barricades. Impressive military machines were placed in position to launch heavy stones, wooden beams, and other large projectiles. Openings were created in the walls and defenses of the citadel as needed to allow these machines to operate more easily. There was a powerful fortress located at the front of the pier or mole that led to the island of Pharos. This fortress was not under Caesar's control and was still held by the Egyptian authorities. The Egyptians controlled the entrance to the mole. The island itself, along with the fortress at the opposite end of the pier, was also still under the control of the Egyptian authorities. They seemed inclined to keep it for Achilles. The mole was very long, as the island was almost a mile from the shore. There was a small town on the island, in addition to the fortress or castle built there for protection. The castle's garrison was well fortified, and the town itself housed a robust population. This community was primarily made up of fishermen, sailors, wreckers, 
and other daring types often found in such locales. From their palace windows, Cleopatra and Caesar saw the island with the tall lighthouse in the middle and the castle at its base. They also saw the long and narrow isthmus connecting it to the mainland. They realized it was important to take control of this post because it commanded the entrance to the harbor. In the harbor, on the south side of the mole, there were many Egyptian ships. Some were broken and others were manned and armed to different extents. Achilles was advancing towards the city from the opposite side of the harbor. These ships had not yet been taken by Achilles, but it was likely that he would take them once he gained access to the parts of the city that Caesar had left. Preventing this was essential, as Achilles's control over the fleet would have significant implications. Particularly, if he maintained control of Pharos Island, he would effectively dominate all sea access to the city. He could then not only get more troops and supplies for himself from that area, but he could also effectively block the Roman army from getting any. Caesar believed he needed to protect himself from this danger. He achieved his objective through a two-pronged strategy. First, he dispatched a mission to destroy all the ships in the harbor. Concurrently, he aimed to capture a fort on Pharos Island, which was key in controlling access to the port. This mission was very successful. The soldiers burned the ships, captured the fort, forced the Egyptian soldiers out, and replaced them with Roman soldiers. Then they returned safely to Caesar's lines. Cleopatra watched these actions from her palace windows and greatly admired the bravery and determination of her Roman protectors. The Egyptian ships were burned in this action, which was fortunate for Cleopatra and Caesar. However, it resulted in a catastrophe that has been mourned by the entire civilized world ever since. Some of the burning ships were blown by the wind towards the shore, causing them to set fire to the nearby buildings. The fire spread and caused a big fire, which destroyed most of the library. This library was the only collection of ancient writings that had ever been made, and it was never replaced. The destruction of the Egyptian fleet also led to the downfall and ruin of Achilles. Since Arsinoe arrived in the camp, there has been a constant rivalry and jealousy between him and Ganymede, the eunuch who came with Arsinoe when she fled. The army has been divided into two groups, some supporting Achilles and others supporting Ganymede. Arsinoe supported Ganymede's interests. After the fleet was burned, she accused Achilles of being responsible for the loss due to his negligence or incompetence. Achilles was tried, found guilty, and executed. Ganymede then took over the administration of Arsinoe's government as her minister of state and the commander-in-chief of her armies. During that time, the Egyptian army moved into the areas of the city that Caesar had left. This caused panic and confusion, as it always does when there is a sudden and forceful change of military control within a city. Ganymede's troops surrounded Caesar's citadels and fortifications, trapping him inside. They blocked all land routes to Caesar's lines and started getting ready to attack. They built weapons to break down the walls and set up shops and forges all over the city to make arrows, spears, and other military equipment. He constructed tall towers on large wheels, intending to fill them with armed soldiers. These towers would then be moved towards the walls of the citadels and palaces, allowing his troops to attack from a higher position. He collected money from wealthy citizens and recruited workers and armed individuals by force. He sent messengers across the country to gather the people and ask for financial support and military supplies. The messengers were instructed to convey a critical message to the people. They were to warn that if Caesar and his army were not quickly expelled from Alexandria, Egypt faced a significant threat of losing its national independence forever. The Romans, it is said, had expanded their conquests to almost the entire world. They had previously sent an army to Egypt, led by Mark Antony, claiming to restore Ptolemy Aletes to the throne. Now, another commander with a different force had arrived, providing different reasons for getting involved in their affairs. 
the messengers were to communicate that these Roman invasions could lead to Egypt being fully dominated by a foreign power. To prevent this, they would urge the country's people to unite, face the threat courageously, and expel the invaders. Caesar controlled Pharaoh's island and the harbor, so Ganymede couldn't prevent him from getting more soldiers and weapons from overseas. Ganymede also couldn't limit Caesar's food supply because Caesar had plenty of corn stored in the granaries and warehouses in his part of the city. There was one final thing that the besieged army needed to survive, and that was a lot of water. Caesar's palaces and citadels were supplied with water through many underground aqueducts. These aqueducts brought water from the Nile to large underground cisterns. From there, the water was lifted up using buckets and hydraulic engines for the army to use. Upon considering this situation, Ganymede came up with the idea of covertly digging a canal to redirect the seawater into the aqueducts. He successfully executed this plan, resulting in a gradual change in the water within the cisterns. Initially, it became slightly brackish, then progressively more salty and bitter, until eventually, it became completely unusable. For a while, the soldiers inside the army didn't understand these changes. When they finally realized the reason, they were terrified at the idea that they were now completely vulnerable to their enemies. Without water, they would all die. They believed it was pointless to continue resisting and asked Caesar to leave the city, get on his ships, and sail away. Instead of doing this, however, Caesar ordered all other operations to stop. He utilized all the workers under his command, guided by the captains of each company, to excavate wells across his designated area of the city. According to him, fresh water is typically found at a moderate depth near the sea, even in areas very close to the coast. The digging was successful, and a lot of fresh water was found. This danger was overcome, and the men's fears were relieved. Soon after these events, a small boat from the west coast entered the harbor. It brought news that a fleet of ships had approached Alexandria, but was unable to reach the city due to strong easterly winds. This squadron was sent to the Mediterranean with weapons, ammunition, and military supplies for Caesar. Caesar had requested these supplies as soon as he landed. The ships were stuck on the coast because of the wind and were running out of water. They were in trouble, so they sent a small boat powered by oars to inform Caesar about their situation and ask for help. Caesar quickly went aboard one of his ships, and with the rest of his fleet following him, he sailed out of the harbor. He then headed west along the coast towards the location where the transports were stationed. All this was done secretly. The land near Alexandria is very flat and close to the water, so boats and ships disappear from sight when they are not far from the shore. Travelers have described the illusion of descending from the sea to the land because of the round shape of the water's surface and the flatness of the coast. Caesar could have easily kept his journey a secret if it weren't for the fact that he had to stop at a remote area along the coast, away from Alexandria, to get water for the ships. He then sent a group to search for water in the nearby land. This party was discovered by the rural people and was stopped by a group of horsemen who captured them. The Egyptians learned from these captives that Caesar himself was on the coast with a small fleet of ships. The news quickly spread in all directions, and people gathered from all over. They quickly gathered all the boats and ships available from the nearby villages and different parts of the Nile. Meanwhile, Caesar had moved to the designated area for the fleet and had started towing the transports towards the city. The galleys, powered by oars, were not reliant on the wind. When he came back, he discovered a significant naval force ready to challenge their passage. A big fight happened, and Caesar won. The Egyptian navy that they quickly put together was quickly destroyed. Some ships were burned, some were sunk, and some were captured. Caesar came back to the port with his ships and supplies, feeling very proud. He was greeted with cheers from his soldiers, and even more enthusiastically by Cleopatra, who had been anxiously waiting for news of the expedition. 
she knew that he was putting himself in great personal danger, so she was filled with joy and gratitude to see him return safely. The extra soldiers arriving greatly helped Caesar, and Ganymede realized he had to control the harbor to control Caesar. He decided to quickly build a navy. He sent a message along the coast and told all the ports to send any ships they had to Alexandria right away. He also hired as many people as he could in the city to build more ships. He even took the roofs off some of the most beautiful buildings to get wood for making benches and oars. When everything was prepared, he launched a major attack on Caesar at the port, leading to a fierce battle over control of the harbor, the mole, the island, and the citadels and fortresses that guarded the sea entrances. Caesar understood that this battle would determine the outcome of the war, so he personally joined the fight. He also felt a strong sense of pride and pleasure in showing off his skills to Cleopatra. She could see the battle from the palace windows and was both excited by the risks he took and impressed by his displays of strength and bravery. During this battle, the great conqueror's life was in danger many times. He wore a purple mantle, which made him an easy target for his enemies. So wherever he went, that's where the fighting was the fiercest. Once, in the middle of a chaotic and noisy scene, he jumped from a crowded boat into the water and swam to save his life. He held his cloak in his mouth and pulled it through the water behind him so that his enemies wouldn't get hold of it. While swimming, he held valuable papers above his head with one hand and used the other hand to propel himself through the water. The outcome of this contest was another clear win for Caesar. Not only did Caesar defeat and destroy the ships that the Egyptians had gathered, but he also gained control of the mole, the fortresses at each end of it, the island, the lighthouse, and the town of Pharos. The Egyptians started to lose hope. The army and the people, like everyone else, judged their military leaders based only on their success. They were getting tired of Ganymede and Arsinoe ruling over them, they sent hidden messengers to Caesar expressing their unhappiness and suggesting that if he released Ptolemy, who had been kept as a kind of captive in Caesar's palaces, the people would accept him as their ruler. They believed that this would pave the way for a peaceful resolution of the entire dispute. Caesar was highly inclined to agree with this suggestion. He then summoned Ptolemy and, with a friendly gesture, informed him about the desires of the people of Egypt and granted him permission to leave. However, Ptolemy pleaded not to be sent away. He expressed his deep loyalty to Caesar and his complete trust in him, and he greatly preferred to stay under his care. Caesar said, If we part on good terms, we will meet again soon. With these and similar assurances, he tried to encourage the young prince and then sent him off. Ptolemy was welcomed by the Egyptians with great happiness and was immediately given leadership of the government. Instead, though, rather than trying to resolve the conflict with Caesar, he appeared to now actively engage in it himself with great enthusiasm. He immediately started making extensive preparations, both on land and at sea, to vigorously pursue the war. The outcome of these actions cannot be known anymore because everything changed soon after. A new and significant event happened, shifting everyone's focus to the eastern part of the kingdom. News arrived that a large army, led by General Mithridates, whom Caesar had sent to Asia for this purpose, had unexpectedly reached Pelusium. They had captured the city and were now ready to proceed to Alexandria. The Egyptian army quickly dismantled their camps near Alexandria and marched eastward to confront the new invaders. Caesar pursued them with as many forces as he could safely withdraw from the city. He secretly left the city at night and swiftly traveled across the countryside to join Mithridates, arriving before the forces of Ptolemy. After several marches and movements, the armies clashed, resulting in a major battle. The Egyptians were beaten. Ptolemy's camp was captured. When the Roman army stormed in from one side, Ptolemy's guards and attendants fled in panic and chaos, scrambling over the ramparts. The first person fell into the ditch below, and it quickly became filled with the dead and the dying. 
the people who came after them crossed over the bridge formed by the bodies, stepping on their comrades who were still alive and in pain as they ran away. Those who managed to escape made it to the river. They gathered in a boat that was on the bank and set off from the shore. The boat was carrying too many people, so it sank shortly after leaving land. The Romans pulled the bodies that floated to the shore back onto the bank. Among them, they found one body wearing the royal cuirass, the traditional emblem and armor of the Egyptian kings. They recognized it as the body of Ptolemy. Caesar's victory in the battle and Ptolemy's death ended the war. All that was left was for Caesar to lead the combined forces back to Alexandria. The Egyptian forces in the city did not fight back, and he entered triumphantly. He captured Arsinoe. He ordered Cleopatra to become queen and marry her younger brother, the other Ptolemy, who was about 11 years old at that time. Marrying someone so young was just a ceremony. Cleopatra continued to be Caesar's companion. However, Caesar received criticism for neglecting his responsibilities as the Roman consul and commander-in-chief of the empire's armies. People felt that he shouldn't involve himself in the conflicts of a distant and unrelated kingdom, which had no significant impact on the Roman commonwealth. His friends and the authorities in Rome kept telling him to come back. They were especially angry that he was neglecting his own duties because he was in Egypt with the queen, even though he was supposed to be taking care of the state. This was also causing a lot of pain to his wife Calpurnia and his family in Rome. But Caesar was so captivated by Cleopatra's beauty and the strange power she had over him that he didn't listen to any of these complaints. Even after the war ended, he stayed in Egypt for several months to be with his favorite companion. They would spend entire nights together, feasting and celebrating. After the war, he embarked on a magnificent journey with her throughout Egypt, accompanied by a large retinue of Roman guards. He devised a plan to bring her to Rome and marry her there, and he took steps to change the city's laws to make it possible, despite already being married. Many of Julius Caesar's friends and soldiers in the Roman army became unhappy and disillusioned because of certain events and decisions. The people of Egypt also heavily criticized Cleopatra for her actions. Around this time, Cleopatra had a son, and the people of Alexandria named him Caesarian, after his father, Caesar. However, instead of being supportive or empathetic towards Cleopatra in her new role as a mother, people judged and condemned her. Cleopatra continued to grow in talent and beauty during this period. However, her once charming and innocent vivacity and spirit started to become more assertive and daring. It is the nature of true and rightful love to soften and calm the heart and to instill a gentle and calm spirit into all its actions. On the other hand, love that disregards the boundaries set by God and nature tends to make women more masculine and confident, numbing their emotions and eroding the gentle and shy demeanor that enhances their attractiveness. Cleopatra was starting to feel these effects. She didn't care about what her subjects thought and only wanted to keep her guilty dominance over Caesar for as long as she could. However, Caesar eventually decided to go back to the capital. Leaving Cleopatra with enough forces to maintain her power, he boarded his ships and sailed away. He brought the unfortunate Arsinoe with him, planning to display her as a symbol of his victories in Egypt when he reached Rome. Cleopatra. Chapter 8. The Fall of a King, the Rise of a Queen. The war by which Caesar reinstated Cleopatra upon the throne was not one of very long duration. Caesar came to Egypt to find Pompey at the beginning of August. The war ended, and Cleopatra was securely established by the end of January. So the conflict, although intense, was very short. It only disrupted the peaceful and commercial activities of the Alexandrians for a few months. The war and its consequences did not reach far into the interior of the country. 
the city of Alexandria and the nearby coasts were the main areas of the conflict until Mithridates reached Pelusium. He did march across the delta, and the last battle took place inland. However, only a small part of Egypt was directly impacted by the war. The majority of the people, who lived in the fertile lands near the Nile and in the long valley that reached deep into the continent, were unaware of the conflict, except for vague and distant rumors. The farmers continued their work without interruption, and everything went well. When the conflict finally ended and Cleopatra took control peacefully, she discovered that her empire's resources were hardly affected. She used the abundant revenues she received to live a life of luxury, magnificence, and splendor. The damage to the palaces and other public buildings in Alexandria caused by the fire and the siege was repaired. The broken bridges were repaired. The obstructed canals were reopened. The seawater was stopped from entering the palace cisterns. The debris from demolished houses was cleared. The barricades were removed from the streets. The damage to the palaces caused by military equipment or the occupation of the Roman soldiers was fixed. In short, the city was quickly restored to its previous order and beauty as much as possible. The burned manuscripts of the Alexandrian Library, totaling 500,000, could not be recovered. However, in every other aspect, the city soon regained its former splendor. Cleopatra even attempted to recover the loss in relation to the library. She fixed the destroyed buildings. Later in her life, she gathered around one or two hundred thousand rolls of manuscripts to start a new collection. However, the new library never became as famous and well-regarded as the old one. The previous rulers of Egypt, who were Cleopatra's ancestors, usually used the vast revenues they obtained from the farmers in the Nile Valley for ambitious purposes, as already explained. Cleopatra now appeared to be inclined to use them for indulging in luxury and enjoyment. The Ptolemies used their resources to build big structures and establish impressive institutions in Alexandria. This was done to make the city more glorious and to increase its reputation. Cleopatra, however, as was to be expected of a young, beautiful, and impulsive woman who suddenly found herself in a prominent position with immense wealth and power, spent her royal funds on personal extravagance and lavish parties. She decorated her palaces, constructed beautiful boats for enjoyable trips on the Nile, and spent large amounts of money on clothing, carriages, and extravagant parties. In fact, her spending on these and similar things during the beginning of her reign was so excessive that she is seen as surpassing any previous or subsequent limits of indulgence in luxurious living, personal exhibition, and grandeur. Any simplicity of character and kindness she may have possessed in her earlier years naturally diminished over time due to the influences of the life she was now leading. She was still beautiful and fascinating, but she began to grow selfish, heartless, and scheming. Her little brother, who was only 11 years old when Caesar arranged their marriage, became a source of jealousy for her. He was too young to have any real part in ruling or influencing his sister's decisions and enjoyment. But he was getting older. In a few years, when he turned 15, he would become king and marry Cleopatra, following Caesar's plans and the laws of Egypt. Cleopatra strongly opposed the change in her relationship with him and the government. Just before it was about to occur, she ensured that he was poisoned. His death freed her from all restrictions, just as she had desired. From that point forward, she ruled independently. Throughout the rest of her life, Cleopatra experienced continuous success in terms of wealth, power, and other external aspects of prosperity. She had no moral or ethical concerns that would prevent her from fully and freely indulging in her desires. Additionally, she had ample resources to satisfy those desires. The only thing that prevented her from being happy was that she couldn't satisfy her desires and emotions when they went beyond the limits set by God and nature to control them. 
While Cleopatra relished her opulent and grand early years as a ruler, Caesar was actively and successfully expanding his empire through conquest. After Pompey's death, he would have naturally assumed supreme power immediately. However, his prolonged stay in Egypt and his well-known involvement with Cleopatra provided encouragement and strength to his enemies in different regions of the world. In fact, a rebellion started in Asia Minor, which he had to quickly suppress, was the main reason for his leaving Egypt. Other strategies to oppose Caesar's authority were devised in Spain, Africa, and Italy. His military skill and energy were very impressive. His mere presence had a great influence over people. Moreover, it was astonishing how quickly he moved between continents and kingdoms. In a short time after leaving Egypt, he had conducted successful campaigns in all three known continents. He effectively eliminated all opposition to his power and returned to Rome as the undisputed ruler of the world. Cleopatra, who had been following his career with pride and joy, finally decided to go to Rome and visit him there. The Romans, however, were not very welcoming to her. This was a time when all kinds of vices were tolerated, but people's moral instincts were still able to see through her wickedness. Arsinoe was also in Rome during this time when Caesar was there. He had taken her to Rome after his return from Egypt, as a prisoner and as a symbol of his victory. His intention was to keep her as a captive to be displayed in his triumph. A triumph, as practiced by ancient Romans, was a grand celebration awarded by the Senate to top military commanders upon their return from distant campaigns, where they achieved notable conquests or extraordinary victories. Caesar combined all his victories into one. They were celebrated when he returned to Rome for the final time, after successfully conquering the world. The processions of this victory lasted for four days. In fact, there were four separate victories, one on each day for the four days. The ovations celebrated the wars and conquests in Gaul, Egypt, Asia, and Africa. The processions included prisoners, trophies, weapons, banners, pictures, images, wagons of plunder, captive princes and princesses, wild and tame animals, and everything else the conqueror brought home from his campaigns. These spectacles aimed to arouse the curiosity and admiration of the city's people and highlight the magnitude of the conqueror's achievements. Certainly, the Roman generals, while involved in faraway wars, wanted to bring back notable prisoners and valuable spoils from the enemy. They aimed to enhance the diversity and grandeur of their triumphal processions that celebrated their victories upon returning home. Caesar, for instance, brought Arsinoe from Egypt and kept her captive in Rome until he finished his conquests and the time for his triumph came. She, of course, was part of the victorious procession on the Egyptian day. She walked right in front of the chariot that Caesar rode in. She was in chains, just like any other prisoner, although her chains, as a sign of her high status, were made of gold. The impact on the Roman people of witnessing the sad and distressed princess, moving slowly among the symbols and spoils of violence and looting, was not good for Caesar. The people felt sorry for her and sympathized with her suffering. Her distress reminded them of Caesar's neglect of his responsibilities as a Roman minister by staying in Egypt with Cleopatra for so long. In short, the admiration for Caesar's military achievements that had been strong in his favor seemed to be shifting, and the city was filled with complaints against him even during his triumphs. Actually, Caesar's pride and desire for glory made him try too hard to make his triumphs more impressive than any conqueror before him. However, this ended up having the opposite effect of what he intended. The story of Arsinoe is a good example of this. If it weren't for the sad sight of Arsinoe in the group, people might have forgotten about it. There were other similar examples, such as the feasts. Caesar spent huge amounts of money on feasts and spectacles for the people to celebrate his triumph, using the plunder he obtained from his campaigns. While many people were pleased with the extravagant offerings, 
the majority of the Roman people were angry about the wastefulness and extravagance that was evident everywhere. Instead of impressing people with his achievements in Egypt, such as removing one queen from power and bringing her back as a captive to Rome, only to replace her with another queen, he faced criticism and blame for his actions there. For several days, Rome was filled with rioting and wild parties. The people, instead of being happy with this abundance, believed that Caesar must have extorted a huge amount of money to afford such extravagant and wasteful behavior. There was also another way in which Caesar made people strongly dislike him, using the same methods he used to try to make them like him. The Romans enjoyed watching various types of combats in the city. These combats included fights between ferocious animals, such as dogs against each other or against bulls, lions, or tigers. Many animals were used for this purpose. They were intentionally made angry and aggressive to fight. Occasionally, men who had been captured in war and brought to Rome as gladiators were also used in these fights. These men were forced to fight against wild animals or against each other in the amphitheaters. Caesar, knowing that the Roman assemblies loved such scenes, decided to give them the experience on a grand scale. He believed that the bigger and more intense the fight, the more enjoyment the spectators would get from watching it. As part of his preparations for the celebrations of his victory, he had a big man-made lake created near Rome. This lake was meant to be surrounded by the people of the city, and there he organized a naval battle. Many warships were brought into the lake, of the typical size used in warfare. These ships had many soldiers on board. Tyrian prisoners were placed on one side and Egyptian prisoners on the other. When everything was prepared, the two groups of ships were instructed to come closer and engage in a real battle, which was meant to entertain the large crowds of spectators that had gathered around. As the nations from which the fighters in this conflict came were enemies, and as the men fought for their lives, the battle was filled with the usual horrors of a desperate naval encounter. Many people were killed. The bodies of the fighters fell from the ships into the lake, and the water turned red with their blood. There were also land battles on a large scale. In one of these battles, there were 500 foot soldiers, 20 elephants, and a troop of 30 horses on each side. This battle had more combatants than the famous Battle of Lexington, which started the American War, and the number of casualties was probably ten times higher. The scenes were so horrifying that even the fierce and merciless populace, who were supposed to be entertained by them, found them to be overwhelming. Caesar, in his eagerness to surpass previous exhibitions and shows, went beyond what would be considered enjoyable and entertaining, watching men being killed in bloody fights and dying in pain and despair. People were shocked. They condemned Caesar's cruelty along with other reproaches and accusations that were suppressed. Cleopatra lived openly with Caesar at his residence during her visit to Rome, and this made a lot of people very displeased. In fact, while people felt sorry for Arsinoe, Cleopatra was not well-liked by the public, despite her beauty, accomplishments, and charms. The public was more focused on the political actions of Caesar and his goals. Many people accused him of wanting to become a king. There were groups supporting and opposing him. Even though people were afraid to say what they really thought, their emotions became stronger as they were forced to keep them hidden. Mark Antony was in Rome at the time. He strongly supported Caesar's cause and encouraged his plan to become king. In fact, he once offered to put a royal crown on Caesar's head during a public event. However, the negative response from the public made him stop. Eventually, Caesar decided to declare himself king. He saw an opportunity in the current state of public affairs, which cannot be explained in detail here, but seemed to be in his favor. Plans were made for the Senate to grant him the royal power. The whispers and unhappiness of the people about the signs that their fears were coming true became louder and louder. And in the end, a plot was made to stop the danger by killing the power-hungry person. Two serious and resolute men, Brutus and Cassius, were the leaders of this plot. 
They finalized their plans, gathered their group of allies, secretly acquired weapons, and when the Senate convened, with Caesar himself presiding, they fearlessly approached him and killed him with their daggers. Antony, who had no idea about the plans of the conspirators, stood there in shock and disbelief while they carried out their act. However, he was completely powerless to help his friend. Cleopatra quickly ran away from the city and went back to Egypt. Arsinoe had left before. Caesar, either feeling sorry for her misfortunes or maybe influenced by public opinion, which seemed to be on her side against him, released her right after his triumph celebrations. However, he didn't permit her to go back to Egypt, perhaps because he was afraid she might somehow disrupt Cleopatra's government. She went to Syria as an exile, no longer a captive. We will find out later what happened to her there. Calpurnia mourned her husband's death sincerely and genuinely. She endured the mistreatment she faced as a wife with patience and without complaint, and loved her husband with unwavering devotion until the end. Nothing is more touching than the signs of her caring and worried concern on the night before the assassination. She noticed some small and unclear signs of danger that her devoted attention to her husband allowed her to see, even though Caesar's other friends missed them. These signs made her feel worried and anxious. And when the bloody body was finally brought home to her from the Senate House, she was filled with sadness and hopelessness. She didn't have any children. So she considered Mark Antony as her closest friend and protector. The next day, when there was chaos and fear in the city, she quickly gathered the money, valuable items, her husband's books, and papers from the house. She sent them to Antony to keep them safe. Cleopatra Chapter 9 The War That Made Mark Antony Fall in Love to Death When the news of Caesar's assassination was first announced to the people of Rome, everyone was shocked and confused. People from all walks of life were unsure how to react. Many in the community were friends of Caesar, while others were strongly opposed to him. It was impossible to tell which side would come out on top. As a result, there was a period of uncertainty and indecision. Mark Antony immediately stepped forward and took on the role of Caesar's representative and the leader of the party on that side. In Caesar's possessions, a testament was discovered. Upon opening it, the document showed that he had allocated considerable amounts of money to the Roman citizens. Additionally, he bequeathed large sums to his nephew, Octavius, who is to be mentioned in more detail later. Antony was appointed as the administrator of the testament. These and other factors seemed to give him the authority to emerge as the head and leader of the Caesar party. Brutus and Cassius, who stayed in the city after their desperate act, were the recognized leaders of the opposing group. Meanwhile, the majority of the people were initially shocked by the enormity and abruptness of the revolution caused by the public assassination of Caesar, a prominent claimant to the role later known as the Roman Emperor by the Roman Senate. They were unsure of how to react or what to say. Indeed, the murder of Julius Caesar was the most notable and shocking assassination in history. It involved highly influential individuals, took place in a public setting, and considering the high status of Caesar, it was an extraordinary event. The entire population of Rome appeared to be surprised and shocked by the news for a few days. Eventually, distinct groups started to form. The divisions between them were slowly established, and people began to align themselves more clearly on either side. For a brief period, Antony's dominance over the Caesar faction was accepted and tolerated. However, he later discovered that he had two strong rivals within his own ranks. These rivals were Octavius and Lepidus. Octavius, as mentioned earlier, was a highly skilled and refined young man, approximately 19 years old. He was the son of Julius Caesar's niece. Footnote. Octavius, after becoming emperor, was given the name Augustus Caesar, 
which is typically used to refer to him in history. However, at the beginning of his career, he was called Octavius, and for the sake of clarity, we will continue to refer to him by this name throughout our story. He was always well-liked by his uncle. His education received great attention, and Caesar had already promoted him to important positions in public life. In fact, Caesar adopted him as his son and named him as his heir. When Caesar died, he was in Apollonia, a city in Illyricum, north of Greece. The soldiers under his command offered to march with him to Rome and seek revenge for his uncle's death. Octavius, after some thought, decided that it would be best for him to go to Rome alone as a private person and claim his rights as his uncle's heir, as stated in the testament. And that's exactly what he did. On his arrival, he discovered that Antony had control over the testament, property, books, and parchments, and the significant power of the government. Instead of giving Octavius his property and rights, Antony made excuses and delayed. He claimed that Octavius was still too young to take on such important responsibilities. He was too busy with public matters to deal with the testament. Antony didn't seem to care about Octavius's claims, using various excuses to justify himself. Octavius, although young, had a strong and determined character. He quickly gained influential allies in Rome and within the Roman Senate. It was uncertain whether Octavius or Antony would have more influence among Caesar's supporters. The battle for this power struggle lasted for two or three years, resulting in a complex web of schemes, conflicts, and civil wars. However, we won't go into the specifics here. Another opponent that Antony had to face was a well-known Roman general named Lepidus. Lepidus was a high-ranking officer in the army when Caesar died. He was in the Senate chamber on the day of the assassination. After the deed was done, he quietly left and went to the army camp outside the city. He quickly took command of the forces, which gave him a lot of power. During the conflicts that followed between Antony and Octavius, he played an important role and held some influence over both of them. Finally, the competition ended when the three rivals formed a famous triumvirate. They realized that none of them could achieve a clear victory over the others, so they decided to join forces. This triumvirate then held the highest authority in the Roman world for some time. The rivals met on an island in one of the branches of the Po River in northern Italy to discuss their reconciliation. During this meeting, they were very cautious and skeptical of each other. Two bridges were constructed to connect the island, one from each side of the river. Antony's army stood on one side, while Octavius's army stood on the other. Lepidus crossed the bridge to reach the island first. After carefully inspecting the area to ensure there were no hidden enemies, he signaled to the other leaders. Each leader approached using their own bridge, accompanied by 300 guards who stayed on the bridge to provide an escape route if needed. The meeting lasted three days, during which all the agreements were discussed and signed. This league was created, and the three allies joined forces against the conspirators. Brutus and Cassius were still leading this conspirator party. The conflicts between Octavius, Antony, and Lepidus mainly took place in Italy and other Central European countries. Brutus and Cassius, however, had traveled to the east after Caesar's assassination. At that time, they were in Asia Minor, actively assembling their forces and forming alliances with Eastern powers. They were also recruiting troops, convincing Roman legions in the area to side with them, seizing supplies, and securing financial support from backers of their cause. Among other messages they sent, one went to Egypt to ask for help from Cleopatra. Cleopatra, however, decided to support the opposing side in the conflict. It was understandable that she would feel thankful to Caesar for his support and sacrifices on her behalf, and that she would be inclined to support his allies. So instead of sending soldiers to help Brutus and Cassius, like they wanted her to do, she quickly prepared a mission to go to the Asian coast to support Antony's cause. Cassius, upon discovering that Cleopatra was determined to join his enemies, decided to go to Egypt 
and take control of the country. He also stationed a military force at Tenaris, the southern promontory of Greece, to wait and stop Cleopatra's fleet as soon as it arrived on the European shores. However, all of these plans, both the ones Cleopatra made against Cassius and the ones Cassius made against her, did not succeed. Cleopatra's ships faced a severe storm, which scattered and destroyed them. Several ships ended up on the African coast, but nothing could be salvaged for the intended purpose. Cassius's planned trip to Egypt did not happen. The imminent dangers from Italy and Rome started to threaten him. At Brutus's request, he abandoned the Egyptian plan, and both generals focused their forces to confront the advancing armies of the Triumvirate. To accomplish this, they crossed the Hellespont from Sestos to Abydos and entered Thrace. After many marches and countermarches, and a series of maneuvers where two strong armies tried to gain an advantageous position against each other, the troops of both powers arrived near Philippi. Brutus and Cassius reached this place first. There was a plain near the city, with a hill in a certain part. Brutus went up to this hill and made a fortification there. Cassius placed his forces about three miles away, close to the sea. There was a line of fortifications between the two camps, which formed a chain of communication connecting the positions of the two commanders. The armies were in a good position. They had the river Strymon and a marsh on their left, and the plain in front of them with the sea behind. They were waiting for their enemies to arrive. Antony, who was currently in Amphipolis, a nearby city to Philippi, found out that Brutus and Cassius had positioned themselves in preparation for an attack. He quickly moved forward and set up camp on the plain. Octavius, who was in the city of Dyrrhachium, not too far away, was unable to join them due to illness. Antony waited for him. After ten days, he finally arrived, but he had to be carried on a litter because he was too sick to travel any other way. Antony set up his camp across from Cassius, near the sea, while Octavius positioned himself across from Brutus. The four armies stopped and thought about what would happen in the upcoming battle. Both sides had almost the same number of troops. However, Brutus and Cassius's side, known as the Republicans, were facing a lot of problems because they didn't have enough food and supplies. There was disagreement between Brutus and Cassius about what they should do. Brutus wanted to fight the enemy, but Cassius was hesitant. He thought it was unwise to risk the entire success of their cause on the outcome of just one battle, given their current situation. A meeting was held to discuss the situation, and the officers were asked to share their opinions. During the meeting, one of the officers suggested delaying the conflict until the next winter. Brutus asked the officer what benefit he expected from such a delay. The officer replied, Even if I gain nothing else, at least I will live longer. This response hurt Cassius's pride and his sense of honor as a military leader. Instead of agreeing with a plan that seemed to prioritize a desire for survival over glory, he decided to change his mind. The council agreed that the army should stay in its position and engage the enemy in battle. Afterward, the officers returned to their own camps. Brutus was very happy about this decision. He had wanted to fight the battle from the beginning, and since his advice had been followed, he was naturally pleased about the opportunity the next day. He organized a lavish dinner in his tent and invited all the officers from his army division to join him. The group enjoyed a night of joyful activities and praised each other in anticipation of the victory they expected to achieve the next day. Brutus entertained his guests with engaging conversations throughout the evening and filled them with his own optimistic expectations of winning the upcoming battle. On the contrary, Cassius, in his camp near the sea, remained quiet and disheartened. He had dinner privately with a few close friends. After finishing the meal, he pulled aside one of his officers and, squeezing his hand, expressed his concerns about the outcome of the conflict. Cassius said, I don't agree with risking the freedom of Rome on just one battle, especially under these circumstances. 
Regardless of the outcome, I want you to remember that I had no choice but to take this action due to circumstances beyond my control. Despite the reasons for my pessimistic thoughts, I should gather strength. Let's remain optimistic and join me for dinner again tomorrow evening. Tomorrow is my birthday. The next morning, the red flag, which was the usual sign in Roman camps on the morning of a battle, was seen flying above the tents of the two commanding generals. They met each other halfway between their camps to discuss and agree on the plans for the day, while the troops prepared for the upcoming battle. After finishing their business and preparing to part ways and go to their respective responsibilities, Cassius asked Brutus what his plan was if they were to lose the battle. Cassius said, we wish for the best, and pray that the gods may give us victory in this very important crisis. But we must remember that the biggest and most important human affairs are always the most uncertain, and we cannot predict what the outcome of the battle will be today. If it goes against us, what do you plan to do? Do you plan to run away or to die? Brutus replied, When I was young, I used to think it was wrong for someone to take their own life, even if they were facing great problems and had no hope. I believe that they should keep living and wait for things to get better. But now, in my current situation, I see things differently. If we don't win the battle today, I will think that there is no more hope or chance of saving our country, and I won't survive the battle. Cassius had previously made the same decision when he was feeling down, and he was happy to hear Brutus express the same thoughts, he shook his colleague's hand with a happy and excited expression on his face. Cassius said goodbye and confidently declared, We will bravely confront the enemy. We believe that we will either defeat them or not be afraid even if they defeat us. Cassius felt down and often had a pessimistic outlook on the prospects of the cause he was involved in. This was partly because he noticed some bad signs. Although these signs were actually unimportant and not worth paying attention to, they had a significant impact on Cassius, despite his overall intelligence and strong character. They were as follows. When offering sacrifices, he had to wear a flower garland, as was customary for such occasions. However, there was a mistake or accident, and the garland was presented upside down by the officer who brought it. In another procession, where a gold image made in his honor was being carried, the bearer stumbled and fell, causing the image to be thrown on the ground. This was a very bad sign of a coming disaster. Then a lot of vultures and other birds that eat dead animals were seen for many days before the battle, flying over the Roman army, and several groups of bees were found within the area of the camp. The officers were so alarmed by this last sign that they changed the position of the entrenchment to keep the unlucky spot away from the camp. These and other similar things had a strong impact on Cassius's mind, making him believe that a big disaster was about to happen to him. Brutus also got warnings, but they didn't affect him as much as Cassius. According to ancient historians, Brutus had a strange vision in Asia Minor before, he camped near the city of Sardis. He didn't sleep much and would often stay alone in his tent after his officers went to bed. He would read or think about his worries. One night, he was alone in his tent with a small lamp. He was deep in thought when he heard a noise as if someone was coming into the tent. He looked up and saw a strange and monstrous figure. It seemed like the figure had just come through the door and was coming towards him, the ghost stared at him and moved nearer, but it didn't speak. Brutus, who wasn't very frightened, bravely inquired about the ghost's identity and purpose. The apparition whispered, I am your evil spirit. I shall meet you at Philippi. Brutus replied, Then it seems that at any rate, I shall see you again. The ghost didn't respond, but disappeared right away. Brutus got up, went to the tent's door, called the guards, and woke up the nearby soldiers. The guards hadn't seen anything, and despite searching thoroughly, they couldn't find any sign of the mysterious visitor. The next day, Brutus told Cassius about what he had seen. Cassius, who was easily affected by omens that concerned him, was more open-minded when it came to omens that affected other people. 
He logically debated with Brutus to persuade him that the vision he had witnessed was simply a product of sleep. Influenced by the circumstances and mental state, Brutus was in due to fatigue and anxiety. But let's go back to the battle. Brutus fought against Octavius, while Cassius, who was a couple of miles away, faced Antony. This was how the armies were positioned on the plain. Brutus was very successful in his part of the battlefield. His troops defeated Octavius's army and took control of his camp. The men entered Octavius's tent and stabbed the litter, thinking that the sick general was inside. However, their target was not there. He had been taken away by his guards just a few minutes earlier, and no one knew where he had gone. However, the outcome of the battle was regrettably different for the individuals whose stories are currently our focus. In Cassius's part of the field, when Brutus finished defeating his own enemies, he returned to his high camp and saw that the tents in Cassius's camp were gone. Some of the officers noticed weapons reflecting and shining in the sunlight where Cassius's tents were supposed to be. Brutus now suspected that Cassius had been defeated and his camp was captured by the enemy. He quickly gathered as many soldiers as he could and marched to help his colleague. He finally found him on top of a small hill, surrounded by a few guards and attendants. Cassius saw a group of horsemen approaching him, sent by Brutus, and thought it was a part of Antony's army coming to capture him. Cassius, though, sent a messenger ahead to meet them and find out if they were friends or enemies. The messenger, named Titinius, rode down. The horsemen recognized Titinius and eagerly gathered around him, dismounting from their horses to congratulate him on being safe and ask him about the outcome of the battle and what happened to his master. Cassius, who was not seeing everything clearly, thought that the group of horsemen were enemies and had captured or killed Titinius. He believed that everything was now lost. So he called his servant named Pindarus and told him to follow him. They went into a nearby tent to carry out a plan Cassius had made earlier. When Brutus and his horsemen arrived, they went into the tent. Inside, they did not find anyone alive, but they did find the lifeless body of Cassius. His head was completely separated from his body. Pindarus was never seen again. Brutus was very sad when his colleague died. He also felt a lot of pressure and responsibility because now he had to handle everything by himself. He faced many difficult situations that became more and more challenging every day. Eventually, he had to fight another battle. The specific details of the battle remain undisclosed. Despite Brutus's exceptional efforts to inspire his soldiers and maintain his stance, his forces ultimately succumbed to the relentless assaults of his adversaries. This led to the definitive and hopeless downfall of his cause. When Brutus realized that he had lost, he let himself be led away from the battlefield by a few guards. As they retreated, they broke through the enemy's lines where they thought they would face less resistance. However, they were chased by a group of horsemen who wanted to capture Brutus. In this emergency, one of Brutus's friends, named Lucilius, came up with a plan to pretend to be Brutus and surrender himself as a prisoner. He successfully executed this plan. When the troop arrived, he asked for mercy, claimed to be Brutus, and pleaded with them to spare his life and take him to Antony. The men complied, thinking they had captured a highly valuable person. Meanwhile, Brutus continued to escape. He crossed a brook and found a small dell that seemed like a good hiding spot. It had steep rocks and trees for shade. A few friends and officers went with Brutus on his flight. Nightfall arrived, and he rested in a small space beneath a slanting rock, completely worn out from exhaustion and pain. Then, gazing up at the sky, he uttered a curse, reciting verses from a Greek poet calling for God's righteous judgment upon the enemies who were currently celebrating what he believed to be the destruction of his homeland. He then, in his sadness and hopelessness, listed the names of the friends and companions he had seen die that day in battle, 
mourning the loss of each one with intense sadness. Meanwhile, night was approaching, and the group, hidden in the remote valley, had no shelter or protection. They were hungry, thirsty, and exhausted, with no hope of finding rest or food. Finally, one of them went back quietly to the stream they had crossed earlier to fetch some water. The soldier used his helmet as a container. While Brutus was drinking the water, they heard a noise from the other side. Two of the officers went to find out why. They returned quickly, saying that there was a group of enemies in that area. They asked about the water that had been brought. Brutus said that it had all been drunk, but he would get more right away. The messenger went back to the brook, but returned quickly, injured and bleeding. He reported that the enemy was approaching from that side as well, and that he had barely managed to escape with his life. Brutus's party became even more worried upon hearing this news. It was clear that their chances of staying hidden for much longer would soon vanish. One of the officers, named Statilius, then suggested trying to find a way out of the trap they were in. He would go cautiously, avoiding the enemy and using the cover of darkness to retreat. If he succeeded, he would light a torch on a hill in the distance that he pointed out, so the party in the glen would know he was safe. He would then come back and lead them all through the danger, using the path he had found. This plan was agreed upon, and Statilius left accordingly. After some time, they saw a light burning at the place that had been mentioned, showing that Statilius had completed his task. Brutus and his group were very happy because of the new hope that this outcome brought. They started to look and listen for their messenger to come back. They looked and waited for a long time, but he didn't come. On his way back, he was stopped and killed. When everyone gave up hope that he would come back, some of the group, during their desperate discussions, said that they should not stay there any longer, but needed to escape from that place no matter what. Brutus said, Yes, we must indeed make our escape from our present situation, but we must do it with our hands and not with our feet. He meant that the only way for them to escape their enemies was to kill themselves. When his friends realized this, and that he planned to do the same, they were very sad. Brutus said goodbye to each person individually, expressing gratitude for their loyalty until the end. He found comfort and satisfaction in knowing that all of his friends had remained loyal and trustworthy. Brutus said, I don't complain about my difficult situation when it comes to me personally. I only grieve for my unhappy country. As for me, I believe that my current condition is still better than that of my enemies, because even though I die, future generations will recognize my righteousness, and I will forever be honored as I deserve. Meanwhile, they, even though they live, will only suffer the consequences of injustice and tyranny. After I'm gone, don't think about me anymore, but take care of yourselves. I'm sure Antony will be okay with Cassius's and my death. He won't want to go after you with revenge anymore. Make peace with him in the best way you can. Brutus then asked some of his friends to help him end his life. However, each one refused to assist in such a terrible decision. Finally, he brought along his old and trusted friend Strato, and they moved a bit away from the others. Here, he once again asked for a favor that had been denied to him earlier— he asked Strato to hold out his sword. But Strato still declined. Brutus then summoned one of his slaves. Upon hearing this, Strato stated that he would prefer to do anything other than see Brutus killed by a slave. He took the sword and held it up in the air with his right hand while using his left hand to cover his eyes so that he would not have to witness the gruesome scene. Brutus rushed upon the weapon with such fatal force that he fell and immediately died. This marked the end of the Battle of Philippi, a famous conflict in history. It settled the dispute between Caesar's friends and enemies, which had a significant impact on the world after his death. The battle solidified Antony's power and made him the center of attention, just as Cleopatra was the most notable woman at the time. 
Cleopatra, Chapter 10 Mark Antony, Trying to Deal with the World's Most Impressive Woman The extent to which Cleopatra's choice to back Antony over Brutus and Cassius in the Civil War was driven by her gratitude towards Caesar remains uncertain. Similarly, it's unclear how much her interest in Antony swayed her decision. Ultimately, it's up to the reader to interpret these influences. Cleopatra had met Antony several years earlier during his visit to Egypt when she was a young girl. She was surely familiar with his character, which had qualities that could enchant a woman as passionate, impulsive, and daring as Cleopatra was becoming. Antony had become widely known and fascinated people all over the world with his unconventional behavior and reckless actions. His life had been filled with extraordinary ups and downs. In terms of his morals, he was completely corrupt and immoral. In his early life, as mentioned before, he engaged in a lifestyle of excess and wastefulness that led to his complete and irreversible ruin. However, due to his charismatic charm, a trait often found in such individuals, he managed to gain significant influence over a wealthy young man named Curio. Curio temporarily supported him by acting as his guarantor for his debts. This resource, however, quickly failed, and Antony was forced to leave Rome and live as a fugitive and exile for several years in a life of immorality and poverty. Throughout all the changes that occurred during his career, he continued to spend extravagantly whenever he had money. This aspect of his character was sometimes seen as a noble generosity. During his military campaigns, he would often share the plunder he acquired with his soldiers, keeping nothing for himself. This made his soldiers deeply loyal to him, and they considered his lavishness as a virtue, even if they didn't personally benefit from it. There were always countless stories circulating in the camp about his careless attitude towards money, some funny and others peculiar and bizarre. In his habits, he was very different from other men. He was proud of being descended from Hercules and tried to imitate the savage character of his supposed ancestor in his style of dress and overall demeanor. He had sharp features, an arched and prominent nose, and he grew his hair and beard as long as possible. These unique qualities gave his face a wild and fierce expression. He also chose a fashion style that, when compared to the trends of the time, made him look rough, savage, and reckless. His behavior matched his appearance. He had a close and informal relationship with his soldiers. He spent time with them, ate and drank with them outside, and joined in their loud laughter and rowdy joy. His strong intelligence and fearless bravery allowed him to do all of this safely. These qualities made the soldiers have a lot of respect for their commander. Despite being very familiar with his subordinates, he was able to maintain this respect. This would have been a problem for a normal person, but not for him. During the peak of Antony's career, specifically before Caesar's death, he engaged in openly and shamelessly indulging in vices. He surrounded himself with entertainers, performers, and other disreputable individuals of the lowest class. Many of these companions were singing and dancing girls who were beautiful and highly skilled in their professions. However, they were also corrupt and immoral. Even though the people were pagans at that time, it is incorrect to assume that only Christianity can create a moral sentiment in the community against such vices. There is a natural law, a strong instinct that all people have, which says that men and women should be together as husbands and wives and not with anyone else. There may have never been a community as corrupt as one where a man like Antony could engage in such vices. Not only did he go against his moral compass, but he also faced condemnation from others. Still, the world tends to be very tolerant when it comes to the flaws of the powerful. People like Antony, who hold high positions, are often judged by different standards compared to ordinary individuals. Even in countries where leaders are chosen through the voices of the people, the investigation into a candidate's character is often silenced and considered irrelevant and improper. 
those who succeed in gaining power are granted privileges and protections that regular people are denied. However, despite Antony's status and influence protecting him from public criticism, he took his indulgences to such an extreme that his behavior was strongly and widely condemned. He would party all night, and then, the next day, show up in public looking drunk. Sometimes he would go to work meetings so intoxicated that his friends had to help him leave. During some of his trips near Rome, he would bring along a group of really bad people and travel with them without any shame. On one of these trips, he had an actress named Scytheride as his companion. She journeyed on an opulent bed, borne aloft by bearers, while he accompanied her with an extensive array of elegant dishes and cutlery. Together, they enjoyed lavish parties and feasts with an abundance of delicious food and wine throughout their travels. Sometimes, he would stop by the roadside, set up his tents, start cooking in his kitchens, and prepare a grand feast. He would lay out lavish tables and create a luxurious banquet, complete with all the finest and most elaborate elements. All of this was done to impress others with the abundance and perfection of the luxuries he could bring with him wherever he traveled. Actually, he always seemed to enjoy doing unusual and remarkable things to amaze people. Once, during a trip, he had lions pulling his carts to carry his belongings, just to create a sensation. Despite Antony's reckless indulgence in luxurious pleasures while in Rome, he displayed remarkable endurance and resilience in the face of exposure and hardship in camp or on the field. In fact, he approached difficulties and dangers abroad with the same impulsive haste as he did with expenses and extravagance at home. During his battles with Octavius and Lepidus, after Caesar's death, he once had to cross the Alps. He tried to do this without enough supplies or transportation, he and his troops suffered greatly during the journey and were very hungry and distressed. They had to eat roots, herbs, and even tree bark to survive. This barely kept them from starving. Antony, however, didn't seem to care about any of this. He continued on, facing the challenges and risks with the same fearless and unwavering attitude until the end— during the same military campaign, there was a time when he had very few soldiers left and was in a very desperate situation. He came up with the amazing idea of going alone to Lepidus' camp and convincing his rival's soldiers to leave right in front of their commander. This daring plan was executed successfully. Antony approached alone, wearing shabby clothes, with his tangled hair and beard hanging down on his chest and shoulders, and made his way to Lepidus's position. The men who knew him well greeted him enthusiastically. They felt sorry for his sad state and started to listen to what he had to say. Lepidus, who couldn't attack him because he and Antony were not openly hostile to each other at that time, but were just rival commanders in the same army, ordered the trumpeters to make noise to drown out Antony's words. This interrupted the negotiation. However, the men quickly dressed two of them in women's clothes and sent them to Antony. They wanted to make arrangements with him to join his side. They also offered to kill Lepidus if Antony agreed. Antony told them not to harm Lepidus. However, he went to the camp and took control of it, becoming the army's leader. He treated Lepidus with great respect and kept him as a subordinate under his command. Shortly after Caesar's death, Antony got married. The lady's name was Fulvia. She was a widow when she married Antony and had a strong and determined personality. Before their marriage, she had lived a wild and unpredictable life. However, she developed a deep affection for her new husband and remained loyal to him throughout their marriage. She quickly gained a strong influence over him and was able to bring about significant changes in his behavior and personality. She was ambitious and worked hard to help her husband rise to a higher position and achieve more success. She seemed to enjoy having a lot of control over him, and she was successful at it, which surprised everyone. It was hard to believe that someone as fierce as him could be tamed by anyone. 
But it wasn't through being gentle or kind that Fulvia gained power over her husband. She had a strong and manly character, and it appears that she gained control over Antony by outdoing him in his tactics. Once, for example, after returning from a dangerous campaign, he disguised himself as a courier and sneaked into Fulvia's rooms at night. He handed her some fake letters, pretending they were from her husband. While Fulvia was opening the letters with excitement and nervousness, he revealed his true identity by embracing and kissing her, surprising her greatly. Antony's marriage with Fulvia not only helped improve his morals to some extent, but also had a positive effect on his manners. His clothing and overall appearance transformed. In fact, his political status significantly rose after Caesar's death, and the tactics he had previously employed to attain this position were gradually abandoned, as they were no longer needed. While residing in Rome, he embraced a grand and luxurious lifestyle. As he ventured out on military campaigns, he began to adopt the same lavish displays and ceremonial preparations that were customary in the encampments of other Roman generals. After the Battle of Philippi, Antony, despite his faults and occasional generosity, swiftly traveled to the site upon learning of Brutus's death. He seemed genuinely disturbed and worried when he saw the body. Antony removed his military cloak, which was a very fancy and expensive garment adorned with costly ornaments, and placed it over the dead body. He then instructed one of his household officers to organize a grand funeral ceremony as a sign of respect for the deceased. As part of these ceremonies, the officer was supposed to burn the military cloak that Antony had used as a pall along with the body. However, he didn't do it. The cloak was valuable, so he kept it. He also kept some of the money that was given to him for the funeral expenses. He thought that Antony wouldn't ask too many questions about the funeral arrangements for his enemy. However, Antony did ask about them, and when he found out what the officer had done, he ordered the officer to be killed. The different political changes and movements among the armies after the Battle of Philippi will not be discussed here. It is enough to mention that Antony went eastward through Asia Minor and, in the next year, arrived in Cilicia. From there, he sent a message to Cleopatra in Egypt, asking her to come and meet him. There were accusations against her, he said, of helping Cassius and Brutus in the recent war instead of supporting him. It is not clear whether these accusations were true or if Antony made them up as an excuse to see Cleopatra, whose beauty was widely known. Regardless, he sent a message to summon the queen. The messenger Antony sent for this task was Delius. Fulvia, Antony's wife, was not with him at that time. She had been left in Rome. Delius went to Egypt and visited Cleopatra's court. At that time, Cleopatra was around 28 years old and was said to be more beautiful than ever before. Delius was deeply impressed by her beauty and found her voice and conversation to be captivating. Her ancient biographers often mention her voice and conversation as one of her most irresistible charms. He assured her that she didn't need to worry about Antony. It was of no consequence, he said, what charges there might be against her. She would soon discover that just a few days after meeting Antony, she would be highly favored. In fact, he said, she could count on quickly gaining complete control over the general. He told her to go to Cilicia without worry and to approach Antony with as much grandeur and splendor as she could. He assured her that he would take responsibility for the outcome. Cleopatra decided to follow this suggestion. Her passionate and spontaneous imagination was excited about the prospect of conquering the world's greatest general and most powerful ruler once again. She quickly started preparing for the voyage. She used all the resources of her kingdom to get the most impressive things to show off, like fancy dresses, expensive silverware, jewelry made of precious stones and gold, and many expensive gifts for Antony. She also chose a large group of attendants to go with her and made all the necessary arrangements for a grand and impressive expedition. While she was getting ready, she kept receiving messages from Antony, 
telling her to leave as soon as possible, but she didn't pay much attention to them. It was clear that she felt independent and planned to take her time. Finally, everything was prepared, and Cleopatra started her journey. She sailed across the Mediterranean Sea and reached the mouth of the River Sidnus. Antony was in Tarsus, a city near the mouth of the Sidnus. As Cleopatra's fleet entered the river, she boarded a grand barge that she had specially built for this occasion and brought with her from across the sea. This boat was the most beautiful and fancy ship ever made. It had carvings and decorations that were expertly crafted and covered in gold. The sails were purple, and the oars had silver details. Queen Cleopatra appeared on the deck of this boat, under a canopy made of golden fabric. She was wearing a beautiful costume that looked like the ones Venus, the goddess of beauty, usually wore. She had a group of lovely boys around her, who were dressed like cupids and were fanning her with their wings. There were also some young girls with her, who were dressed as nymphs and graces. There was a group of musicians on the deck. Their music guided the rowers as they synchronized their rowing to the melody. Despite its softness, the music could be heard far and wide over the water and along the shores as the beautiful vessel continued its journey. The musicians played flutes, lyres, violins, and other instruments commonly used during that era to create gentle and pleasing music. Indeed, the entire show appeared like a magical sight. News of the arrival of the boat quickly spread, and the locals flocked to the riverbanks to marvel at it as it moved gracefully. When Antony arrived at Tarsus, he was busy with a public audience at his palace. However, everyone rushed to see Cleopatra and her barge, leaving Antony alone or with just a few officials. Cleopatra landed in the city and started setting up her tents on the shores. Antony dispatched a messenger to invite Cleopatra to dine with him. However, she politely declined and counter-offered, suggesting it would be more suitable for him to come and have dinner with her. She mentioned that she would be expecting him and that her tents would be prepared at the designated time. He was welcomed with great grandeur and splendor that left him astonished. The tents and pavilions where the event took place were adorned with a vast number of lamps. These lamps were arranged in a clever and exquisite way, creating a remarkably bright and beautiful illumination. The tables were laden with a vast array of meats and wines, along with gold and silver vessels, creating a lavish display. Additionally, the beautiful and elaborate dresses worn by Cleopatra and her attendants added to the enchanting atmosphere of the entire scene. The next day, Antony invited Cleopatra to come and return his visit. Antony agreed to her suggestion and attended her event. However, despite his best efforts to provide a banquet that was as lavish and well-served as hers, he completely failed and admitted that she had completely outdone him. During these meetings, Antony was completely captivated by Cleopatra's beauty, wit, and numerous talents. Above all, he was impressed by her tact, cleverness, and confidence in asserting her social superiority over him, which she did boldly and skillfully. As a result, Antony quickly surrendered his heart to her unquestioned influence. The first thing Cleopatra did when she gained power was to ask Antony to kill her sister Arsinoe. Arsinoe had gone to Rome for Caesar's triumph and then moved to Asia as an exile. Cleopatra wanted her sister dead, either out of revenge or because she feared future danger. Antony agreed and sent an officer to find and kill Arsinoe. The officer found her in a temple and killed her, even though she thought it was a safe place. Cleopatra stayed in Tarsus for a while, enjoying a lot of fun and pleasure and being very close with Antony. They would spend entire days and nights together feasting and partying. Cleopatra's extravagant parties, especially, were known all over the world for their incredible grandeur. She particularly enjoyed surprising Antony with her wealth and the limitless extravagance she indulged in. At one of her banquets, 
Antony was expressing his astonishment at the vast number of gold cups, enriched with jewels, that were displayed on all sides. Cleopatra said, Oh, they are nothing. If you like them, you shall have them all. So saying, she ordered her servants to carry them to Antony's house. The next day she invited Antony again, with a large number of the chief officers of his army and court. The table had a new set of fancy gold and silver dishes, even bigger and more impressive than the day before. When the dinner was over and everyone was about to leave, Cleopatra gave away all these valuable items to the guests who were at the party. At another feast, she showed off by taking a very valuable pearl from one of her earrings and dissolving it in a cup of vinegar. She then drank the mixture, which was common at that time. She was about to do the same with the other pearl, but some people stopped her and took it away. Footnote. Pearls, being of the nature of shell in their composition and structure, are soluble in certain acids. Meanwhile, Antony was enjoying a life of luxury and pleasure with Cleopatra, neglecting his public responsibilities and causing chaos to ensue. Fulvia stayed in Italy and used her influential position and character to support her husband's cause in that region, working energetically. She faced many problems and risks, but I can't provide the specific details here. She constantly wrote to Antony, begging him to come to Rome and expressing her anxiety and distress in her letters, which is understandable considering the situation she was in. She was profoundly distressed by the thought that her husband had been utterly drawn away due to the manipulative deeds of another woman. The fact that he abandoned his wife and family to address significant issues at home only intensified her feelings of being overwhelmed. Antony was eventually persuaded by the urgency of the situation to go back. He left his accommodations in Tarsus and headed south to Tyre, a major naval port and station at the time. Cleopatra went with him. They were supposed to part ways at Tyre, with her boarding a ship to Egypt and him going to Rome. However, Antony had one plan while Cleopatra had another. She decided that Antony should accompany her to Alexandria. As expected, when the time came to make a decision, the woman won. Her compliments, tricks, affection, and tears were successful. After a short internal conflict between love on one side and a combination of ambition and duty on the other, Antony gave up the fight. Giving up everything else, he completely surrendered to Cleopatra's control and went to Alexandria with her. They spent the winter there, indulging in every form of sensual pleasure that their limitless wealth allowed, without any remorse or restraint. There appeared to be no limits to Antony's excessive and obsessive behavior during the winter in Alexandria. Cleopatra devoted herself to him around the clock, filling every moment with diverse entertainment to keep him preoccupied. Her goal was to keep him busy and prevent him from thinking about his distant wife or feeling guilty about his actions. Antony willingly fell into these traps and enthusiastically participated in Cleopatra's numerous schemes for amusement and festivities. Both individuals maintained their costly residences within the city. They had an arrangement whereby they alternated hosting duties, with each one taking their turn every other day. During these visits, they would play games, participate in sports, watch spectacles, eat, drink, and engage in all sorts of wild and excessive behavior. An interesting example is given of how information about daily life and events in ancient times can be accidentally discovered. This happened at Antony's court during the winter, when a young medical student named Philotas from Alexandria became friends with one of Antony's cooks. Under the guidance of this cook, Philotas went one day into the palace to see what was happening. The cook took his friend into the kitchens, where, to Philotus's surprise, he saw eight wild boars roasting before the fires, some more cooked than others. Philotus asked who was going to eat all that food that day. The cook smiled and said that there wouldn't be any guests, just Antony's usual group. The cook said in explanation, However, we always have to prepare multiple suppers and have them ready at different times. 
This is because we never know when they will request the meal to be served. Sometimes, when the supper is already brought in, Antony and Cleopatra get involved in some new activity and decide not to sit at the table at that moment. As a result, we have to remove the supper and bring in another one shortly after. Antony had a son with him in Alexandria. The son's name was also Antony, just like his father. He was old enough to feel ashamed of his father for not doing his duty and to respect his mother's rights and honor. However, instead of doing that, he followed his father's example and was just as careless and extravagant. The same Philotas mentioned earlier was eventually given a position in the household of the young Antony. This meant that he would sit at Antony's table and join in his social gatherings. Philotas tells a story of a time when they were having a feast and there was a guest, a physician, who was extremely arrogant and liked to talk a lot, leaving no chance for anyone else to speak. The pleasure of conversation was ruined by his excessive talking. However, Philotas eventually confused him with a logical question, similar to those discussed in ancient times, which made him silent for a while. Young Antony was so thrilled with this accomplishment that he gave Philotas all the gold and silver dishes on the table and sent them to his home after the event. He instructed Philotas to put his mark and stamp on them and lock them up. The question that Philotas asked the arrogant doctor was this. However, it should be noted that back then, it was believed that using cold water with a fever was very dangerous, except in certain cases where it had a positive effect. Philotas then argued as follows. In certain cases, it is best to give water to a patient with a fever. All cases of fever are cases of a certain kind. Therefore, it is best to give the patient water in all cases. After Philotas presented his argument, he asked the physician to find any flaws in it. The physician struggled to understand and explain the complicated argument, giving everyone a break from his long-windedness. Philotas mentions that he returned the gold and silver plate to young Antony because he was afraid to keep them. Antony agreed that it was a good idea since some of the vessels were valuable due to their rare and ancient craftsmanship, and his father might notice their absence and want to know where they went. As there were no limits, on one hand, to the greatness and magnificence of the pleasures that Antony and Cleopatra enjoyed, there were also no limits to the negative and degrading behaviors that defined them. Occasionally, well past midnight, after hours of revelry and partying in the palace, Antony would disguise himself as a servant. Fueled by alcohol, he would then venture into the streets in search of thrilling adventures. In many cases, Cleopatra herself would go out with Antony, disguised similarly. During these outings, Antony would often get involved in trouble and risky situations. He participated in street riots and drunken fights, all to amuse Cleopatra and himself. Stories of these adventures would spread among the people afterward. Some people would admire the friendly and cheerful nature of their strange visitor, while others would look down on him for behaving like an animal. Antony and Cleopatra enjoyed innocent amusements and pleasures. They went on excursions on the Nile and organized parties on the water in the harbor and in rural areas near the city. Once they went out on a fishing party, in boats, in the port, Antony's fishing attempts were unsuccessful, and he was embarrassed by the prospect of Cleopatra witnessing his misfortune. To avoid this, he covertly arranged with some fishermen to dive underwater, unseen, and attach fish to his hook. With this plan, he caught very big and nice fish very quickly. Cleopatra, however, was too cautious to be easily fooled by such a trick as this. She watched the maneuver but acted like she didn't notice it. Instead, she showed a lot of surprise and happiness at Antony's good luck and impressive skill. The following day, she wanted to go fishing again, so another group was formed, just like the previous day. However, she secretly told another fisherman to buy a dried and salted fish from the market. Then, when the chance came, he went underwater beneath the boats and attached it to the hook, beating Antony's divers to it. The plan worked well, 
and in front of a happy crowd, Antony proudly caught a big fish. However, it quickly became clear to everyone that the fish was already preserved and dried, a type of fish commonly bought from the market, exposing the trick. It was a type of fish that originally came from Asia Minor. The boats in the water all around them were filled with laughter and joy because of this happening. While Antony was preoccupied with disreputable activities and indulging in guilty pleasures in Alexandria, his wife Fulvia was growing increasingly desperate back home. Having exhausted all other options to persuade him to return, she resorted to starting a war, hoping the conflict would compel him to come back. Fulvia had a lot of energy, influence, and talent. She gathered an army, set up a camp, led the troops, and sent Antony news about the dangers that could harm his cause, which scared him a lot. Meanwhile, there were reports of major disasters in Asia Minor and uprisings in the provinces that Antony was responsible for. Antony realized that he needed to snap out of his infatuation with Cleopatra and distance himself from her, or else he would face complete and irreversible ruin. He tried very hard to escape. He said goodbye to the queen, quickly got on a fleet of ships, and sailed to Tyre. This left Cleopatra in her palace, feeling upset, let down, and annoyed. Cleopatra, Chapter 11 The Goddess Who Designed Rome, The Son of Egypt After parting with Antony, as described in the previous chapter, Cleopatra lost him for a period of two or three years. Antony himself faced numerous challenges and risks during this time, and experienced many significant events, which cannot be described in detail here. His life during this period was characterized by constant change and excitement, likely marked by feelings of regret for the past and concerns for the future. Upon arriving in Tyre, he faced a difficult decision on whether to go to Asia Minor or Rome. Both places urgently required his presence. The war instigated by Fulvia was fueled, in part, by the rivalry between Octavius and Antony, and the clash of their interests with her husbands. Antony was furious with her for mishandling his affairs and causing a war. Eventually, Antony and Fulvia reunited in Athens. Fulvia had gone to that city and was very sick there, either from illness or from being constantly worried, frustrated, and distressed. They had a heated meeting. Neither side was willing to show any kindness to the other. Antony left his wife abruptly and harshly, after blaming her for everything. Shortly after, she died, causing Antony to benefit. Her death led to a reconciliation between Antony and Octavius. Fulvia had been actively opposing Octavius and organizing plans against him. As a result, Octavius held a grudge against her and Antony. Now that she was dead, it seemed possible for a reconciliation to take place. Octavius had a sister named Octavia, who had been married to a Roman general named Marcellus. Octavia was a beautiful and accomplished woman, with a very different personality compared to Fulvia. She was gentle, affectionate, and kind, preferring peace and harmony instead of asserting influence through forceful and aggressive behavior. Octavia's husband passed away around this time. During the discussions and interactions between Antony and Octavius, they came up with the idea of Antony marrying Octavia. This marriage was seen as a way to solidify and strengthen the reconciliation. Eventually, everyone agreed to this proposal. Antony was pleased to find such a simple solution to his problems. The Romans and the authorities in Rome also wanted this arrangement to happen because they knew that world peace depended on how these two men treated each other. However, there was a law in Rome that prevented widows from getting married again for a certain period of time after their husband's death. That time had not, for Octavia, yet ended. The determination to make this union happen was so intense that the law was specifically altered to accommodate their situation. Consequently, Antony and Octavia were able to proceed with their marriage without delay. The empire was divided between Octavius and Antony, with Octavius receiving the western part and Antony getting the eastern part. 
Antony probably didn't have strong feelings of love for his new wife, despite her beauty and kindness. A man who had lived the kind of life he had might have found it difficult to form strong and pure attachments at this point. However, he was pleased with the newness of his marriage and seemed to temporarily forget about Cleopatra's absence. He stayed with Octavia for a year. Then, he left for certain military missions that kept him away from her for a while. He came back, but then left again. Throughout this time, Octavia had a positive and beneficial influence on both him and Octavius. She played a crucial role in soothing their disputes and alleviating their doubts and insecurities. Her efforts were very successful. She managed to bring them together and resolve their differences just before they were about to go to war. Octavia's actions were courageous and determined, yet also gentle and humble. During this dangerous time, she was in Greece with her husband. She convinced him to let her go to her brother in Rome. She believed she could resolve the upcoming problems. Antony agreed and allowed her to go. She went to Rome and met her brother in front of his two top officials. There, she begged for her husband, crying. She defended his actions, explained things that seemed bad, and asked her brother not to do anything that would make her go from being very happy to being very sad. Octavia said, Consider my situation. Everyone is watching me. I am married to one of the most powerful men in the world and the sister of another. If you let reckless actions lead to war, I will be completely destroyed. Whether my husband or my brother is defeated, my happiness will be lost forever. Octavius truly loved his sister, and he was influenced by her requests to the point that he agreed to meet Antony to see if they could resolve their issues. This meeting occurred at a river where both generals got into separate boats and rowed towards each other until they met in the middle of the stream. A meeting took place where all the unresolved questions were successfully resolved, at least temporarily. However, after a while, Antony grew weary of his wife and longed for Cleopatra once again. He left Octavia in Rome and traveled eastward, claiming to attend to the empire's affairs in that region. Instead, he went to Alexandria and resumed his previously close relationship with the Egyptian queen. Octavius was very angry about this. The anger he used to feel towards Antony, which Octavia had previously helped to reduce, now came back stronger. The resurgence happened because he was very upset about how his sister was treated. The public opinion in Rome was also strongly turning against Antony. Lampoons were written to mock him and Cleopatra, and people strongly criticized his behavior. Octavia was loved by everyone, and the sympathy for her intensified the public anger toward the man who could betray someone so kind, gentle, and faithful as her. After spending some time in Alexandria and reconnecting with Cleopatra, Antony left again and crossed the sea into Asia. He had important military tasks to attend to there. His goal was to complete these tasks and return to Egypt as soon as possible. He discovered, however, that he couldn't stand being away from Cleopatra, even for a short time. He thought about her constantly and missed the enjoyable moments they had in Egypt. He desperately wanted to see her again, which made it impossible for him to focus on his responsibilities in the camp. As a result, he became fearful, ineffective, and negligent, and almost everything he attempted ended in failure. The soldiers knew why their commander was neglecting them, and they were very angry about it. Their unhappiness spread throughout the camp, with lots of quiet grumbling and many complaints. Antony, however, like others in his position, was unaware of all these signs of discontent. He probably would have ignored them, even if he had noticed them. Overwhelmed by his longing for his lover, he resolved to make the journey across the country, despite it being winter. He set out for the coast, where he had arranged to meet Cleopatra. The army faced very difficult conditions during this journey. Once Antony started the journey, he was so eager to move forward that he forced his troops to march faster than they were capable of. They also did not have suitable tents or enough food supplies. As a result, 
After a tiring day of marching, they often had to sleep outdoors in the mountains, with limited ways to satisfy their hunger and little protection from the cold rain or snowstorms. During this march, 8,000 men died from cold, fatigue, and exposure. This may have been a greater sacrifice than ever before due to the lovers' intense passion and impatience. Upon reaching the shore, Antony proceeded to a seaport near Sidon, where Cleopatra was scheduled to arrive. Unfortunately, only a small portion of his army remained, and those who survived were in a pitiful state of destitution. As the anticipated time of Cleopatra's arrival approached, Antony's eagerness to see her grew more intense. However, she did not arrive as quickly as he had hoped, and during the delay, he appeared to be consumed by a mixture of love and sorrow. He became quiet, lost in thought, and filled with sadness. He only thought about Cleopatra's arrival and had no interest in any other plans. He constantly watched for her and would occasionally leave the table during supper to go to the shore alone. There, he would stand and look out at the sea, sadly saying to himself, Why isn't she coming? The army strongly disliked and mocked him for his obsession with Cleopatra, but he ignored their feelings and remained focused on her arrival. Finally, she came, bringing a large supply of clothes and other necessary items for Antony's army. This not only pleased him, but also provided important support for his military challenges. After spending some time enjoying being back with Cleopatra, Antony started to think about the matters of his government, which were increasingly demanding his attention. He started receiving urgent requests from different places, urging him to take action. During her time in Rome, Octavia became more and more worried because she kept getting concerning updates about her husband's situation and his obsession with Cleopatra. In a final attempt to fix things, she was determined to bring him back. She asked her brother to let her raise soldiers and gather resources. Then, she planned to go east to support him. Octavius agreed to her request and even helped Octavia get ready. However, it is said that he was influenced by his strong belief that his sister's attempt to reclaim her husband would fail. He thought that Antony would be seen as completely in the wrong by the Roman people, and this would lead to his ultimate downfall. Octavia was happy to get her brother's help for her project, whatever the reason was for him to give it. She gathered a big group of soldiers, raised a lot of money, and got clothes, tents, and supplies for the army. When everything was prepared, she left Italy and went on a ship, after sending a message to her husband that she was coming. Cleopatra started to worry that she might lose Antony again. To keep her power over him, she used her usual tricks. She didn't say anything, but acted like someone who was suffering or sad because of a secret. She managed to frequently be caught crying. In those situations, she would quickly wipe away her tears and put on a smiling face, pretending to be happy even though she was burdened with anxiety and sadness. When Antony was around, she would appear extremely happy to see him and look at him with a deeply affectionate expression. When she was away from him, she spent her time alone. She was always silent, sad, and cried frequently. She made sure that Antony knew about her hidden sorrows and sufferings, she wanted him to understand that all of this was because of her love for him and her fear that he might leave her. The friends and secret agents of Cleopatra, who informed Antony about these things, also directly appealed to him to favor her. They boldly argued that Cleopatra's love for Antony was more important than Octavia's. According to them, Octavia had only been his wife for a brief period, whereas Cleopatra had been deeply devoted to him for many years. Octavia married him, they claimed, not out of love, but for political reasons to please her brother and solidify a political alliance with him. On the other hand, Cleopatra completely and unconditionally surrendered herself to him, driven solely by a personal affection that she could not resist. She had given up everything for him. She lost her reputation and her subjects' love and became criticized by everyone. Now, she left her home country to join him in his difficult situation. 
given all that she had done, endured, and given up for him, it would be extremely cruel and unjustifiable for him to abandon her now. She would never be able to cope with such a desertion. Her entire being was so deeply connected to him that she would waste away and perish if he were to leave her at this moment. Antony was very troubled and upset by the complications he found himself in. It was his duty, and maybe even his desire, and definitely his ambition, and every sensible and strategic decision told him that he should leave these traps immediately and go meet Octavia. But the stronghold that kept him was too powerful to be broken. He succumbed to Cleopatra's sadness and tears. He sent a message to Octavia, who was in Athens, Greece, telling her not to come any closer. Octavia, who didn't show any anger towards her husband, asked what she should do with the soldiers, money, and supplies she was bringing. Antony told her to leave them in Greece. Octavia did as she was told and sadly went back home. Upon reaching Rome, Octavius, her brother, who was deeply angered by Antony's despicable behavior, immediately contacted his sister and urged her to leave Antony's residence and join him. Octavia stated that it was essential for her to uphold her self-esteem and not continue to reside under the same roof as such a man. Octavia said she would not leave her husband's house. That house was her duty, no matter what her husband did, and she would stay there. So she went back to her old home and took care of the family and children with patience and sorrowful dedication. One of these children was Antony's son from his previous marriage with Fulvia. Meanwhile, Octavia dutifully and sadly fulfilled her roles as a wife and mother in her husband's house in Rome. On the other hand, Antony accompanied Cleopatra to Alexandria and once again indulged in a life of sinful pleasure. The amazing mindset that this wonderful and dedicated wife showed impressed everyone. However, it had another effect that Octavia probably didn't like. It made people feel angry at the unworthy person who received this extraordinary kindness. In the meantime, Antony completely surrendered to Cleopatra's influence and control. He handled all the affairs of the Roman Empire in the East in a way that best served Cleopatra's ambitions and reputation. He selected Alexandria as his capital and held lavish triumphal celebrations there. Alongside Cleopatra and her entourage, he orchestrated ostentatious expeditions into Asia and Syria. Generously, he bestowed entire provinces upon her as gifts and elevated her two sons, Alexander and Ptolemy, born early in their relationship, to prominent roles, recognizing them as his own. The actions taken in Rome had severe consequences for Antony's reputation. Octavius informed the Roman Senate and people about everything that had happened, using Antony's mismanagement and misconduct as the basis for serious accusations against him. Upon learning of these developments, Antony sent his representatives to Rome to make accusations against Octavius. However, these counter-accusations did not have any effect. Public opinion turned against him in the capital, and Octavius started getting ready for war. Antony realized that he needed to prepare for self-defense. Cleopatra enthusiastically joined his plans for this purpose. Antony began recruiting soldiers, gathering and outfitting warships and galleys, and demanding money and military supplies from the eastern provinces and kingdoms. Cleopatra gave him access to all of Egypt's resources. She provided him with large amounts of money and an unlimited supply of corn, which she obtained from her territories in the Nile Valley. The different parts of the huge army that was assembled were told to meet at Ephesus, where Antony and Cleopatra were waiting to receive them. They had gone there after finishing their preparations in Egypt and were ready to start the campaign. When everything was prepared for the journey to depart from Ephesus, Antony believed it would be wise for Cleopatra to go back to Egypt and for him to face Octavius alone with the fleet. However, Cleopatra was adamant about not leaving. She couldn't risk leaving Antony by himself, as she feared that he might make peace with Octavius and return to Octavia, leaving her behind. 
she managed to convince Antony to keep her by his side by bribing his top advisor, Canidius. After accepting money from Cleopatra, Canidius feigned impartiality in his counsel. He contended that it would be unjust to exclude Cleopatra from participating in the war's potential glory, particularly given her substantial contribution to the funding. Furthermore, a significant portion of the army included Egyptian soldiers. If Cleopatra were to depart, they would feel demoralized and less effective in the conflict compared to being motivated by their queen's presence. Additionally, Cleopatra should not be seen as a burden or a cause for concern like many other women who might join a military expedition. Instead, she would serve as a valuable advisor and supporter. According to him, she was a smart, active and strong queen, experienced in leading armies and handling state affairs. Her help in the expedition was expected to greatly contribute to its success. Antony was convinced by these arguments, and they finally agreed that Cleopatra would go with him. Antony then told the fleet to go to the island of Samos. They anchored there and stayed for a while, waiting for more soldiers to arrive and for other things to be finished. Antony, as he neared his downfall, became increasingly obsessed. Instead of focusing on preparing for the upcoming conflict, he wasted his time at parties, games, and reckless behavior. This is not surprising. In situations like this, men often resort to similar ways of protecting themselves, to some extent, from feelings of guilt and the worries that are ready to haunt them. They tend to push away these dark thoughts by engaging in drinking and partying. Antony shared the same opinion. Therefore, a large assembly of actors, acrobats, clowns, comedians, and entertainers was instructed to convene in Samos and captivate Antony's court with tremendous enthusiasm. The island was filled with wild parties and celebrations. People were amazed at the extravagant festivities, which they thought were inappropriate for the occasion. They wondered what kind of even bigger celebrations Antony would plan if he won the battle. After a while, Antony and Cleopatra, along with a large group of followers, left Samos. They crossed the Aegean Sea and arrived in Greece. From there, they traveled to Athens. The fleet started its journey by sailing west from Samos and then went around Tenaris, the southernmost point of Greece. After this maneuver, it proceeded north along the western coast of the peninsula. Cleopatra wanted to go to Athens for a specific reason. Octavia had visited Athens during her trip to meet her husband with additional troops and assistance. While Octavia was in Athens, the people there felt sorry for her difficult situation and admired her courageous attitude in the face of adversity. They showed her a lot of respect and gave her many honors during her time in Athens. Cleopatra wanted to go to the same place and show off her wealth and power over Antony to prove that she was better than Octavia. It appears that she was unwilling to allow the unhappy wife, whom she had wronged so cruelly, to even have a place in the hearts of the people of this foreign city. Instead, she foolishly attempted to erase the impact of her perceived innocence by openly showcasing the thriving success of her shameless wrongdoing. She succeeded in her plans. The people of Athens were amazed and confused by the great magnificence that Cleopatra showed them. She gave large amounts of money to the people. In return, the city honored her greatly. Antony himself, pretending to be a citizen of Athens, was one of the people. Cleopatra received the delegation at her palace. The reception was attended with the most splendid and imposing ceremonies. It might have been expected that Cleopatra's intense and unnatural hatred towards Octavia would have been satisfied by now, but it wasn't. While Antony was in Athens, most likely influenced by Cleopatra, he sent a message to Rome divorcing Octavia and ordering her to leave his house. Octavia compiled, and taking the children with her, left her home while grieving over her cruel fate. Meanwhile, while all these things were happening in the East, Octavius was getting ready for the upcoming crisis. He was now moving forward with a strong fleet. He had the support of the Roman Senate 
and the people because they had passed a decree to remove Antony from his position of power. The accusations against him were all about minor crimes and wrongdoings that happened because of his association with Cleopatra. Octavius managed to obtain a testament that Antony had written before leaving Rome and that he had kept in what he thought was a very secure location. The custodians in charge refused to give it to Octavius when he asked for it. However, they said they wouldn't stop him if he wanted to take it. Octavius decided to take the testament and read it to the Roman Senate. The testament stated, among other things, that if Octavius died in Rome, his body should be sent to Alexandria and given to Cleopatra. It also showed a level of obedience and loyalty to the Egyptian queen that was seen as unacceptable for a Roman leader. Antony was also accused of looting cities and provinces to give gifts to Cleopatra. It was said that he sent her a library of 200,000 books from Pergamus to replace the one that Julius Caesar had accidentally burned. Additionally, Antony was criticized for promoting Cleopatra's sons, despite their low birth, to positions of authority in the Roman government. Many felt that his behavior towards Cleopatra compromised the dignity expected of a Roman officer. For instance, when he was presiding at a judicial tribunal, he would receive love letters sent to him by Cleopatra. He would then immediately shift his attention from the ongoing proceedings before him to read the letters. Footnote. These letters, based on Cleopatra's decision to do everything relating to herself and Antony in an expensive and extravagant manner, were engraved on tablets made of onyx, crystal, or other valuable stones. Sometimes he did this while sitting on the throne, meeting with ambassadors and princes. Cleopatra likely sent these letters during such occasions to demonstrate her power and indulge her playful nature. At one time, as Octavius said in his arguments before the Roman Senate, Antony was hearing a very important case. While one of the main speakers of the city was talking to him about the case, Cleopatra walked by. Antony immediately stood up, left the court without any formalities, and went after her. Antony's actions and stories about him made people dislike him, causing his friends to abandon him and his enemies to win. A decision was made against him, and Octavius was given the power to enforce it. As Antony was moving westward with his fleet and army, Octavius was heading eastward and southward from the Adriatic to confront him. Over time, after many maneuvers and delays, the two armies met near a place called Axium, located on the western coast of Epirus, north of Greece. Both commanders had strong fleets at sea and large armies on land. Antony had more land troops, but his fleet was not as powerful as Octavius's. Antony preferred to fight the main battle on land, but Cleopatra refused. She encouraged him to fight Octavius on the sea. It was believed that she wanted to have a safer escape route in case they lost the battle. She believed that if they had ships, they could quickly sail to Alexandria if they were defeated. However, she didn't know what would happen to her if they lost on land. The advisors and leaders in the army strongly advised Antony not to rely on the sea. To all their arguments and objections, Antony ignored them. Cleopatra was determined to do things her way. On the morning of the battle, when the ships were lined up, Cleopatra commanded a group of 50 or 60 Egyptian vessels. These ships were fully staffed and well prepared with masts and sails. Cleopatra made sure everything was ready for a quick escape, just in case. She positioned her ships as a backup and quietly observed the battle for a while. The ships of Octavius moved forward to attack Antony's ships. The men fought from deck to deck using spears, boarding pikes, flaming darts, and other destructive weapons. Antony's ships faced many challenges. They not only had fewer ships than Octavius, but they were also outperformed in terms of the crew's skills and the quality of their weapons. Still, it was a very stubborn conflict. Cleopatra, however, did not wait to see how it was finally decided. As Antony's forces did not immediately win, 
she soon began to give in to her fears about the outcome and eventually panicked and decided to run away. She ordered the rowers to start rowing and the sails to be raised. Then, she forcefully made her way through a part of the fleet that was engaged in combat, causing confusion as she passed. She managed to reach the sea and then continued sailing at full speed along the coast to the south. When Antony realized that Cleopatra was leaving, he became completely focused on her and driven by his intense devotion. He quickly summoned a galley with five rows of oarsmen to chase after Cleopatra's fleeing fleet with all their might. Cleopatra saw a fast galley approaching her from the deck of her ship. She raised a signal at the stern of the vessel she was in so that Antony would know which of the fifty flying ships he should steer towards. Antony followed the signal and approached Cleopatra's ship, where the sailors lifted him up and assisted him in boarding. Cleopatra had vanished. She felt ashamed and confused, unable to face the person she had harmed irreparably. Antony didn't search for her. He remained silent, walking to the front of the ship and collapsing there alone. He covered his head with his hands, appearing stunned, overwhelmed with horror and despair. However, he snapped out of his daze when an alarm sounded in his galley, signaling that they were being chased. He stood up, grabbed a spear, and when he reached the quarterdeck, he noticed several small boats filled with men and weapons approaching from behind, closing in on his galley at a fast pace. Antony, now free from the control of his enchantress and driven by his boldness and decisiveness, did not urge the oarsmen to row faster to escape. Instead, he ordered the ship to turn around and face his pursuers. He sailed his ship into the midst of them. A violent conflict broke out, with the noise and confusion amplified by the collisions between the boats and the galley. Eventually, all the boats except one were driven away. This remaining boat continued to hover nearby, with its commander standing on the deck, holding a spear and aiming it at Antony. The commander appeared to be fueled by a strong sense of hostility and hatred, eagerly waiting for an opportunity to throw the spear. Antony asked the man who he was because he was bold enough to threaten Antony. The man responded by giving his name and saying that he came to seek revenge for his father's death. This revealed that he was the son of a man whom Antony had previously ordered to be beheaded for some reason. There was a tough fight between Antony and his fierce opponent. In the end, Antony's opponent was driven away. The boats managed to capture some of Antony's ships, but failed to capture Antony himself. After that, they stopped chasing and went back. Antony returned to his seat, sat down, covered his face with his hands, and once again felt the same sense of despair and pain as before. When a couple faces overwhelming misfortune and suffering, they naturally turn to each other for comfort and support. It is different from the relationship between Antony and Cleopatra. Conscience, which stays calm and peaceful in good times, becomes intense and unexpected when faced with misfortune. Instead of finding comfort and support in each other, they only feel more guilt and despair, adding to their disappointment and sadness. Antony was very upset for three days and didn't communicate with Cleopatra. Cleopatra felt confused and disappointed, while Antony was so mentally excited that she couldn't go near him. In simple terms, it appeared that reason had completely lost its control. His mind, swinging between moments of madness, would occasionally reach a state of terrifying frenzy characterized by uncontrollable anger. Then, it would descend into periods of hopelessness and apathy. Meanwhile, the ships were quickly sailing along the western coast of Greece. When they reached Tanaris, the southern point of the peninsula, they had to stop and decide what to do. Cleopatra's women went to Antony and tried to calm him down. They brought him food. They convinced him to visit Cleopatra. Many merchant ships from the ports along the coast gathered around Antony's small fleet and offered their help. They reassured him that his situation was not hopeless. The land army had not been defeated. It was still uncertain whether his fleet had been conquered. 
they tried to revive the commander's failing courage and encouraged him to make another attempt to recover his fortunes. However, their efforts were unsuccessful. Antony was filled with despair. Cleopatra was determined to return to Egypt, and he had no choice but to accompany her. He shared his remaining treasure with his closest followers and friends. He also advised them on how to hide until they could make peace with Octavius. Finally, he accepted defeat and joined Cleopatra in Alexandria. Cleopatra Chapter 12 From Power to Poison A Pharaoh's Farewell the story of Mark Antony is a remarkable example of how forbidden love can lead someone into obvious and acknowledged ruin. Similar scenarios are common in daily life, occurring more often than one might realize. Yet, Antony's story, although perhaps not unique, has become the most famous example, widely recognized and emphasized for all to see. In his early life, Antony was known for his wild and tough character and his unyielding will, so much so that it seems impossible for anyone to control him. He was also motivated by an ambitious spirit that had no boundaries. However, we see him being captivated by a woman and completely surrendering himself to her influence, even in the midst of his successful career. She replaces anything noble and generous in his heart with her own principles of malice and cruelty. She extinguished the flames of his once grand ambition, which had aspirations so vast they appeared too large for the world itself. In their place, she instilled in his soul a desire for the lowest, most vile, and ignoble pleasures. She influenced him to violate public trust and alienate the love and support of his compatriots. Under her sway, he harshly spurned his loyal wife's kindness and ultimately expelled his wife and children from their home. Now, in a cowardly and dishonorable manner, she directs him to shirk his duties as a soldier. Aware that following her will lead to shame and ruin, he finds himself trapped, unable to escape her influence. The anger caused by Antony's cowardly desertion of his fleet and army at the Battle of Actium was widespread throughout the empire under his command. There was absolutely no justification for such a retreat. His army, which was his greatest source of power, remained unscathed, and his fleet was not even defeated. The ships kept fighting until night, even though their commander betrayed their cause. Eventually, they were defeated. The army, feeling discouraged and with no reason to resist, also surrendered. In a very short time, the entire country joined Octavius's side. In the meantime, Cleopatra and Antony were extremely scared. Cleopatra made a plan to take all the treasures she could save and a few ships across the Suez Isthmus and into the Red Sea. She wanted to escape in that direction and find a safe place to hide on the shores of Arabia or India, far away from Octavius's feared power. She started this project and sent a couple of her ships across the Isthmus. However, the Arabs captured the ships and either killed or captured the men on board. As a result, this risky plan was quickly abandoned. She and Antony then decided to settle in Alexandria and prepared to defend themselves against Octavius. Antony, after his initial panic settled, became increasingly angry and resentful towards everyone. He decided to cut ties with Cleopatra and her friends. He secluded himself on the island of Pharos, where he lived alone for a while, regretting his actions and blaming his unfortunate destiny. He expressed his anger by criticizing and blaming all those involved in his situation. Here, news kept coming in, telling him that one by one, his armies were leaving him, his provinces in Greece and Asia Minor were falling, and Octavius was rapidly gaining power over everything. The constant stream of bad news made him furious and filled with anger. Finally, he got tired of being alone and hating people, he reconciled with Cleopatra and returned to the city. They spent all their remaining money on partying and being bad. 
They tried to forget about their regrets and worries by drinking and having fun. They joined a group of wild partygoers who were just as reckless as they were. They tried their best to hide their worries behind fake happiness, but they couldn't succeed. Octavius was getting closer and closer, and they knew that he would soon confront them with his anger. They couldn't find any place on earth where they could escape from his revenge. Cleopatra was afraid of what might happen to her in the future, so she decided to study poisons. She didn't just read about them. She tested them on prisoners and captives. She made them take the poison so that she and Antony could see what would happen to them. She gathered a variety of poisons and tested them to see which ones acted quickly and which ones acted slowly. She wanted to figure out which poisons caused the most discomfort and pain. On the other hand, she aimed to find out the ones that only made you feel drowsy and confused, resulting in a less painful death. These experiments were not limited to poisons that could be mixed with food or given in a drink. Cleopatra was also interested in the effects of snake bites and reptile bites. She collected different types of these animals and tested them on her prisoners. She made the men get stung and bitten by them and then observed what happened. These investigations were not driven by a desire for practical application of the knowledge gained. Instead, they were a fun way to keep her mind occupied and entertain Antony and her guests. The different ways in which her poisoned victims suffered, their writhing, crying, convulsions, and facial contortions while fighting death, provided precisely the type and level of stimulation she required to occupy and amuse her mind. Antony was not completely comfortable during these experiments. His silly and childlike affection for Cleopatra was mixed with jealousy, suspicion, and distrust. He was concerned about the possibility of Cleopatra secretly poisoning him, so he always made sure that she tasted his food and wine before he ate or drank them. At some point, Cleopatra poisoned the petals of certain flowers and had them made into a chaplet for Antony to wear during supper. During the feast, she removed the leaves from her chaplet and playfully put them in her wine. She then suggested that Antony do the same with his chaplet, and they both drink the wine, which would be flavored and scented by the flowers. Antony agreed to the idea, and as he was about to drink the wine, she stopped him and revealed that it was poisoned. Cleopatra said, Now you see how pointless it is for you to be cautious of me. If I could live without you, it would be simple for me to find ways to harm you. Then, to show that what she said was true, she told one of the servants to drink Antony's wine. He did, and died right in front of them, in terrible pain. The tests that Cleopatra conducted on the characteristics and impacts of poison did have some practical outcomes. It is said that Cleopatra learned from them that being bitten by an asp was the easiest and least painful way to die. She believed that the venom of the asp would make her feel sleepy and numb, leading to death without feeling any pain. She remembered this information for later use. The thoughts of Cleopatra at this time seemed to be quite gloomy. She spent a lot of time building a burial monument for herself in a sacred part of the city. The building of this monument started many years ago, following a tradition among Egyptian leaders. They traditionally allocated a portion of their wealth to build and adorn their tombs during their lifetimes. Cleopatra now focused her attention on her mausoleum. She completed it, reinforced it with strong bolts and bars, and prepared it for use. Meanwhile, Octavius, after gaining control over the territories once ruled by Antony, continued his advance unopposed. He moved from Asia Minor to Syria and from Syria towards Egypt. Antony and Cleopatra tried to prevent the approaching conflict by sending a message to request peace terms while Antony was moving towards Alexandria. In the message, Antony offered to give up everything to his conqueror under the condition that he and Cleopatra could go to Athens without any disturbance and live there peacefully for the rest of their lives. They also requested that their children be allowed to inherit the kingdom of Egypt. Octavius said he couldn't agree with Antony, but he was open to reasonable demands for Cleopatra. 
the messenger who returned with Octavius's reply had private conversations with Cleopatra. This made Antony jealous and angry. So he ordered the messenger to be whipped and sent back to Octavius, badly wounded. Antony told the messenger to say to Octavius that if he didn't like Antony punishing one of his servants, he could do the same to one of Antony's servants who was currently in Octavius's control. The news came to Alexandria that Octavius had taken Pelusium and now approached the city. Antony and Cleopatra knew they couldn't resist his advance and had nowhere to escape. All they could do was wait in fear for their inevitable fate. Cleopatra gathered her treasures and sent them to her tomb. These treasures included a large amount of gold, silver, precious stones, expensive garments, weapons, and valuable items. They were the inherited possessions of the Egyptian kings. She also sent a huge amount of flax, tow, torches, and other flammable materials to the mausoleum. She kept these items in the lower rooms of the monument, determined to burn herself and her treasures if necessary to prevent the Romans from getting them. Meanwhile, Octavius's army kept moving through the desert from Pelusium to Alexandria. On the way, Octavius learned from his agents within the city about Cleopatra's plans to destroy her treasure if it was at risk of falling into his hands. Octavius didn't want the treasure to be lost. In addition to its value, it was very important to him to possess it and take it to Rome as a trophy of his victory. So he sent secret messengers to Cleopatra, trying to separate her from Antony and convince her that he only wanted to be friends and didn't intend to harm her. These negotiations went on every day while Octavius was getting closer. Finally, the Roman army arrived in Alexandria and surrounded it from all sides. As soon as Octavius set up his camp near the city walls, Antony made a plan to attack. He quickly led a strong force out of the gates and engaged Octavius's horsemen. Antony managed to repel the horsemen from their position, but he was quickly pushed back and compelled to retreat to the city. While retreating, he fought valiantly to defend himself against his pursuers. He was very happy about the success of this small fight. He went to Cleopatra with a face full of excitement and joy, hugged and kissed her, even though he was still dressed for battle, and bragged a lot about what he had done. He also praised the bravery of one of the officers, who had fought alongside him and brought him to the palace to introduce to Cleopatra. Cleopatra rewarded a loyal captain with a magnificent suit of gold armor. However, despite this reward, the captain betrayed Antony and joined the enemy that very night. Many of Antony's followers had the same mindset. If given the chance, they would have gladly switched sides and joined Octavius's camp. In fact, the outcome of the final battle was determined by a large group of the fleet defecting and joining Octavius. Antony was planning the day's operations and checking the enemy's movements from a high point where he was with his foot soldiers, the only land forces he had left. Looking towards the harbor from the high point, he noticed that the galleys were moving. They were heading out to meet Octavius's ships, which were anchored nearby. Antony thought his ships would attack the enemy's ships, and he wanted to see what they would do. They sailed towards Octavius's ships, but Antony was surprised to see that instead of fighting, the ships greeted each other using naval signals. Antony's ships then joined the other fleet without any trouble. The two fleets had joined together. Antony quickly believed that Cleopatra had betrayed him. He thought she had made peace with Octavius and handed over the fleet to him as a condition of the peace agreement. Antony sprinted through the city, yelling about his betrayal. Filled with intense anger, he frantically searched for the palace. Cleopatra ran to her tomb. She went inside with one or two people and locked the doors tightly using the heavy locks and springs she had prepared beforehand. Then she told her woman to shout through the door that she had died inside the tomb. The news of her death reached Antony. It turned his anger into sadness and hopelessness. His mind was completely overwhelmed and uncontrollable, shifting from one intense emotion to another unpredictably. 
he cried out in deep sorrow, saying that he was not as much saddened by Cleopatra's death as he knew he would soon follow and join her. He was more upset by the fact that she had shown more courage than him by taking her own life before he could. He was in one of the palace chambers at that time. He had fled there in despair and was standing by a fire because it was cold in the morning. He had a servant named Eros, whom he trusted and had made swear long ago that if there ever came a time when he needed to die, Eros would kill him. Eros, who was called by Antony, was instructed to take the sword and strike. Eros took the sword and stood before Antony. Instead of striking Antony, Eros turned his head away and stabbed himself in the chest. He fell to the ground at Antony's feet and died. Antony looked at the shocking scene for a moment and then said, I thank you for this, noble Eros. You have shown me what needs to be done. I must accomplish for myself what you were unable to do for me. He said this and then snatched the sword from his servant, stabbing himself with it. Stumbling towards a nearby small bed, he collapsed onto it, fainting from the impact. The wound he inflicted on himself was fatal. The pressure from lying on the bed slowed the bleeding a bit. Antony regained consciousness and started pleading with those around him to end his suffering by taking the sword. However, no one was willing to do it. He continued to lay there in great pain, moaning constantly. Finally, an officer entered the room and informed him that the news of Cleopatra's death was false. She was still alive, confined in her tomb, and wanted to see Antony there. This intelligence caused new excitement and restlessness. Antony pleaded with the onlookers to take him to Cleopatra so that he could see her one last time before he died. They were hesitant at first, but eventually decided to carry him. They lifted him up and carried him towards the tomb, leaving a trail of his blood behind. Cleopatra refused to open the gates and let the party in. The city was in chaos and panic due to Octavius's attack, and she was unsure of any potential betrayal. She went to a window above and used ropes and chains to have the people below attach the dying body to them. She and the two women with her then pulled it up. Those who witnessed it described it as a profoundly sorrowful scene. Cleopatra and her female attendants were exerting themselves to pull the wounded and bleeding man up the wall. When he finally reached the window, he weakly raised his arms and pleaded for them to lift him inside. The women were not very strong enough to pull the body up. At one point, it appeared that they might have to give up. However, Cleopatra leaned out of the window as far as she could to grab Antony's arms. With a great deal of effort, they eventually succeeded in bringing him in. They carried him to a couch in the room above, with a window, and laid him down. Cleopatra wept and pulled her hair, expressing her deep sorrow through loud cries and mournful lamentations. She leaned over Antony, crying out continuously in a pitiful display of grief. She washed his blood-covered face and tried unsuccessfully to stop his bleeding. Antony told Cleopatra to stay calm and not grieve for him. He asked for wine, which was brought to him, and he drank it. Then he asks Cleopatra to try to save herself and make a deal with Octavius to stay alive. Soon after, he died. Meanwhile, Octavius found out about the deadly wound Antony had given himself. One of the witnesses took the sword right after it happened and rushed to give it to Octavius, telling him about his enemy's death. Octavius wanted to capture Cleopatra quickly. He sent someone to talk to her at the tomb. Cleopatra spoke to the person through the keyholes or cracks, but she didn't open the door. The individual informed Octavius about what occurred. Octavius then sent someone else along with the messenger. While one person distracted Cleopatra and her women at the door, the other person brought ladders and successfully entered through the window. Cleopatra's women screamed upon seeing the officer coming down the stairs, informing Cleopatra of the plan's success. She quickly realized that she had been found out and that the officer was coming to arrest her. In a desperate move, she took out a small knife from her robe and was about to stab herself in the chest. However, 
the officer grabbed her arm just in time to prevent her. He took the knife from her and then checked her clothes to make sure there were no other hidden weapons. Upon receiving news of the queen's capture, Octavius assigned an officer to closely guard her. The officer was instructed to treat her with respect, but to closely monitor her and prevent any attempts of self-harm. Meanwhile, Octavius formally took over the city. He marched in leading his troops with great show and ceremony. They set up a grand, decorated chair for him on a raised platform in a public square. Surrounded by guards, he sat there while the city's people, dressed as if begging for mercy and kneeling on the ground, asked for his forgiveness and pleaded with him to spare the city. The great conqueror kindly agreed to their requests. Several princes and generals who had served under Antony came forward to request the body of their commander for an honorable burial. However, Octavius refused these requests, stating that he could not take the body away from Cleopatra. Instead, he granted Cleopatra permission to make the necessary funeral arrangements and use any amount of money from her treasures for this purpose. Cleopatra made all the necessary arrangements and supervised their execution. However, she was not calm or composed. Instead, she was extremely agitated and distressed. She had been living for a long time under the unrestricted rule of whims and emotions, which had effectively dethroned reason and eliminated all self-control. She was almost 40 years old now, and while some signs of her incredible beauty still remained, she had lost her youthful glow. Her face was pale and tired from crying, worrying, and feeling hopeless. In short, both physically and mentally, she was just a shadow of her former self. When the burial ceremonies were done, and she realized that everything was finished, that Antony was gone forever, and she was completely and irreversibly ruined, she surrendered to an intense frenzy of grief. In a fit of despair, she violently hit herself, scratched, and ripped at her skin, trying desperately to end her own life. Her frantic attempts soon left her covered in bruises and wounds. These injuries became infected and swollen, making her appearance disturbing and eventually causing her to develop a fever. She then conceived the idea of pretending to be more sick than she was, and so refusing food and starving herself to death. She attempted to execute this design. She rejected every medical remedy that was offered to her. She refused to eat and lived for several days without food. Octavius, who received detailed reports about everything concerning his captive from her attendants, suspected her intentions. He was very unwilling that she should die, having set his heart on exhibiting her to the Roman people, on his return to the capital, in his triumphal procession. He sent her orders, instructing her to comply with the treatment prescribed by the physician and to eat her food. He reinforced these commands with a threat that he believed might influence her. Everything seemed already lost but life, and life was only an insupportable burden. Octavius, in looking for some avenue by which he could reach her, reflected that she was a mother. Caesarion, the son of Julius Caesar, and Alexander, Cleopatra, and Ptolemy, Antony's children, were still alive. Octavius speculated that within the deep, hidden corners of her devastated spirit, there might still exist a remnant of maternal love. He believed this spark could be revived and motivated into action. He sent her a message stating that if she did not comply with the physician's advice and ate her food, he would kill all of her children. The threat had the desired effect. The disturbed and agitated patient became calm. She accepted and consumed her food. She sought medical attention from the physician. Under his treatment, her wounds started to heal, the fever subsided, and eventually she seemed to be slowly recovering. Octavius decided to visit Cleopatra when he heard that she had regained some composure and was showing signs of recovery. When he entered the room where she was staying, which appeared to still be the upper chamber of her tomb, he saw her lying on a small and uncomfortable bed. She was in a very poor state and looked extremely ill. It was a distressing sight that deeply affected him, 
as Cleopatra seemed to be almost completely out of her mind. When Octavius arrived, she quickly jumped out of bed, only partially dressed and covered in bruises and wounds. She crawled in a miserable state to the feet of her conqueror, begging for mercy. Her hair was ripped out, her limbs were swollen and disfigured, and there were large bandages that hinted at even more severe injuries beneath. From the midst of poverty and sadness, her eyes still radiated a glimmer of their former beauty, and her voice retained the same captivating charm that had defined it in her youth. Octavius insisted that she return to bed and rest. Cleopatra then started to speak and apologize for her actions, putting all the blame on Antony. However, Octavius interrupted her and defended Antony, telling her that it was not entirely his fault, but also hers. Then, she abruptly changed her tone and admitted her wrongdoings, desperately begging for mercy. She pleaded with Octavius to forgive and spare her, as if she was now scared of death and feared it, instead of wanting it as a gift. In short, her mind, being alternatively controlled by conflicting and contradictory emotions, was now overwhelmed by fear. To appease Octavius, she presented a catalog of all her possessions and handed it to him as a full list of everything she owned. One of her treasurers, though, a man named Zeleucus who was present, told Octavius that the list was not finished. According to him, Cleopatra had kept several highly valuable items that were not included in the list. This statement, which revealed her dishonesty, made Cleopatra very angry. She quickly got out of her bed and furiously attacked her secretary. Octavius and the others present intervened and helped Cleopatra lie down again. She continued to complain about the terrible humiliation she had experienced, being insulted by her servant at such a time. She mentioned that if she had set aside any of her personal belongings, it was only to give them as gifts to her loyal friends. She hoped that by doing so, they would support her more strongly in pleading with Octavius on her behalf. Octavius reassured her and told her not to worry about that matter at all. He told her that he would give her everything she wanted and promised to treat her respectfully and politely. Octavius was happy with the outcome of their conversation. It was clear to him that Cleopatra no longer wanted to die, but instead wanted to live. Octavius believed that he would be successful in his plan to take her with him to Rome to show her off during his triumphant return. He prepared to leave and informed Cleopatra that they would be traveling to Syria in three days, along with their children. Octavius mentioned Syria instead of Rome to avoid alarming Cleopatra. However, she was well aware of the true destination, and she had already made up her mind that she would never go there. She wanted to visit Antony's tomb one last time before leaving. Her request was approved, and she went with a few attendants, bringing chaplets and garlands of flowers. At the tomb, her grief resurfaced and was just as intense as before. She mourned her lover's death with loud cries and lamentations. She placed garlands on the tomb and offered oblations and incense, which were customary expressions of grief during that time. Cleopatra said, These are the last expressions of love that I can give you, my dearest lord. I can't be with you because I'm a captive and they won't allow me to die. They keep a close watch on me and are planning to take me far away to show me off to your enemies as a symbol of their victory over you. Please, dear Antony, plead with the gods where you are now, since those who rule here on earth have completely abandoned me. Ask them to save me from this fate and let me die in my homeland so that I can be buried next to you in this tomb. When Cleopatra returned to her room after the sad ceremony, she seemed to be calmer than before. She went to the bath and then dressed nicely for dinner. She had arranged for a lavish dinner that night. She was able to make these plans freely because the previously imposed limitations on her actions had been lifted. Her appearance and behavior had been such for some time that Octavius believed there was no longer a risk of her trying to harm herself. Her entertainment was set up as per her instructions, following the traditions of her court when she was a queen. 
she had several attendants, including two of her female servants who had been with her for a long time and were loyal friends. While she was having supper, a man arrived at the door with a basket and wanted to come in. The guards asked him what he had in his basket. He opened it so they could see. Then he lifted some green leaves off the top and showed the soldiers that the basket was full of figs. He said the figs were for Cleopatra's dinner. The soldiers thought the figs looked great and said they were very nice. The man offered the soldiers some figs, but they said no and let him go inside. After dinner, Cleopatra sent away all her servants except the two women. They stayed. After a short while, one of these women came out with a letter for Octavius, which Cleopatra had written, and which she wanted to be delivered right away. One of the soldiers from the guard at the gates was sent to deliver the letter. Octavius, upon receiving it, immediately opened the envelope and read the letter, which was written on a small metal tablet, as was the custom in those days. He discovered a short and urgent request from Cleopatra, clearly written with agitation and excitement. She pleaded for him to pardon her transgression and permit her to be buried with Antony. Octavius quickly deduced that she had taken her own life. He promptly dispatched messengers to her location to verify the truth, intending to join them without delay. Upon reaching the gates, the messengers discovered that the sentinels and soldiers were standing guard as if everything was fine. But when they entered Cleopatra's room, they witnessed a horrifying scene. Cleopatra was lying lifeless on a bed, accompanied by one of her deceased women. The other woman, named Charmian, was tenderly caring for her mistress, placing flowers in her hair and adorning her diadem. The messengers of Octavius were very surprised and asked Charmian what this spectacle meant. Charmian said, It is all right. Cleopatra has acted in a manner worthy of a princess descended from so noble a line of kings. As Charmian said this, she started to collapse and faint on the bed, and soon after died. The onlookers were shocked by the sight they witnessed. However, they were also confused and puzzled as they tried to figure out how Cleopatra and her women had achieved their goals. They examined the bodies, but found no signs of violence. They searched the entire room, but couldn't find any weapons or any signs of poison. They did find a slimy trail on the wall that seemed like it could have been made by a snake, but they couldn't find the snake itself. The body was carefully examined, but no signs of bites or stings were found, except for two small punctures on the arm. Some people thought these punctures might have caused her death. The details of how she died were a complete mystery. Various rumors spread in both Alexandria and Rome about how Cleopatra died, but the truth was never completely uncovered. Some believed an asp was hidden among the figs a servant brought in a basket as part of a plan she had made. They say she allowed the snake to bite her arm. Others thought she had a tiny needle-like instrument with a poison tip hidden in her hair and that she used it to end her life without leaving any noticeable mark. Another story was that she had a snake in a box somewhere in her apartment, which she had saved for this occasion. When the time finally came, she pricked and teased the snake with a golden bodkin to make it angry, and then placed it on her skin to receive its sting. It could never be known which of these stories, if either of them, was true. However, it has been widely believed that Cleopatra died from a self-inflicted snakebite. Countless paintings and sculptures have been created to depict and commemorate this event. This idea about how she died is supported by Octavius's actions when he returned to Rome. This gives a strong indication of what he believed happened to the queen. Since he couldn't showcase the queen herself in his victory parade, he had a statue made. The statue was made of gold and had an image of a snake on its arm. He had this sculpture carried prominently in front of him during his grand entrance into the capital. It was a symbol of the queen's ultimate defeat and downfall. We thank you for joining us on this captivating exploration of Cleopatra's saga. 
If you've been enthralled by the blend of history, drama, and intrigue, stay tuned to our channel for more audiobooks that bring the past to life. From tales of ancient empires to the narratives of iconic leaders, our collection is sure to ignite your imagination and transport you to worlds both splendid and challenging. Thank you for being a part of this journey. The story of Cleopatra may have ended, but the legacy of her reign and the tales of antiquity continue to inspire.